recording. And the local recording. And we're going to do local <laughs> recording. Thank you, everybody. And cue intro. No, 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 no. Coke Would Talk would like to thank the patrons who sponsor our show. So our heartfelt gratitude goes out to Al Hartman, Alan Murphy, Alan Huffman, Amigos Retro Gaming, Blair Ledoux, Brendan Donaghy, Brian Weasler, Karen Anscombe, D. Bruce Moore, Davey Mitchell, Diego, Eric Canales, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Vebke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Jason Downs, Jenna Farron, Ken Reichert, Kyle Etter, Malfunk, Michael Pitsley, Rick Eulin, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, Paul Thayer, Rob Inman, Stephen Wagner, Steve Batson, Steve Rasmussen, Terry Steen, Terry Steggy, The Backyard Shed Gang, Tom C., Tom S., Tim Lindner, Tom Heron, and Tony C. Thank you ever so much, patrons. Coco Talk is an unscripted live broadcast. Anything can and will happen. The views and opinions expressed by members of the panel and the live audience are their own and not necessarily those of the Coco Talk show, its sponsors, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Open minds encourage, sense of humor recommended. If any off color comments were made, we're sorry. Hi, this is Dale Leader, designer of TRS 80 Color Baseball, and you're listening to Coco Talk. This is Coco Talk the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Calore computer. It's time to drop your socks, grab your real-time clocks, and let's rock. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the Tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Coco Talk. We have a very special guest today, author of books, creator of Sundog Systems. It is none other than Glenn Dahlgren. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the tiny flame alive. We may be mocked, but we we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. all right we're here we're on the air episode 227 is here the panel is assembled the audience is out there we already have people chatting in the live chat hello people out there and hello panel let's go around the room and say hi to who's on our panel today and then we'll talk to our special guests but in the top left hand corner of the hollywood squares it's rick eulin happy saturday rick happy saturday folks Good to see you again. I have not been on with you guys for the past few weeks, so it's almost like uh, a family reunion at this point. We, we didn't have, miss you, Stevie. Uh, the feeling is mutual, Grant. <laughs> we have our foreign correspondent from, oh, Canada, L. Curtis Boyles here. How's it going? Welcome to the show, everyone. Looking forward to the interview today. Likewise, we have the host of the Game On segment with the luxurious hair. You know him. You love him. It's none other than... Nick Marona. How you doing, Nick? Doing well, Stevie. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. We have the guy who posts links in live chat and does all kinds of behind-the-scenes stuff. Our resident Apple guy, Mark Overholzer, is here. Welcome, Mark O. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. We have our backup streamer and engineer, hardware aficionado, and wearer of fine merchandise clothing, Mark Bosley's in the house. Hello. Hey, Mark B. We have Grant Leedy, the storm chaser, with us. Hey, Grant. Hello, everybody. We have, this guy is so cool, he's got his own theme music. But, from sunny Arizona, he's got a garage. It's Ron Delvo. Hello, Ron. Welcome to the program. We got a guy who has what many of us would say is a problem. But Brian Weasler's here, a guy who collects too much stuff. Hello, how are you doing today? Good, Brian. From my hometown of Miami, Florida, Rocky Hill, Pedro Pena is here. Hello, Pedro. 
Hello, everybody. Creator of replacement motherboards and salt chips and all kinds of cool hardware stuff. Pedro's just, uh, I don't know what he's going to come up with next. Uh, Doug Bell is here from Duncan, Oklahoma. Hey, Doug. Hello, everyone. And then before we get to our special guest, the last of our panelists right now, a guy who loves to say, Oh, Rocky! The Thunder from down under, Nicholas Morentes. Good eye, Nick. Good, good eye, everyone. <laughs> All right. Glad to have you in the live chat. Let's say hi there to our viewers. Kevin Holloway is here. Bill Noble, A. Eh? Karen Anscombe, Sixie, is here. And uh, who else is here? Kevin Holloway, Jim Rye on uh, Twitch watching us, Mark Overholzer, Bill Noble, Scott Cooper, Tom Eric Gunderson, who I believe is in Norway, is out there. Uh, all kinds of people watching us. Thanks for watching us. And now, without any further ado, we are going to get to our special guest. He was on this show once, and that did not scare him away. He came back twice on purpose. Uh, so thanks for being here. Our special guest again, Glenn Dahlgren. Welcome back, Glenn. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And where do we begin? Curtis, are you going to be steering the conversation here? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't well, we we'll go through with... a little bit of Coco history. We'll go through your, your current is it your current full-time job now writing writing novels and stuff? Uh, I still uh, do freelancing for, and I still teach um game design but i'm spending a lot of time and effort um authoring at this point so i'm trying to figure out that world and uh and i'm thinking i'm making some headway there you go uh, well the, yeah. la the last time you were here which was the first time you were here you, you, we talked about you know sundog systems and some of your games and but we were really here to talk about child of chaos your first novel so maybe tell us how has it been since you were here? How has the book done? How how's life been for you since being a famous author? Uh, yeah, so the book was really well received. Um, got a lot of uh, critical acclaim, um, and uh, enough people let me know that they liked that world that I decided to stick with it. Um, and in fact, uh, tomorrow is the launch of the next book. Um, it's it is a, a book in the series but it is not the next book in the series. It is actually a prequel. And there's a lot of reasons I did that, mostly because one of the characters demanded it. Um, and I needed to know more about the world before I moved on in it. And actually, I can show it here uh, for the first time. I just, I just got it. This is the proof. Ooh. It's called Game of War. Um, and uh, it's a full-size prequel, and it launches tomorrow. Uh, so that's <laughs> it's kind of amazing. It's been a year putting it together, but, uh, but I'm really proud of it. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, it's a, it's a really self-publishing is a really interesting industry that you cannot master period. Um, but you can only get better at it. Very cool. And anything you want to, now we're going to, just so everybody knows, there's a bunch of links that we're going to be dropping throughout the show that Glenn has graciously decided to do all kinds of promotional links and and giveaways and discount codes and everything else so mark overhoser will be dropping um some links right now like the one he just did was a pre-order discount for the game of war for 3.99 from amazon is that for the hard book or the ebook so uh yeah let me let me walk through a few of these and it's kind of fun that we're doing it today because today is the day right before the launch so some of these things are available only before launch and some of them are available after launch so the audience here gets to take advantage of both if they move quickly. Um, before launch, um, I should say, yes, the pre-order is still available on Amazon, and that's for $3.99 instead of $4.99, which will be tomorrow. Um, and also, there is a, um, a giveaway for five copies of the, the print book on Goodreads, and that will resolve tomorrow. So if you want to get in on that, make sure you, you get your entry in before tomorrow. After that, on launch, that my first book, which is uh, Child of Chaos. Okay, different cover now. That looks cool. And a, a different cover. Yeah, I can talk about the process uh, there, but um, I I really am happy with uh, with the redesign there. Um, that book will be free for five days, starting on launch. It's basically uh, trying to get people into the series, um, and you can find that ebook on Amazon for five days, eight twenty nine to nine two, I believe. Um, also, this audience and this audience only can go to my web store and get 15% off everything, including 
the new release, including uh, signed versions of uh, Child of Chaos or Game of War, or even uh, I have uh, Wheel of Time up there, signed versions of Wheel of Time. And there's actually a lot of interest about that because of the um, uh, the upcoming TV show, um, the Wheel of Time TV show on Amazon. Mm. And uh, there's some, some interest uh, is brewing around the computer game there. I, I can't say a whole lot about what's going on there, but it's really exciting. Okay. Uh, so anyway, with the with the coupon code Coco Talk, all one word, all capital letters, you can go to Mysterium blog. Um, that'll take you to the web store, and you just use that coupon and get fifteen percent off anything. Awesome. Um, and uh, the audiobook is available as well on launch, which was something I didn't know if I could pull off. Um, but a lot of things came together, and I was I was able to do it. Um, I actually narrated the audiobook for Child of Chaos, and I was happy to get in there and and do it for this one. And if I hadn't done Child of Chaos, I wouldn't have known what I needed to do in order to get it done for this one. Uh, it's It was a huge undertaking, but I'm really proud of the end result. Wow. That's that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you make the rest of us look so lazy, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, and, and, and the best of the lot, I have uh, bookmarks. Oh, uh, <laughs> that is so cool. Is they so are cool. double-sided. Uh, Child of Chaos on on one side and uh, Game oh, Four on the other. I will be heading up the web, I'll be heading up the web store and taking. <laughs> Which is the thing I'm it. most proud of, I think, the bookmarks. The bookmarks. Um, <laughs> they will be going out with every order. I'm actually going to be giving them away at my first signing at Railroad Book Depot on September 11th. Uh, if anybody is in the area in, in the Pittsburgh, California area, welcome to come. Oh wow, that's kind of cool in person. In will person, be, my first uh, in-person book signing. Will you be enforcing any COVID protocols like wearing a mask? Standing I prisoners? think all of them uh, will yeah, be Yeah, California is probably the always been yeah. the strictest anyways, right? So Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that they're they're continuing to do signings. But um, but as long as everyone's wearing a mask. And I think you need to be vaccinated in order to get inside. Okay, so. okay. Interesting. That's kind of cool. That's exciting though, huh? Yeah, yeah. For me, uh, it's... Yeah, you didn't get to do it last time. I was... I had a a launch party plan for uh, Child of Chaos in this wonderful library, double, um, two levels, a, a coffee shop. I was going to have a band. I mean, it was going to be awesome. And then it all got shut down. Wow. I, I got robbed. Yeah. Well, congratulations. So this is really exciting to just to know Thank this you. is happening and to know that's happening to somebody that we kind of sort of feel like we know now too, you know, so that's even cooler, uh, right? Everything so. goes back to my early days in the, in the Coco. I mean, that's, oh, I, that is so awesome. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, you were an adventure game author from way back. That was, I think, the very first games we ever did on the Coco commercial. And actually, some of my adventure games were born from my Dungeons and Dragons um, adventures that I that I made. And I think that's kind of where everything started in my game design, my storytelling, everything. So there is a real link from there all the way up to today. Cool. Super cool. Super cool. So I have a quick question on, on your previous, your first book. How, how did sales go as, like compared to what you were expecting? How many did you have internationally? Was it common to get it bought in other countries or? Um, well, sure. I mean, so it's available any, everywhere. I mean, Amazon marketplaces, you know, there there's, there's copies available everywhere. Um, I'm in bookstores actually locally, um, which is kind of fun because I, I love to see bookstores uh, supporting local authors. Um, I, numbers, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, I've sold, um, you know, in the thousands, I think. Um, and for a, a debut um, novel from an unknown author, that's pretty good. Um, but what I'm really hoping is uh, the, the reviews are fantastic and I'm getting a lot of really high profile uh, endorsements, um, including Piers Anthony on the, the first one. That's actually my cover quote. It says, "This is, this is what, uh, uh, this is what fantasy fiction should be." Um, and so, you know, I think what I'm hoping for is what they always say is the best thing to sell a book is to write more books. Um, so, getting a back catalog, especially in a series, that'll uh, continue to get eyes onto it. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Is um, I mean, fantasy is evergreen too. So it's not like these things drop off the shelf at any point. Yeah, they're they're not uh, time specific. You can pick up the right. series anytime you want. I think so. Now, and I, you, this, you said this one's a prequel. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if you don't <clears throat> don't give away too much of the story, obviously, but uh, how far before the first novel does this one take place? Um, so if you've read the first one, there was a standout character, um, one of the um, the side companions of Galen 
um, called Dantes, Warrior Priest. And he's, he's a man in that one. And this one shows his coming of age story, sort of why he is the way he is and why he did what he did in Child of Chaos. Because as a priest of war, he follows a certain uh, set of rules. Um, and so it's really weird that he would be helping someone like, like Galen out. And I kind of wanted to really understand that. Um, and so he told me why, and I wrote a book about it. Um, and, but it's it, actually, it, it is informed by um, a lot of the thinking that I was doing about the sequel, um, which is called Curse of Chaos, which will be out next year. And so a lot of that foundation I needed to place somewhere. So um, Game of War and Channel of Chaos are both great entry points into this universe. You can read either, um, but you have to read, I, I would suggest that you read both before going on to, to uh, book two, um, because both of them have really important information that it would, it would do you well to understand. Okay. And are you planning this as a completely open-ended series or are you doing like packets of trilogies that, you know, follow a certain character or a certain storyline or do you have that long-term planning done at this point? I have some long-term planning done, but I really do think of each book as its own self-contained story. I don't like doing cliffhangers. Um, so if you read a book, you're going to be satisfied by the end of it. Originally, 20 years ago, when I was planning out Channel of Chaos, it was going to be a standalone book. But as in its development, um, some things opened up that really led me to, th to think about the implications of, of the world and what I could do with it. So it kind of led me into the sequel. Um, and the sequel, I think, will lead me into the third book um, the same way. But I don't plan on doing um, cliffhangers. Okay. And, and, and also because you're a game author who's helped adopt other uh, novels by other authors, do you have any inclination on of actually creating your own game series that you create based on your own books? Uh, uh, I would love to do that. Um, game of War, especially, I was playing in my head as I was writing it. Uh, I mean, I can't help it. I'm a game designer. And the game at the heart of that book um, would be fascinating to play. I would love to play that game. I mean, some of it is, you know, the, the main character is figuring things out that, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it is not replayable. You know, they're like puzzles and things that he sort of strategies that he figures out. But, uh, but the game itself is, is really awesome. I would love there to be a series of games in this world. And, and would you do them yourself or would you be more of a consultant for it type thing these days? I think this depends on the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I absolutely would want to be involved. I would want to. I would want to design the game. But if someone comes along and says, "Hey, we want to do a you know multi movie picture deal," and and uh, you know there'll be other other games will be a part of that. You know, I would be as involved as I could be without blowing up the deal. Okay. And do you have like your lead characters have already got actors picked out already? If there's a movie deal, or I don't. Um, I know a lot of authors do that, and I just I, I can't bring myself to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, so no, I don't have a lot of actors picked out for my, my movie. <laughs> so I, I'm wondering too, like I'm not being an author myself, but uh, do you have a, a firm picture in your head what your characters do look like? Or, or is it kind of just all words and then you, you can just openly interpret? No, I've got a pretty good idea of, of what they all look like. Um, I will say though, when I'm writing, I'm, I'm not like Robert Jordan. I do not go, I don't have fractal descriptions you know that just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper you know i don't need i don't feel the need to describe every detail of every scene and every character um it's really important for me to know sort of what's going on with them and give you enough so that you understand where they are and, and what they're doing but i i really love to keep things moving and ya especially um it kind of moves at a breakneck pace um kids don't kids lose interest <laughs> really quickly um, and I, and most people like a page turner. And so that's what I like to write, you know, things I'm not, you're not going to be sleeping through any of this book. Okay. Now that's one thing we should mention actually, for those who have not heard of your books before, and we do have a lot of new audience members over the last time you were here. So these are basically aimed more at teenagers, but obviously an adult will enjoy them just as much. Yeah. I wouldn't say that they're aimed at teenagers. I'd say that it's a YA market because I think I, I can't remember the, the stat, but 80% of YA is is uh, read by adults. When you say um, YA, that means young adult, right? For anybody yes, that's correct. Grabbing that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's it it's um, it's appropriate for young adults, um, 13 and above. 
but uh, I would say the majority of the people who read it and enjoy it are adults. Okay. I wouldn't guess that. That's cool. Yeah. At, usually I think they end up buying it for their child and then reading it. Themselves. So you, I think when you were on the first time you mentioned it was similar to like a Harry Potter, right? Not, the, not in yeah. story, but as far as the audience and demographic where right? Harry Potter was made for a certain age, but the adults like it too, or Harry Potter was YA before there was a YA. Okay. I think it's Harry Potter was one of the things that sort of established the genre of YA. I mean, it's YA fantasy. There is, okay. you know, lots of YA other stuff, but YA fantasy. Um, there were a lot of books that were written. I think Narnia and, and a few others. You know, so people now would consider them to be YA, even though they didn't. Know. Right. Cool. Cool stuff. I got. I just a couple of uh, creative questions for you, as you being the author and the uh, narrator. Um, what is your writing number one? What software do you use to write your novel? Are you just using like Microsoft Word, or what? Is there a specific software you use to write a novel to create? Yeah, honestly, document? I I use Google uh, Google, Google Docs. Docs. Oh wow! And it's and it's because I do a lot of writing sort of in weird places, and okay. so I so I do it on my iPad, cloud based. Um, and I have my Magic Keyboard, and yeah, and that's exactly why. So I can I can sit down at any keyboard and start writing, um, it, because it's all shared. Love if it. I if it was a Word doc, then I it, that would be a little bit more difficult. To right, use. I got gotcha. you. No, I, I use Google Docs to run my business on, so I get it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when you recorded the um, the audio book, did you do that yourself in a home studio? Did you go somewhere? Were you in no, a I, sound I, booth? I when when I first started recording for Child of Chaos, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know what the hardware I needed, I didn't know what software I needed, and I found out that I actually had a lot of it on my own. I had it a Mac. Mm -hmm. a Mac uh, laptop, which is exactly what you need. Um, I had a mic from my days playing in a band mm -hmm. um, way back when. And so I just needed an interface to put them together. And then I found out, I was like, where am I going to record this? Because it's loud everywhere. Um, I have a walk-in closet. And I, I read an article somewhere that says, if you have a closet, that's perfect. Because the the, uh, the clothes dampen all the sound. Right. Or, or so I just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I just had to turn off all the air conditioners. Uh, make, make sure that you know, everybody sweat, else. You is sweat your ass off in the Absolutely. closet for a session. Absolutely, okay. it was so. it, it was really hot in there, but I couldn't okay. even have a fan on um, because I couldn't have the background noise. Um, but yeah, I just set up a mic uh, in the closet and uh, and and it worked out really well. And you and then did I, this all on your own. You didn't have like a director uh, cueing you how to do things or anything else. Or no, so I used to be um, a voice actor slash the voice director on okay. my video okay. games. Okay, so you self-directed. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did it for Wheel of Time. I did it for Death Gate, you know, a bunch of games. Um, and so I'm kind of used to that. And actually, when I was thinking, I, I got auditions for um, Child of Cast for a narrator. I got a bunch of them. And I listened to them, and I'm like, I could do that. And if I don't do that, I'm really going to kick myself because it sounds like fun. So what I did was I doubted myself enough mm -hmm. that I recorded my own audition. And I sent it to a bunch of people I trust who I'd never spoken to. It was all over uh, over the internet. Did you tell them it was you? I did not. Okay, I so gave it was them a the, blind the taste top, test. <laughs> yes, I gave them the top four. One of okay. them was me. And okay. three out of four times they chose me wow. as the person they liked the most. And so, so I said, you, okay, I, I can't not do it at that point. A completely impartial, non-biased decision-making process. Double there. blind, you know. Double blind, yeah. And, yeah. And the, I mean, I think I have, I don't have an accent. I've got a reasonably um, a good, just standard voice that you can layer a lot of stuff onto. But I think um, beyond that, there's a certain cachet for an author reading their own material. People like that. And the reason that they like that is because the, there's no one who better understands the material. Right. I know what, what those characters' intentions are. I know what my intentions are for, as the narrator. And so um, I'm able to express that way better. I knew it was going to take a lot to pull the kind of performance that I would want out of somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I figured I'd just, you know, beat up myself. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll give you a, a clue. If anybody ever does this on their own, um, give yourself permission to suck because you will <laughs> the first few times you do this. Um, and also I think every time that I recorded a line, I pretty much always took two takes. Okay. The first little time I said it, I just, okay, I got it out there. I knew what it was, but now I really, I walked through it. Now I'm going to do it again in the way I should have said it the first time. And editing is 90% of the work. It's all just getting rid of all the crap. And it was amazing. Audio the first... is a nightmare too. Cause uh, yes. <laughs> 
Oh my God. But the first time I heard an unedited version of a chapter, I was like, oh my God, I sound like I didn't make any mistakes. It's, it sounds perfect. How did I do that? I imagine the author reading their own stuff. I mean, obviously they'd have the enthusiasm that a, 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 a casual hired yeah. reader, no matter how good of an actor they are, they would not be able to quite get that built-in enthusiasm, knowing the whole universe, what's coming up, et cetera. So. I think the biggest challenge um, for anybody, um, especially an author reading their own stuff, is just coming up with enough voices so that you have characters that don't sound like each other when they're speaking in the same uh, same time. Uh, and, uh, and and this time, I actually, I have crowd sound, I have crowd uh, responses and things in this one. So it was, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with like, you know, monster noises and, and God voices and things like that. Oh, uh, I, I used a lot of effects oh. this time. Oh man, I, I did, did you I, I have any to guess... audiobook, so I'm totally gonna buy this. So. <laughs> <laughs> did you have any guest voices at all on this? Is it complete 100 percent your own? No, it's complete 100 percent my own. And I, I would have liked a female. I, I wouldn't say female voices are my strong suit. Yeah, um, but I, <laughs> that, but that's... you know, I figure this is how I approach it and how I had to approach it. If um, uh, if I'm doing a voice and the acting's good and you can tell it's different from everybody else who's speaking in the same time. Um, then you'll probably forgive me if my accent is not great or if it's a female and it doesn't sound exactly like a female. Um, but I think the acting has to be good. You know, otherwise you, you just get pulled out of the world. Now, did you decide right off the bat you were going to go for an acting style audiobook versus a narrator style audiobook? Well, no, it is a narrator style audiobook, but you can't read dialogue as a narrator. You right. have to read dialogue as an actor. And then everything else, I mean, you can tell, you can absolutely tell my narrator voice from my acting voice. Right, right, right. But right. it is, you know, but they're both there. Um, you need to believe that that person is saying those lines. I have a question, kind of an inspirational uh, moment question. You know, you hear the stories of like some uh, singer, writer, or whatever had like some thought they sketched out on a, onto a uh, napkin or something. Did you ever have a moment where like you're mowing the lawn and all of a sudden an idea pops in your head and you ran into the house to write it down or something like that? Do you have any little, any funny little stories like that? <laughs> well, you're talking about a career that spans like, you know, 40 years. I've had plenty of those moments um, where I'm you know, mowing the lawn and like, oh my God, I just figured out the solution to this, this adventure game puzzle that I've been working on. And I, I will do that. I, I mean, I'll do that a lot. Um, the way I actually, the way I design games is very similar to the way I, I write or I design the book, which is you just keep walking down the, those roads. You figure out sort of what the possibilities are and you walk down each road until you get to the end that's really satisfying, that solves more problems than it causes. And, and you know when you've gotten to the right end. You might get to a few that kind of like work, but you'll, when you get to the one that absolutely, you know, it triggers that aha moment in, in your head. That's the, the same response that you're going to get from your reader or your player. You know, they get to that end and they're like, oh, that's so awesome. Then you know you're on the right track. And I've done that sitting in waiting rooms for emergency at the ER, you know, for my kid who's got a problem. I'll be sitting there, you know, worried. But in the back of my mind, I'm still running through, uh, you know, uh, design problems. Um, so it, it, it can happen anywhere. Cool. cool stuff. Cool stuff. Did that help, Brian? Yep. I was, I was just curious if you had any uh, any fun experiences as he was putting the book together, where you know he might have, might have had a moment like that. So, but yeah. The, the other thing I would say is, um, in both games and writing, so I'm not a pantser, and, and what I mean by that is I can't just sit down and write a book. I need to know where the book is going. I need to create an outline that shows me where the end is. It shows me kind of what the the major beats are. That said. Um, there has to be room for discovery. Um, and in Game of War, I made a big discovery just about how the token works of the, it's the thing that blunts the longing um, of priests, how that the token of war works became sort of the, the critical part of that whole book. And just thinking through that changed everything. And so um, it's now kind of the heart of the book. And um, if I hadn't been able to take advantage of that discovery, the book would be a lot worse for it. And I'm really proud of the implications of, of what happened tour in the in the climax because of that stuff. Well, that was an aha moment, like you were mentioning earlier. Type thing. Absolutely, and and it was more than one. It actually influenced, I'd say, four major scenes, and and maybe even more. 
it was instrumental um, in, in that book. Getting back to the audiobook for a second here, because um, you said like the, the first one you did, you were learning everything from scratch, basically. Yep. So I'm wondering how much time did you save doing it the second time, knowing everything you learned the first time? Like, did it take a lot less time to do, or is it still a bit of a, a struggle to get everything perfect and edited right down? Or months I saved, if you can. Oh wow. That. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I had a couple of false starts when I was recording uh, that I just I had to completely redo. Um, I didn't have that the second time, but I would say that I didn't really understand. It's something kind of trivial, but it's, I didn't understand volume leveling at all. And so some of my early stuff was soft and my later stuff was, was loud. And that even isn't really a problem because there are automated ways to deal with that. But I was going through and like leveling out the volume, anything that was too hot, I was bringing down by hand and that took forever. And so this one, I said, screw that, you know, let's, let's figure out what limiters are, you know, <laughs> let's, uh, let's figure out how to automate that process. And I did, and the end result is just as good, if not maybe even a little bit better. Um, and, I, and it didn't take me nearly as long. We should get you to teach us that. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, I am still not an audio engineer, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, there's, I'm far away from an audio engineer. However, getting a chapter ready for um, ACX because they have an automated filter. So they'll take a chapter and they'll check it and they'll see if it works enough so that they can go and check it by hand. And if you trip certain things, like if your median volume is below or above a certain level, they will just kick it out. And I did everything the same on every chapter and six of them failed. And so I'm like, what the hell? And I did my recipe, which is um, I did noise reduction. I did um, limiting, I did, um, uh, uh, and if, I can't think of the, the whole recipe, but I did all those things and still I had problems. And so I had to add another thing to that recipe. It's just step after step after step in this particular order. And if you do all those things, then you'll get something that they like. Cool. Yeah, I've always been kind of fascinated about the audiobook thing because I, I, I know some uh, other podcasts I watch, like Lula Port's edited and, and done a lot of audiobooks in his time too. Of course, he's been a radio announcer for 40 years, 50 years already too. Oh, that so makes that, sense. that helps. But uh, yeah, and then here's somebody from the, the Coco community that, you know, has, has grown up, I guess, to be, you know, both a professional game designer across multiple platforms and then writing their own book series and, and they're doing their own audiobooks on their own completely, like not even going into a studio or anything and just, you know, going from scratch. That's, it's kind of the Coco way. We do everything from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> it's do it, it's do true. It, do it all in house. <laughs> we, we, we cut costs. Uh, um, uh, but I would say even when I was in college, I had, I was the only sort of comp sci major in all of these high level drama courses. They didn't know what I was doing there. <laughs> uh, all, the, all these theater majors were like looking at me like, what the hell? Um, but it was because I was so drawn to it. I really love theater. And so it made sense. Again, I would kick myself if I didn't do it myself. Yeah, I mean, you really love storytelling. That's that's obvious from your adventure games and stuff back from the Coca days and then up through Wheel of Time and a bunch of the other things you've been involved with since. And then the books is just kind of an extension of that. And and drama, you know, I mean, that's part of acting. So the voice acting, it comes in there. So you've, you've always had that creative drive in that direction, I think. Yeah, I, I think if I couldn't be doing this, I, I would go crazy. Um, I need a creative outlet. And this, it sort of, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's surprising. Uh, I've worked with people who like, didn't want to work with anybody else. I like collaborating actually with, with artists and engineers and, and other designers. And there are people who just say, no, 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 I, screw them. I want to write my book. But I find that if you're, if you're self-publishing, you end up working with a lot of people. You need people to support you in order to, um, you know, you need editors, you need illustrators, you need um, you know, people to help you market. Um, so there's, it's a team and, and arc readers. Honestly, um, arc readers are the best. Um, I, you know, people think I'm doing them a favor by giving them my book ahead of time for free, but they are absolutely doing me the favor by taking the time and giving me a review. I've already got a lot of reviews on Goodreads from those arc readers. And in fact, on the, the back, you can see, uh, I, I don't, well, you can see it on Child of Chaos. Uh, on the back, you know, I have a list of endorsements from um, you know, notable people in the industry. You know, one writer from um, uh, Star Trek Next Generation, you know, Piers Anthony from Xanth fame, um, a bunch of people who were really, really uh, nice and willing to, to donate their time to me and, and, and like the book, I guess that helps too. Um, but it's, it takes a team 
to be uh, an independent writer. So the, the team the team part of, of, of things and the creative side for you, does that extend back to the Coco days or was that pretty well a solo show? Like I know your brother was involved with Sundog somewhat, but was he involved with like beta testing, giving suggestions type thing too, or was he more just involved with the business side of things or? Yeah, back then I didn't really have much of a, as much of a process as I did later in, in life. Um, I would say that the team activity happened more when I started producing other people's stuff. So, you know, my early games that I wrote myself, I mostly did those. I think I might've gotten some feedback from, you know, informal feedback from testers. But when I started producing other people's like Sinistar and Paladin's Legacy and uh, Photon and everything that I didn't write myself, I was deeply involved in bringing those um, to, to the, the final product. And I think Paladin's Legacy, especially, I got in there and did, did a, a fair amount of um, you know, creative work. So I, I was really happy. That kind of actually set the stage for me being able to do that at Legend Entertainment when, you know, being a creative director, that's mostly what you're doing is working with other people to, to make the product better. So you, you kind of become a guide for the programming team that's actually doing the, the actual game itself. You kind of like give them suggestions or do you, you kind of help them plot it right from the beginning and then just kind of make sure they steer in that direction? Or? Yeah, so I'm the one that designs the requirements you know, when I'm being a game director. So I'm the one that goes to the engineers and said, okay, here's the document and here's what we need to achieve. But then it becomes a matter of priorities. Um, and that's really what game development is all about because you only have a certain amount of time. And so you need to figure out what is the most important thing. And as a game designer, you want to do everything. You want to do, you know, to the moon and back uh, all the features. And so you need to figure out if you're a good game designer, which ones are the most important? What was the critical core of the game that you need to develop and then you do more if you have time and resources um, so and working with with engineers especially um, since you brought them up it's really important that they get invested because they will bring magic to the process you know the really best engineers are the ones that have a creative gene and are um, you know working with you to make a feature better I, I always say whether artists or engineers or whatever if I've if I have something in my head and I give it to one of them and they come back and it's better, they bring back magic, then I know I'm on the right track. You know, if it's better than what I ever thought, then that's wonderful. I love working with people like that. Um, I, 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 I love being sort of the origin, the, the guy directing the vision, but I don't really have a born here mentality. So if someone comes up with something great, you know, I'm the first guy to jump on board. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, because I mean, you you especially in larger projects like they have nowadays, we have teams of like dozens and dozens of people with you know musicians uh, and everything. Else. Hundreds, hundreds, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. If not thousands, I think some of the depending it's basically on the, Hollywood the, movie you know production at this point. Absolutely, but but having everybody on that team, even if it's you know the hardcore programmer, having like you said a creative gene where they actually can contribute to the creativity of the game versus just you know I can actually code this and in, in whatever. It almost doesn't work unless they unless they have that because it takes it requires something of an engineer, especially like a lead engineer. They have to want be so invested in the game that they are willing to get in there and do what's necessary to make it happen. Because game design or game development is hard. Uh, it's it's a miracle whenever one gets shipped. You don't realize you know the the stuff that didn't work when you're playing a game. Yeah, the users only see the end result, so they don't have. Right. much of a deal that's why i like stuff like nick Morani's is one of our guest panelists here first he's developed in coco games to this day and still does but he does these blogs and a lot of the blogs i've seen on, on you know especially on retro systems has basically been i've technically figured out how to do a stack blast to do this you know it's kind of the technical side whereas nick's blogs are basically on the creativity of the game like he'll show some ideas that you know four blog postings later he's completely scrapped and he's onto something else because it didn't quite work out what he wanted it to and i that's, imagine you're doing a lot of the same yeah that's very common and actually if you go to um, mysterium.blog, I have write-ups of a lot of the games that I've developed, uh, post-mortems, where I tell you all the crap that went wrong. That's why they're interesting readings, because they are, here's the disaster here, here's the disaster for this one, here's why we almost didn't ship this one, and some of them are just, I mean, there's like villains in them. You know, <laughs> there, there, there's drama in, in, develop, in game development. Now, do you plan on doing a similar blog style thing about the book writing process? Because that's another area where you could, you know, I, I took these characters down the certain road and that didn't work and I had to completely revamp. And you kind of mentioned that you've had a few of those moments. Um, is that something uh, you want to? I think I probably will when there are more fans. 
uh, for them. And there are, there's more interest in those. I tend to write little behind the scenes of certain aspects. So like I wrote a little behind the scenes of the audiobook uh, for Child of Chaos. So if you're interested in seeing pictures of, you know, me going through that process and what in I your had to closet. Do, yeah, in my closet. Um, it's, it's there. Um, so I like writing up stuff like that, but I want to make sure that there's an audience for it. Okay. Yeah. So it's a fascinating process. I mean, I've, I've been trying to write a game and I haven't written games since the early eighties and basic type thing. I've been trying to do one just kind of as a basic nine showcase. And I, I, I don't really have the mentality that I remember having as a kid being able to do it. So it's a lot harder than I was expecting. Yeah, I was actually worried when I was younger, I had unbridled uh, energy and enthusiasm and, you know, a million ideas. And as you get older, a lot of that energy uh, kind of tamps down a little bit. But it turns out that this age is actually the perfect age for um, for author, for writing books. It's like, you know, you're still creative and you've got the the uh, uh, momentum, um, the perseverance to get through a book. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad I was able to write two because that means I can write more because the first one took me 20 years and this one took me nine months. So that, pretty good speed increase. <laughs> that is. Yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to continue that. Um, you said that you're uh, teaching, you're, you're currently teaching game design. Mm -hmm. Do you bring any of your sun dog games into the classroom as a back reference for for them or, or is game development advanced so far that it's just it's not relevant well so my class is about game design not game development so okay. I, I don't really talk about um i don't they don't code anything you know we okay. are actually we make paper prototypes and we play games and analyze the the underlying um uh cores of those games the inner loops um and and so it's more about figuring getting them to be able to have the critical skills to design their own product and then communicate that to somebody else. A large part of being a game director, uh, creative director is being able to communicate your vision. Because if you can't explain to an artist or um, an engineer or you know, a musician or whatever, what it is you're trying to accomplish and get them on board, then they will never give you what you want. So communication is a huge part of that. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. You have another question? No, no. I was just kind of curious if he if he's brought in them in the past forward and was able to incorporate that into his teaching. But it's kind of a but as you explained there, the class is driven in a different direction. It's not the development there. So I think I've shown you, covers of some of my Coco stuff. I have like in the first first day, I show a lot of the games that I've worked on and stuff. I think I, I, I've referenced uh, stuff because when I talk about sort of where computers have come from and where they're going. Um, because we're all the way up to like, you know, VR now. Yeah, I, de I absolutely talk about my origins in the Coco. I mean, that's what started me out on everything. Yeah, and then speaking of Coco stuff, I've got a few Coco related questions here that I kind of wrote down a little bit ahead of time here. So when, when you started, you originally were publishing through other companies. You did uh, some through like Mark Data Products. You did uh, some through Pickle Pair, like the Hall of the King series, et cetera. What, what was the catalyst that made you decide to start your own company? Was it, was it they were starting to drop off or you just wanted the control or a combination of both or what? Well, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I like to, to do that kind of stuff. I think even back when I was a kid, I would like make little shops at the end of my driveway and sell like, you know, like swap meet kind of stuff. Um, so I, I started out with Brickley Pear and they were wonderful. I really enjoyed working with the guys at Brickley Pear. Um, they taught me a lot about how the, the business was run. Um, and, and in fact, at the end of their life cycle, they offered to sell me the company. Uh, and I, you know, I was, I, I was intrigued, but I didn't really want to sell their products. I wanted to sell my products. And, and how so, old and were I, you at this time, just out of curiosity? I was actually just going into college. So about 18, okay. I guess. And so, and I kind of wanted to, I mean, Prickly Pear was sort of the older generation of, um, of development. And I kind of wanted to have something a little cooler, uh, something that reflected sort of my, my, my perspective. And that's why I came up with Sundog Systems. But, you know, as long as, and I think we talked about this before, the major thing keeping anyone from making money in, or kept, the, kept everyone from making money in the Coca world were the advertising costs. And because of my relationship with Prickly Pear, I was able to get their advertising costs 
um, because they just sort of brought me in. And so I was able to, to advertise in Rainbow for their costs. And that's why I was able to make money in college. I, and I did pretty well selling my products in college. Cool. And uh, like when you started, I think you basically, you took your games kind of back, like Champion and a few of the other older ones, Kung Fu Dude, et cetera, and brought them under your own umbrella. And then you published some new ones that you did yourself too. What, what made you decide to suddenly get third party authors coming in? Was it, was it they approaching you? Was it you approaching them? Because you thought they had a good product? Was it a combination of both? I always kind of knew in the back of my head that it would be nice to have other people writing for me because I was a full-time student in CompSci and I only had so much time to be writing and I couldn't really be working on more than one product at a time. Actually, well, she had drama I got a class too. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually got college credit for soundtracks um, as an independent study. Uh, oh, and I got, I had my Kium guy was my final for my computer graphics class. So I was able to actually kind of make those two worlds meet um, in, in a couple of instances. But um, part of it was, yeah, I, I was looking for people. Once Sundog System sort of established itself as one of the premier game shops um, for the Coco, then people started coming to me too. And I had a lot of submissions that I said no to. Um, there were, and, and but occasionally uh, one would rise above the pack and I'd say, yeah, absolutely. Um, but there were also people that I, I went, I, I spoke to, I knew. Um, we had the whole conversation about Sinistar, the whole, yeah. you know, uh, with Dave Dyes. Um, he, he and I were friends at that point. He still wanted to do it, but he had kind of been blackballed by Lonnie at that point. So he you know, couldn't do it on his own. So I gave him that opportunity. And, and the reason that he didn't have his name attached was because of that, because uh, he didn't want the attention. Uh, but, uh, you know, my brother actually wrote half of soundtracks. Um, I created a relationship with Jeff Steidel, who ended up finishing Contras and did Graphic Express 2.0. He was a great guy. Um, yeah, and still Photon, is, too, which is one of my favorite and, games. And Photon, time. right, exactly. Um, but once I created those relationships, people understood they could trust me, um, which is a, was a kind of a big deal back then because there were some publishers that didn't pay their bills or, or whatever, yeah, but yeah, we've heard I, a few stories. <laughs> yeah. I always paid my bills. I actually had an automated system that I wrote myself that just went through all of my, my receipts and just totaled up how many I sold. And that's how much money I paid out every month. And once people understood that, like the first, after the first month, they're like, Oh, I should keep writing for this guy because he pays me, he sells them and he pays the money. So, um, so yeah, it, it worked out. It was a, it was a really good experience for me, not only financially, but um, but it set me up for the rest of my life. And I, I've always been curious about this from back in the heyday of the Cocoa, because I mean, I've had a little bit of experience it when, when it went down to smaller Cocoa Fest and stuff, but you were there during the Rainbow Fest era, like when the shows were huge. Right. How much of a juice to sales did you get at the shows, especially if you revealed a new product and how long did that last when you were doing the mail order after the fact? Well, um, I don't know that, that it increased sales after the fact. I mean, I don't know that I got more mail orders, you know, because the shows happened, but I absolutely sold, you know, I want to say thousands of dollars worth of, of merchandise at a, at a rainbow fest. Um, it was always worth going. No question. And there I, I made a lot of friends. I made a lot of contacts and it was fun. It was, I, I met yeah. Steve Bjork there. That was a, that was a, a really fun time. Um, Actually, everything was going right. That, at that, that Rainbow Fest, I met Steve York, I met Dave Dice, and I found $20 on the road. So <laughs> <laughs> I felt like everything was going my, my way that time. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a blast. But I would say sales were pretty consistently good always, um, especially when I had a new release. You know, when a new Sundog ad came out, um, people were waiting for it. They were looking for our new stuff especially when I got into the inside front cover and that full color ad. People told me they bought things just because they were so colorful and they needed to have the product. They literally said. That. Yeah, I guess that proves that the color advertising works and that's why they charge more for the, the privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're, you're saying that uh, this is the one that you did in college there? Is this the... What's that? Play, is this the, the, um, the common guy? Uh, Kium guy I did in college. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. I, I actually, my first product was Kung Fu Dude. That was my, the first okay. Sundog Systems yep. game. Um, and that was for the Coco 2 and Coco 3. 
Uh, and Coco 3 just came out when I, well, in, I think it was my freshman year in college. And so I started figuring out, and then I think I made, um, this was my first Coco 3 product, and that is In Quest of the Star Lord. And that was an adventure game. And my, my roots were definitely in adventure games, but I also had a real love of those fighting games, the martial arts fighting games. And that's why I kept coming back to them, kept trying to, kept trying to make my, uh, uh, my, the model of those better and better and better. I did Warrior King, um, and then I did Kium Guy. Kium Guy was definitely better because of, of what I learned from Warrior King. I think I told this story last time I was here, but in Warrior King, um, I, I, I got the frame rate up as much as possible by blocking off a bunch of the, the rest of the, the screen. So it's only a box on screen, but there was a flickering and Dave Dyes made fun of me because I had the flickering. I'm like, you know, what am I supposed to do about that? I can't figure out how to, he said, well, just, you know, sink it on the horizontal sink. And I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And so I did that for Kium Guy and uh, then he didn't make fun of me after that. Did the, uh, did the artwork that's on the front here, is this your artwork or? No, I can't remember. It's the same guy who did uh, this one and, and this one and this one. Um, and I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was a guy in Pittsburgh who lived down the street. I mean, he was an artist. He was a professional artist and he charged me 50 bucks per picture. And so I just, I had him do everything. I mean, I was a kid <laughs> at the time. I was a high school kid and I was having this, I was, I was directing art. I was just going to ask you, uh, what was your very first Coco game published? That was Hall of the King one? Hall of the or King what? one. Actually, do I? I think I have that. Here. And how old were you when, when you when you published oh, that with Wrigley Bear? Well, the King one. Um, I I was sixteen, I think. Um, I, I only had like a couple of other games before that that were that won some programming contests, and they were adventure games. Um, Demon Cross, I think, was my first game. Oh no, Beyond the Silver Pain was my first game, and then Demon Cross. Beyond the Silver Pain was just me trying to code something based on a a little choose your own adventure module that I had. I just, and I thought, hey, this, this could work in basic. And so I wrote it out on a typewriter. I didn't have a computer. I just wrote something in basic. And then I tried, <laughs> I went to a department store and they had an Atari 400 and I tried typing it in on, in the- On a 400? Um, I think so, yeah. Oh God, I wouldn't want to type anything on that. <laughs> um, and I never got through it. Uh, eventually I did code it for the Coco though, but it was, you know, someone, it was someone else's intellectual property so I couldn't sell it or anything. But that was my first, my first uh, coding experience. And that was your first taste of in like writing your own adventure game. Well, not right. writing the, the plot, et cetera, but, you know, writing the actual yeah. code. Yeah, I was just, I was fascinated. I was fascinated ever since Adventure, you know, Colossal Cave. When I first started playing that, I was like, oh my God, this changes everything. So as far as the timeline goes, when you when you created Sundog, were you, you were already in college when you were starting it? Or were you still in the tail end of high school when Sundog kind of got started? I think Sundog was in my head when I was in, in uh, high school. But I didn't actually launch it until I got to college. And I, I, I put a lot of things in place to make that happen. I, I, um, I mean, so I knew I was going to launch it with a new game. I knew I was going to launch it with, um, with my sort of ad, the ad done and, um, you know, all, everything in place with Rainbow. So um, I don't remember if I started thinking about it when I hit college, but I'm pretty sure I was already in motion at that point. And having been to college myself a bit, I mean, that's, that can be a pretty heavy workload on its own. And especially you were with drama class, something else. Like, did, did you even think about the fact that you'd have no time to sleep or anything else? Because you were doing, running your own company, you were going to drama and you were doing your comp side degree all at the same time. Uh, no, I, I loved it. I, I don't, I remember being, uh, there being a few all-nighters, um, especially coding some of my, the, some of the 400 level stuff. I had to code a, a concurrent operating system and my partner was, he didn't help at all. So I was all down to me. Um, and I remember not getting any sleep for pretty much a week. But overall, I mean, I love those drama classes. And they actually energized me more than, more than anything else. Although I, a couple of them were early and they didn't see me a lot. And I had to explain. I had a late night computer lab. I, I couldn't make it. Um, so they were, they were actually kind. They, they, didn't, they didn't, they gave me some slack because of that. Um, but again, I, I, I loved it. I love the, the, the running the business aspect of it. And I love the coding of it. It was my hobby as well as my job. So um, that's, that's just how I, I actually end up, I ended up playing some D&D &D in college too. 
I was with, Jeez, a, with a group. The time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had some fun. Just out of curiosity, what was a ballpark cost to do a full color ad in Rainbow back in the day? So it really depends on placement. If you have a cover, the back cover was one price, inside covers were another price, inside front cover was another price. Um, I remember I remember a half page ad, non-color, ran under $500. And the inside front cover ran about 1200. And I think it was like 3000 to anybody else, but because I had that previous relationship, that's how much it cost me. And that would, that would be for a single month or that be for like half a year? Oh no, that's single month. Okay. Oh my God. I mean, they, they would have been inundated with, uh, and that was the other thing is you had to have the opportunity to get that. Um, they didn't give that out. I mean, only three people can have the cover. You know, you have the inside front, inside back, and then back cover. And so if you weren't in line, if he didn't, if Lonnie didn't like you, you would never even get the opportunity. And was it like based on a, a bidding war, like the top three, or was it the top three favorites of Lonnie? Yeah, it was, it was, it was basically, he would come to you and he would offer it to you. And if you said no, he would go somewhere else. And then originally he offered me the inside front cover. And I said, no, because he wasn't giving me the deal that he promised me. And he was forcing me to take it for a certain amount of time that I was uncomfortable with. And so it, I struggled because I knew the opportunity would go away. Um, and so, and after a while, um, when I finally got my act together and I was ready with a full color ad, because he was going to take one of my black and white ads and like put some color on it or something. And it was going to look like crap and it was going to cost me way more. And I was like, I, I, I can't, I can't justify that. And so by saying no, he knew that he wanted me in that space. And so he eventually came back after a few months and said, okay, I'll give you the original, the original deal. And I will, you know, and you can put whatever you want in there. Um, and that gave me enough time to actually put a full color ad together. And so, and I don't think he ever regretted having me in there, but it was that whole Dave Dice debacle. I think that's one of the reasons he tried forcing that large, that, that higher price on me. Yeah. I mean, so basically you, you learn from Dave Dice pain and, and that kind of saved you to keep your company going and become much more successful in the long run. Well, just, just to recap, um, the, the short version is Dave Dice had the inside front cover or he had the, the back cover, I don't know. Um, and Lonnie was charging him more than he was going to be charging me. And he didn't know that Dave and I were friends. And so I talked about that with Dave. Dave got really upset, went to Lonnie and said, listen, I know you're charging people, other people less. I want to be charged less. And so, um, and Lonnie said, you know, kick rocks. And so he, he went away and that's when he tried raising my rate. So it was like that, that whole debacle was, he got mad at me for talking to Dave. I had no idea that I was even doing anything wrong. I was, I was a dumb kid. Um, and, and so, you know, the end result was I ended up in the place where I was supposed to be at the, at the deal that I was supposed to have. But Dave was a casualty of that whole thing. Yeah, I, me I remember because uh, Bill Noble and I used to visit Dave every time because we were all fall connects and we'd see him at you know, Rainbow Fests every year until he just suddenly stopped and it was rather sudden and none yeah. of us at the time knew what the heck had happened yeah that's what happened it was it was him and Lonnie and Lonnie <laughs> Lonnie had an issue with him partially because he was Canadian I think he made a comment that it will show those Canadians a thing or two I'm like well, what does that even mean I, I don't even think I knew that Dave was Canadian at that point <laughs> yeah hey, Glenn. That's strange uh, Jim Rye has a question. Is your audiobook going to be available on cassette? On cassette? Are audiobooks available on cassette? Traditionally, they have been. Really? That's kind, that's kind mean, of so... retro humor, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I could put it on a cassette for you, maybe. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, in, it's through ACX, and ACX one of the reasons I went through them and it's an, it's an exclusive through ACX, which is audible. Um, they're owned by Amazon, but they give two different royalty sets. Um, either you are making, I think it's 40% um, or you're making 20%. If you don't go with them exclusively, it's 20%. And since they command most of the market, which Amazon does and you know, KDP does as well, it's like it kind of, they've made it, they've incentivized you to the point where it kind of makes sense to go ahead and do an exclusive. So I don't think that they offer cassette, um, which I wish they did for people who have it, but most people just download it through their phone. Yeah, I'd imagine that's probably the, 
easiest way for there's no yeah, actually, cost distribution basically right right and they yeah. just stream it before and the so internet they, you used to be able to buy audiobooks on cassette and cds and stuff like that i i remember yeah. buying audiobooks on a you know a big thick stack of cds you needed to get through uh an unabridged audiobook so yeah yeah absolutely yeah i think i actually i think i listened to like a um one of the dragon lance books on tape Books on tape was a thing. Yeah, it actually was, yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's nice having you on here just to go ahead and kind of go over the old stories and even you know some of your relationships with other published software authors at the time. Like you said, you're a friend with Dave Dyes and stuff. Did you get those kind of relationships later on when you moved to the PC market where you would have friends in the industry that you guys would like play IDs off each other type thing, even if you're at rival companies or the companies getting so big you were so busy concentrating with your own team that you didn't really get a chance to mingle. No, honestly, um, I would say it was way more intense um, in the PC uh, arena. Um, there's a thing called Game Designers uh, Conference uh, or Game uh, Game Development Conference at this point, GDC. And when I first started making games, like uh, I have these to show too, so uh, like uh, you know, Death Gate and uh, Wheel of Time. When I first was designing those games, um, well, actually, when I first was designing my early, early, early adventure games like, uh, you know, Gateway, um, I went to the, the GDC and they, it was really small. And so, and I was kind of, I felt like a rock star because I had actually written a game that was out there in stores and stuff. Um, and I got to know a lot of people who were doing the same sort of thing. And I actually joined the GDW, which is the Game Designers Workshop. And that was um, a lot of, at the time, really high profile designers. And they would get together every year and do a workshop. And um, the way that it worked is it would go, you go around the table on this, and we were all sort of in a, in a conference room in sort of, you know, the, the square setup of tables. So everybody was looking sort of uh, in, in the center and you would go around and you'd have, you know, like 10, 15 minutes to talk about a game design issue or problem or even just topic. And then you'd get all of these really high level, you know, like um, Warren Spector was there. And, and um, um, I, I mean, I, I, I can't think of all the names that were there, but some of the, the biggest games that you've played were sitting at that table. And we would, you could just grill them on issues that you had for game development and design. And so I remember um, being really intimidated by all these people the first couple of times I went. And, uh, but I made some great friendships. Um, Lee Sheldon um, is a guy I met there and he's, he's actually on the cover of my book. He's one of the, the writers of Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. But he was an adventure game designer. He did um, some work for a few different companies. He actually ended up teaching, um, but he, he was an incredible guy, um, really smart and um, a wonderful writer. So I, I spoke with him and he and I would go um, party crawling at GDC every year. That, that was a lot of fun. So yeah, uh, I, I'd say early on in the PC industry, it wasn't huge. And you knew a lot of the major players. Um, Cliff Lisinski, the guy who uh, was in charge of Gears of War and um, Unreal, the Unreal series um, and a bunch of other stuff. And he has a quote in my book. You know, I keep, I still keep in touch with him. Uh, Tom Hall, one of the, des the designers of Doom. I got a quote from him from my, my book and I still keep in touch with him. He actually lives nearby in, um, uh, in, in California. So I plan on having a beer with him sometime. <laughs> and I, as far as you're, you're, you've got the uh, launch and you've actually got an actual launch and actual bookstore coming up this time, which you weren't able to do last time. Are you planning on taking that around on a bit of tour if, if things kind of clear up with COVID wise or? You know, cross my fingers. I set my signing up before the Delta hit and turned into 94% of the cases that are out there. Um, I don't know. I absolutely want to. I mean, one of the reasons I decided to write is because I wanted to connect with readers. I wanted to actually, I said, um, I started out with a small press and they, and that ended up being a mistake but I wanted to be published. I figured that's better than being an independent author and, and self-publishing. So I was with the small press and when COVID started hitting, they said, 
uh, we're not going to do paper books anymore. It just doesn't make any business sense. We're only going to do eBooks. And, and I realized, you know, I didn't get into the, into writing books just to make money. If I did that, I was doing the wrong thing. Um, I did it because I wanted to tell stories and I wanted to make a book that I could hold in my hand and that I could sign and hand to somebody else who really, really wanted to read it. And I could see it on store shelves, see it on bookshelves. You can't do any of that with eBooks. Ebooks, it turns into just a business. And I was not, I was not down for that. So that's when I severed my relationship with the small press and decided to do it all on my own. Again, it was kind of like getting into the audiobook. There was so much to learn that, and I'm still learning, uh, especially about marketing. Marketing and indie publishing is tough because there's so many people that you have to distinguish yourself from. Actually, a question on the, on the physically publishing your own books there, because I know when you were on last time, you were just getting the hardcover version ready for your first novel. Um, how has sales been for you percentage wise between hardcover versus softcover? Like I, I assume the collectors are the ones buying the hardcover, softcover is the more casual reader. So mm -hmm. is it a, a much bigger balance towards the softcover or? So I would say that most people buy the ebook um, just from sheer numbers. But after that, I would say the most people who buy um, a printed version of it, um, I have mostly, uh, I, I see sales mostly from my web store. And I think that's because they hear about it in some way that leads them to me. So they get my links and they realize they can get a signed version from the web store and maybe they find a coupon or something. Um, and so, and once they've done that, they usually want a prestige edition. They're saying, you know, it doesn't really matter if it costs a little bit more. I want the best possible version of the book. And so I've sold way more hardcovers than softcovers on my, my web store. Oh, cool. And as far as di book distribution and, 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 you know, chains and stuff like that, uh, is, is that the same balance there or is that more softcover oriented? So uh, definitely more softcover, um, no question. And I don't think I have a strong distribution chain um, Amazon has a, an extended reach to sell books, but I see like maybe a dollar if they sell a, 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 a paperback somewhere. Um, so I have not been pushing people to go through them. What I have done is actually go to individual retailers and say, I will supply you books. So I have author copies and I put them on those shelves. <coughs> and with the exception of like maybe two stores, um, they've all wanted soft copies. They, they don't want the hard covers. Okay. I got two questions for you before I forget. So number one, it, on your 15% off code, could we request a hard copy and request an autographed hard copy on that site? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, because I changed my cover um, from, I think the one that keeps popping up in the, the feed there um, to this, this new cover, I have older versions of the paperback that I am tossing into a bundle with the new book either the, the soft cover or the hard cover for five bucks. Okay. You can get a paperback of the old cover for five bucks if you buy the new one. And you can get 15% off that whole bundle if you Excellent. want to. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be ordering right after the show. I was, I was gonna <laughs> say, I, I would like, cause I'm, I'm, the, I'm that geek who wants the premium edition. Is it possible to get a hard cover of the original Child of Chaos with the old and new cover? Absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're both available there and you get 15% off everything. Yeah, with this code, and then I'll just you know I'll put uh, 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 David Ladd. Just say thank, thank you, David Ladd, and we'll um, him, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, no, that's yeah. cool. That's cool. All right, you, you can leave a note for whatever you want me to, right. to write on there. Now, question number two: talking about going on a tour and meeting people, and impressing the flesh. Any chance in November you might be interested in being a uh, speaker at Coco Fest in Chicago? Chicago is is so far away, and uh, I haven't traveled much for a long time. Actually, my wife just went to Italy, and we were really nervous about that about that trip. Um, so I can I can think about it. I can keep it in mind. I mean, I would love to be there, no question. Um, but I'm not sure if I can make it. I'm not sure if I can actually do that travel. Okay, fair enough. Okay. And then I have a question that you mentioned earlier about, you know, having these hard deadlines on video games where you have to have it released by a certain you know, season or whatever that you're trying to hit. Since you're self-publishing, you don't really have, you know, somebody over top of you saying you have to have the book done by the state, but do you have an internal, I have to have this book done by a certain time to kind of incentivize yourself to finish it? Or are you leaving yourself open-ended? Like the story goes where the story goes, it takes as long as it takes. So um, 
I would say that I am in the world of independent writers, extremely slow. Um, I have been releasing a book a year. And for, if you, if you're traditionally pu published, um, I'd say that's fine. Um, it kind of people expect uh, there to be no more than a book a year. In the world of indie, if you actually expect to make money, you kind of have to be publishing a book a month. And I just can't bring myself to do that. Um, I so had that, no idea it was that fast for independent. It, it's crazy. I mean, people go, people say, okay, well, I have six series out and these ones are hitting and these ones aren't. I'm writing to market. I know exactly how I'm, I'm marketing those particular books to those particular people. Like I said, it's impossible to really get your head around all of that. And so I have never really, I've never really been able to view it that way. Um, I've never, even in, in, in anything creative I've done, I've definitely written, I've definitely created stuff that I thought would be popular, but I've also created stuff that I find personally really compelling. And so the books that I write, the world that I'm in, I, it's very personal for me. Um, I'm definitely not writing to market. I'm definitely not writing shifter romance, you know, dark death fantasy or whatever is popular nowadays. Cause <laughs> there's, there's so many different genres that just keep popping up and, and, uh, and then they go away the next month. And so if you don't hit that wave, then you're kind of screwed. So what I figure is I'm looking at it from the long game. I'm going to create a, a world that I think is really compelling and it has a lot of potential for a lot of growth long term. And I just hope that people go along for the ride with me. Uh, oh, and as far as your, the actual question you, you, you put, yes, a deadline is kind of important. Um, because you have other people who are involved. So like I need to have an editor uh, come in and, um, and take my first or second or third draft and turn it into something that will help me get to the end. And I need to get on her schedule. So I need to know when I can have my work done for her to start working on. I need to be working with cover designers. I need to be working with the promotional sites. You know, there are things that you need to line up that are not just you. So um, I chose this Sunday as my launch date, partially because it was a year after my first launch date and I didn't think I could do, I could get there, especially with the audiobook. I was really worried about getting the audiobook approved, but, um, but I managed to do it. And it's because I had those the extra two weeks, but deadlines are not arbitrary, but I am the one setting them. I guess, <laughs> I guess okay. that answers your question. I, I just figured like maybe with a completely independent author that you would just, you know, it's free will to do whatever you want whenever you want but i didn't realize there's so many other things tied into it that you have to yeah you, you have to book I, people to do things i think it depends on the the professionality of the product that you want to deliver if you need to have a, a cover design if you do it all yourself and then you know you can just decide one day okay you know hit print um but it doesn't usually work out that way not if you really want it to to be a professional product okay um, and there's a question from the chat here. I'm not sure what the acronym stands for. Hopefully you can do uh, from Jeremy Landry says, is the speed, is that speed more related to SEO than actual material? The speed related to is it search engine optimization, maybe. I'm not sure if that's I'm meant for sure. me. I, I was assuming you talk about the speed of writing or, or getting it done, but I'm not sure exactly what he meant there. So. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to need more information about that question. before I get Hey, Jeremy, if you want to clarify your question a bit in the chat, then we'll, we'll re-ask it. And like any the, other I, I like The I like money comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that go by too. <laughs> and also, uh, some, since we've got some uh, viewers here that have not seen your interview from them before and may have some questions on some of your poker games, I'd like to encourage them to try to ask some of those as well. Um, one thing I did want to show you, though, because um, this would have been pretty cool for you to have seen back in the day, uh, is uh, I've got a video clip now comparing Kim Guy, the, the uh, actually, is that how you pronounce it? Is Kim or Kim? Or Kim Guy. Kim Guy? Okay. Yeah, I actually um, did. I did the voice digitization where it says that at the beginning of the game. And then dropped <laughs> the pitch down a bit. Kim Guy, to be ninja. Yeah. Because um, there was an OS9 port done. I think Kevin Darling did most of it, and Eddie Kuntz, I think, finished the last tail end of it because Kevin was busy with a whole bunch of stuff at that particular time in his life. Right. And uh, it, it ran a little bit slower under OS9. So when we did Nitrous 9, which kicks in the 609 native mode and it speeds up things by 10, 15%, it kind of equaled back out. It was running about the same speed it was under uh, this basic. 
And of course, now we've got this new Gimme X board that Ed Snyder's designed that actually runs a Coco 3 at 2.86 megahertz. And I actually took a video and audio clip because I didn't adjust the audio for it, but I've actually got them running side by side. So you can see the speed difference between the uh, original Coco 3 you would have seen back in the day versus what uh -huh. this new three megahertz version does. So, um, but before I get into that, Jeremy is uh, adding some things here. I was talking about releasing a book every month. Ah, uh, and so, um, and is that because of search engine optimization? Um, I'd have to assume that's what that SEO means, but he's saying, is that speed more related to SEO than actual material? So uh, actual material would be obviously be producing a book in a month, you know, a complete book right. type thing. I, I honestly like, think- Why are they has, forcing that speed, I guess is what he's asking. I'm I think it has to do with maintaining your audience um, because your audience constantly wants new stuff, especially audience for that particular kind of fiction. Um, so you're writing, you know, they're not big novels, um, but if someone- is sort of dependent on you for their entertainment and you're, and you're giving them a, you know, 50, 40 to 50 to 60,000 word novel every month, um, then they're expecting it. You know, it's kind of like episodes. Um, and, and it's the, like a serialization, it, like in the old days type thing. I, I, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like the same series or the same world or same characters or anything. As long as you're providing what they're looking for. Uh, I think, I think that that's a major factor. That's how you keep money coming in. Uh, it's like having a magazine subscription or something like that at that point. It's, yeah. You know, you're yeah. subscribing like a monthly audiobook. I, I Yeah, I think so. Um, there's a whole uh, Facebook group called um, 30 Books to 50K that talks just about this. It's all about the business of, of being an independent author and making money. And they say you need 30 books to get to $50,000 a year. And you have to do all of these particular steps. And I'm just, I'm not in that world. Yeah. You, you, you want the, um, the quality, not the quantity. Right. And honestly, $50,000 a year, if that's your sole income, it's not a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, I hate to sound like the one percenter here, but yeah, if I can only have $50,000 a year, I would be in huge debt. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong. If someone is dependent, but the thing is, Making money in independent as an independent author is not easy to do. Fifty thousand dollars to people who are doing that actually is a is a pretty good thing to shoot for. But you're right, as your sole income, that I, I, for people who are retired or something who are not really dependent on it, that's great and it's a great goal. But you're you're absolutely right. Cool. Well, I'll throw my little demo on here, maybe. Or just yeah, I want to see You're going to share? So I'm going to stop sharing then, Carter. And I was just going to say, too, I was going to open the floor to the audience and to the panel for any Coco-specific questions before. I'm not sure if we're getting close to wrapping up. I want to make sure if people uh, who specifically wanted to know about the Coco past that you get those questions out there in the chat or from the panel. Um, yeah, and during this little uh, video demo, it'll be a good time for you guys to kind of get them written down and send them to us in the chat here or, or write them down and get ready to ask on the panel. Yeah. You're so just a little to, bit of a preamble. You're able uh, to like, share whenever ready there, Curtis. Yeah. So I've got the uh, the original Coco 3 on the left, which is a standard 2 megahertz version of it. I started the sound, like obviously you don't want to play them together at the same time because it becomes a schmozzy mess of sound. So you'll hear the high-pitched 3 megahertz version running first, and that's the video on the right, and then I switch over, like these are recorded QuickTime movies, so then it switches over and you'll hear it on the original sound on the left. Which is running a little bit faster than the original pitch was too, because of the native mode in six or nine. Have but... you made a TikTok video for this? No, I don't do TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna show the volume's a little bit here. So the one on the right is the faster one? Yeah. The sound right now is coming from the left one. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah it, I, I, it obviously looks a lot smoother when it scrolls. Yeah. And this one wasn't frame locked on the old sign version, so you can actually kind of get an idea of speed here. But especially like at the beginning, you can definitely see the scrolling right. speed and the kicking speed and everything else. So. And it sounds like Smurf Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I thought it was just cool to, to show you like, you know, with, with some of the upgrades we're doing in the, in the modern times here. I mean, if you had had that back in the day, I mean, you could have pulled off some stuff there. I'm sure you, you probably had a few projects you want to do and just weren't, it wasn't capable of it at the time, but that might have been the. Yeah, I look back at the frame rate of the original game and I'm like, oh my God, how, how, how is this playable? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the funny thing is, is, as some of us have gotten older, now it's too fast, even with the slow rate, you know, our reflexes aren't up to that anymore. So, <laughs> Right. That's, that's the nice thing about adventure games, I guess, because it doesn't matter what age you are, you you do it at your own pace. You can sit on a screen and think, you know, how am I going to solve this puzzle here? What do I have to pick up and manipulate or whatever? It's so true. It, it's Although, age non-centric, whereas <laughs> arcade games, wow. Although I look back, I mean, you compare something like in Quest of the Star Lord to something like Deathgate, and I mean, the design evolved a lot too because my thinking did. So it wasn't the hardware that stopped me. It was, well, although that's not true. The, I mean, I could only fit so much onto a Cocoa disc, and so the adventures were, you know, by necessity, a lot smaller. Um, so there was only so much I could fit onto there. But you know, something like Deathgate, I still look back at Deathgate and think that that was probably the best adventure that I've ever written. And st and people still really re refer back to it as uh, one of those seminal adventure games. So, um, so in Quest of the Star-Lord, you know, it was great for what it was, <laughs> but I, I got a lot better after that. Yeah, and I remember what a seminal one that was, because that was one of the earliest, I think Computerware might've had one before you as far as a full color Coco 3 level adventure game. Uh, with, with full right. graphics, etc. There was uh, actually it was a Xanth one that I think was a little bit before you from Computer. I'm to remember who did it. Scott oh, or something. oh, yeah. I, I remember he, he learned to use palettes. So he's making like lightning flash and stuff. So. Oh, I did that too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 Well, we were all learning at that time. I mean, there were so many capabilities. It wasn't just we had more color that takes a lot more RAM and is slower, but you had palette. You, you do special animations that you never would have dreamed of doing before. So. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. We do have a Nick few questions. We have a few questions from the live chat. So David Lord wants to know what assembler did you use? So I used Phantasm, um, which was um, Roland Knight's assembler, and I was actually going to market that. I was going to put together a package and and get that uh, sell that. Um, but he was not as uh, as um, involved. He kind of sort of said, "Fine, you know, I made it and." And I don't want anything more to do with it. And I didn't feel comfortable selling it without support. Um, but it was awesome. And it was so fast. It was really, really fast. I loved it. It's every it's the one they used that Dave Dyes used on all the, the DICOM products. And I used it on all mine after he, he gave it to me. Hmm. Uh, and then Paul Thayer, who's a, a modern uh, Coco 3 game designer, he says, it looks like a lot of your sprites um, were compiled for speed said, for example, for example, Kim Guy and Warrior King, um, what tools did you use to draw and compile your sprites? Um, I wrote my own sprite compiler. Um, it might have even been in basic. Um, it would just strip through all the, the graphic data. I think to draw them, I used either, I think I used Coco Max. I think that's what I did most of my graphics in. Cool, using Coco tools to do your Coco stuff. I didn't have anything else at the time. Yeah, nowadays people are pulling stuff off the internet and writing a writing a utility to convert that into a Cocoa image f format, and then just you know feeding it all in, which is great for speed of production. But there's yeah. something for hand drawing all your pixels, you know. Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> when I was when I was assembling a uh, a game, I'd have to like make a change, especially when I was trying to debug. I'd make a change. And then I'd have to go off and do something else while it assembled. And then I would come back and see if it worked, you know, after like having a sandwich or something. And, uh, and, and sometimes it took forever to debug, to find a bug doing it that way. But, you know, we had no choice. That's what we did in the Coco days. Yeah, I mean, Nick Marini's, I mean, he's, he's also a current games developer, but he does his graphic work on his Amiga because that's what he used when he had his Coco 3 at the time, too. Ironically, he's never written an Amiga game. He just does all his Cocoa development on the Amiga. It's kind of his Cocoa development station. That makes sense. I think you answered this question on your last interview, but Scott Cooper wants to know, would you consider making another Cocoa game someday? I, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna uh, uh, say no. Um, someday I might, but there's so many other things that I'm, I'm currently working on that I don't know when that would happen. Right. Okay. That's cool. This never say never. You're not going right. to pre preemptively say no to the notion of that. So that's cool. 
Well, and the truth is that, you know, uh, it's not the most powerful development system out there or um, platform that you would make games for. But I mean, we all have this place in our heart for it. Right. You know, making a new Coco game would, would be kind of fun and would would be neat. So here's, um, yeah. here's, here's an idea. Since you're already <laughs> working on fiction and you've got this universe and these characters, what about interactive fiction slash adventure game based on your book series? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I'd love to be, be playing in that world. Uh, uh, you never know. Okay. Yeah. And obviously the, the development, uh, you know, having to run even with Phantasm being as fast as it was, I mean, obviously, it's, like you said, you go have a sandwich while waiting for an assembly. Now, now we've got all these cross assemblers. Now you, you can assemble a huge project the size of, you know, the entire Next9 operating system with games installed in like 10 seconds, 20 seconds now. So obviously that, that part's not an issue anymore. Although it has been decades since I programmed. <laughs> so <laughs> there would be another learning curve. That's a relearning curve, I think. I, I took a break from it too, and it actually it came back faster than I was expecting. I, I was not expecting to, to remember stuff as quick as I did. You know, part of making the games back in the day, it wasn't just design, it wasn't just art. I mean, I really enjoyed programming. Um, and it's kind of a shame that I haven't had a chance to do that ever since college, or well, ever since I was an engineer at Legend. Um, you know, there's a, there's a beauty to coding that it, it is puzzle solving um, that's really yep. neat that I haven't had a chance to do in a long time. And as you mentioned earlier, I mean, when you're, you're comparing like your your what you knew how to program when you did say Warrior King first, and then by the time you got to King Guy to be Ninja, you you improved so much. I've seen that in Dave Dye stuff too, because I I did some six through nine tweaks to speed up some of his really old games, you know, from even before DICOM type thing, uh -huh. like Color Car Action, which he sold through Tom Mix. And I mean, he hadn't learned stack blasting yet, so I just went and changed one routine. That's all I changed, and it doubled the speed of the game, you know, pretty well overnight type thing. Right. So, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, cool, just seeing the evolution of programmers as they went and, and yours in particular too, and going from Kung Fu Dude up to Warrior King, up to, to be Ninja, et cetera, and, and Dave and a few others. And it, it, to me, that's fascinating. It, it just as a, you know, as somebody programmer who doesn't really, it isn't really capable of writing good games myself, obviously, uh, but just, just seeing that evolution and how much they learned, you know, there's a one year span between these two and look how much they improved. You know, what was really hard back in the day though, is there wasn't the community of people who could really talk about this stuff. I mean, you kind of had to figure it out yourself. Um, I mean, I, I was really lucky that I got involved with, with Dave and he did help me out, but I remember, you know, being very frustrated that there wasn't, there was no internet, you know, there was no, no, no real way, except if you get on Delphi, maybe, you know, to, to or really BDS talk. Or BDS or or something, yeah. Right, to, to, to get involved in a community of helpful people. Um, because everybody was like, you know, if I'm doing it, I'm doing it for myself. And so, you know, I, I just, I didn't know enough people to, to really help me in that journey. Um, and so I, I was, how I was, I think people now would have a much better chance at coming up to speed and getting better so that they don't have to solve everything. They don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, on their yeah. own, simply because there are great communities out there. I, I seem to remember like back in, in the 80s that there was a much more proprietary sense to developers too. Like, you know, I figured how to do this thing. I'm not telling anybody else how to do it because that's going to be in my stuff only type thing. So exactly, exactly. I yeah. mean, there was public domain software a little bit back at the time, but it wasn't anywhere near as big as it is now with stuff like Linux, you know, where you can just go grab it and take a look at the source. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I remember... There were a couple of manuals uh, for the Coco manuals and that um, that were kind of useful. <laughs> that was almost it. That was what you had to work with. By the way, we got an offer to you from Paul Thayer, who is, uh, Stevie mentioned, is, uh, you know, does his own Coco 3 stuff these days. He's doing his own games. He said, I would help create that game series if you want to make one based on the book. You don't have to do the actual all the coding yourself there. You might just be the game designer. So. I, I, I will take that seriously. I'll think about it. Uh, kind of along the lines of, would you do another game? When things started to taper off for the Coco, did you leave anything on the table? Was there any projects that you got started but never finished? Was there a game out there or two maybe that you started or did you pretty much wrap up everything before you kind of stepped away? I think I had some ideas um, for things that I might want to do, but I'll tell you the thing that was out there at the end was the Contras. That was the thing that I really wanted to get done and it was impossible to finish. It took three programmers um, that just kept coming in and then giving up and then coming in and then giving up again. And finally it was Jeff Steidel who, who finished that thing up. But I, I was advertising that thing almost, I want to say 
you know, six months to a year before I actually was able to make it available to, to sell. So that was my last big project I think I released um, under Sunbug Systems. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think at that point I was starting to do stuff for Legend and being, Legend was a, effectively a startup um, making adventure games for the PC. And I was a new employee at that startup. And so I was working crazy hours. So I really didn't have a lot of bandwidth um, to be developing on the side. And I was also actually composing music um, for those games too. So that was my, my off time. I think there was another question from the live chat. I forgot to uh, throw your way earlier, but what was one of your favorite Sundog games? Oh, the ones I, I wrote or the ones that I produced or any of the oh. above. This one of your, one of your favorite, some of your favorite games. Well, what's your released. favorite personally written one? What's your favorite one you, you produced and sold? I think Kium Guy um, might be my favorite arcade game that I made just because it was the, the most advanced, but I really loved Photon. Um, I played that game for a long time. I found it addictive, which is why I said that on the cover. And in Quest of the Star Lord, I mean, I love writing adventure games. I, I, I really enjoyed making that one. Every one of them has sort of a little place in my heart. It's hard to say which is my favorite. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll say those for now, but all of them, I didn't I didn't release a game that I didn't love in one for for some reason or another. Uh, so your fifteen percent off deal, are you shipping that out of your house or is that coming from a fulfillment center? That is coming from me. Okay, so if I wanted to do a package deal and maybe get some of your new in stock in the baggie, still have that new game smell stuff, is that is that on your website or should I maybe just? email you to get a whole bundle on getting yeah yeah just contact me directly and okay. we'll work something out okay yeah i think i'd like to get the whole the whole collection at this point <laughs> save <laughs> save money on shipping right to fit, fit it all in one box right so. absolutely <laughs> sounds good to me <laughs> Got a couple that, comments you, from Paul Thayer too on the Contras. So the Contras was great it was really well done considering the console and all the programming trade-offs and of course, we had Doug Maston and Jeff Steidlin, yourself, all involved in the programming. And Doug Maston, I think, is actually on our Discord, isn't he, Stevie? I think he's actually gotten in, in, active in the Coco community. And he, I know he's done a few uh, utilities that some of the new games have been using for compression and decompression. And he said, the final boss is too easy, though. Yeah. <laughs> for the few people of us that have actually made it that far, I guess, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a real saga. Um, and it was very clear that he was a talented programmer. Um, when he showed it to me and that's why I signed it up. And that's why I was so um, convinced it was going to be a great game that I was advertising it before it was finished, which is something you shouldn't do. It's one of those, you know, deadline things. You got to get the ad in there um, before you actually have all the pieces in place. And, uh, and I'm really glad it was able to, to get to completion because it was, it was a fantastic game. And, uh, and Jeff was a, an outstanding programmer as well. And he was able to come in and, and make that happen. And it's it's not an easy task to come in and take over someone else's work and uh, and release a final product. So, you know, it was and a plus really- Plus, Doug, Doug was like you, he was young. He was still in high school and he wrote Contras the first version there. That he yeah, that was, it was amazing how young he was and how sophisticated it was uh, given that. Um, so, and I think that was one, he just bit off a little bit more than he could chew. Um, so, uh, but I'm glad he. I'm glad he did. It was frustrating at the time, but the end result was fantastic. Yeah, agreed. There's still a few bugs in the two-player mode, but as Jeff explained in his blog, there he said I didn't have a second guy to try it with, so I couldn't <laughs> test any of that stuff. So <laughs> it was very much a one-man show back then. Yep. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Yeah, uh, uh, Paul Thayer <laughs> is asking, do you still talk to Jeff? Oh no, I haven't. I haven't spoken to Jeff in a long, long time. I think I saw him at a a Cocoa Fest at one point, um, where he was doing a a talk on the Graphics Express 2.0. But that was way long ago. And, and Doug Maston, have you been in contact with him? Because I know he kind of saw your previous interview. I don't know if he ever got in contact with you. But... No, that that is the last contact I've had with Doug. I was really surprised to see him pop up there last time. But that, but that was really great. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to try to reach out to him and try to like we've been organizing so many interviews lately uh, where we actually have to you know schedule them now instead of just you know, winging them. Right. But I'm gonna to have to see if I can get Doug on just give kind of his side of the story and you know developing contras as a teenager in high school type thing. Yeah, 
yeah, it was it was rough for him. I remember talking him through that, and uh, and just wondering, is this going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, definitely thank you for your time, uh, Glenn. Thank you for all you have done in the past and all you continue to do to create great content for people to enjoy. And um, I'm definitely going to be hitting, I'm going to be using my coupon code. So I'll be, uh, <laughs> I'll be hitting you up for a big order. And uh, whenever you have anything else you want to talk about down the road, just feel free to come on. You've got an open door, drop in anytime. Um, love to hear from your future projects. Doesn't even have to be related to the cocoa because whatever, you, big, whatever you're cooking, we're eating, you know, so. <laughs> and a big congratulations on your second book. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you guys having me on, especially because the stuff I'm, I'm promoting is not cocoa related, but the cocoa community is, was, is my first big love. I mean, it's, it's a part of the thing that sort of makes me who I am and, and what I produce. And I do want to, Show off the new book <laughs> just once more. <laughs> the Game of War. It's coming out tomorrow. And all of those things that we talked about, all those discounts and, and everything, they're either going to expire tomorrow or some of them are going to start up tomorrow. But remember, the the, the book uh, Child of Chaos um, is free uh, tomorrow on the ebook. So you can read that. And if you like that, definitely pick up Game of War. That's on That's Kindle? Of, on Amazon? Yes, that is on okay. Amazon I, Kindle. I have... I have the link for Amazon Ch uh, Child of Chaos up here too. So. Yep. So I hope uh, if you have any interest in fantasy at all, um, people seem to like it. So I hope you guys can like it too. And yeah. and again, thank you so much for having me on. Um, you are you're you're one of the places I think about when I want to come talk about things. Oh, that's so an honor. That's an I, honor. I really yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. And I, I love the fact that you still have one of your full color ads behind you in a <laughs> yeah, frame. That is so <laughs> cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I realized that when I was putting the promo together. I'm like, I have that thing on my wall. I might as well show it off. It's uh, definitely a place of honor up there. That is cool. Yeah, reality kind of sucks. So it's good to be able to jump into some fantasy from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need more of that right now. Yeah. Excellent. That's what I'm here for. All right. We, we And if you can hang out, feel free to hang out. Uh, you know, I know you have other things to do as well. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, we're going to go ahead and take a commercial break. And oh my God, I'm, I don't know what Zoom is doing to me right now. Uh, what is Zoom doing to me? Stop Zoom. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna share screen so we can hear the sound. I'm going to try to share screen. There we go. So we can hear the sound of the commercial. And, um, and we'll be back after these words. We, we have a few promo teasers of some upcoming guests to get to after the commercial break. And then we're going to get into one of Nick Marota's favorite segments of, of the show, which would be the Game On uh, results. So thank you once again, Glenn Dahlgren. And uh, we'll be back after these words. Let's see what commercial break we want to run right now. Uh, you know what? We're going to get in a little bit of, we're going to get some David Ladd in here. Since he can't be with us in person, we'll have some David Ladd in spirit on this commercial break, and we'll be back after these words. Thanks. And now these messages. Hello, I'm David Ladd. Thank you for watching Coco Talk, the world's leading live Coco Talk show. Good night. This is Nick Marionettes, Crikey. After you buy Gunstar... Stop right there! Okay, fine. After you bought Gunstar, go ahead and buy your copy of the Coco Fest edition of... Nightmare Highway. Nightmare Highway. It's a quarter of the quality at half the cost. ESP 8266-01 RS232 TTL Wi-Fi Network 4 Pin DIN Fitbanger DB9 PC IP Drivewire 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 This portion of Coco Talk brought to you by Placeblex Dietary Supplement Placeblex Thought to help you with your floppy life. In a world where hard drives rule and floppies are superfluous, one man, one legend, one old fart 
dared to learn the floppy and took the brunt of jokes. Then... All hard drives and SSDs died, but the floppy survived. And the only man who knew floppies became a legend once more. Floppy Life, the David Ladd story. This summer, straight to YouTube. Eight slot MPI, floppy drive, Coco SDC, sound speech pack, orchestra 90, RS-232 pack, modem pack, super IDE. You start adding all those together if you want them all usable at the same time. Well, guess what? You just went over the four slot MPI. David Ladd. Oh, I'm much happier breaking stuff. All right, there we go. There's our tribute to the man, the myth, the legend, David Ladd, who... He may not be with us on the show today in person, but he's always in our hearts and on our minds. David Ladd has touched us in many ways. Some of them are breaking certain laws in certain states, but he's always with us. To know him is to love him. Um, we are going to move on to the Game On segment, but before we do that, um, we got some promotional things to run. So Curtis Boyle has been on fire Um booking guests and, and, and stuff. So we have a lot of speakers uh, coming up in the next few weeks. And so we're going to run some teasers for those. And it's, it's a, it's an interesting problem. It's a problem, but it's a good problem where we have so many people lined up for the show that now when people say, Hey, when can I be on? We have to say, well, we kind of have to put you Maybe about a, a, month. A, a month out, you know? <laughs> so, um, it's a good problem to have, but, um, that being said, let's just go ahead and run some of these promos and then we'll get into the game on segment and let's let you know who's going to be coming up in, in the few weeks. In the case of some of these that were pre-recorded, there may be a date that was mentioned that's changed. And when that has happened, there will be a, a subtitle superimposed showing you the correct date. But let's go ahead and get on with some of our uh, upcoming guests. Hi, my name is Bill Sias. I was the publisher of Color Computer News way back in ancient history. Um, I guess we're going to talk about all that in in a few days. Um, since then, I have been an embedded systems engineer, built uh, autonomous robots for about 45 years of my life, uh, been a competitive power lifter all of that time. I'm one of eight martial referees in the world, uh, vice president of the American Drug Free Powerlifting Federation. And I'm a health coach. I help people who with type 2 diabetes and autoimmune disease live healthier lives. And I'll be on Coco Talk September 4th. Hi, I'm Gene Turnbow. I'm the programmer of c -Trek, one of the very first implementations of color computer Star Trek back in 1980 for Spectral Associates. And I also built an interesting motion control rig for cinematography using an MC-10. And I'm the founder and station manager of Sci-Fi.Radio, Sci-Fi for your Wi-Fi. And I will be on Coco Talk on September 11th. See you there. Hello everyone, Brian Weasler here. You've probably seen me on Coco Talk and on Facebook. Some of you probably know that uh, I enjoy collecting. Some even say I have a problem. Well, recently I made a large uh, acquisition and on September 18th, I would like to share a little bit of that collection with you. I'd like to talk about the person who put together the large collection that I acquired and to talk a little bit about him and share some of those items with you. You might see some items there that maybe you haven't seen before. You might uh, see something that you've seen and hadn't seen one in a long time. And we can talk about some of those items and share it together. So again, September 18th, join me on Coco Talk as we go through this collection that I recently acquired. See you then. I'll need my mic so I don't get any extra noise. Okay, hi. I'm Glenn Hewlett. I'm probably known for doing my Pac-Man transcode and I 
just finished um, porting Williams Joust to the Coco 3. So I'm going to be on Coco Talk on September 18th. So if you want to see me, get on the show. And Glenn had a schedule change at the last minute, so we had to bump him to the 25th, which opened up the spot for Brian Weasler. And he said, some people may say I have a problem. No, Brian, everybody knows you have a problem. So, <laughs> so it's a good problem to have, though, right? So, And Brian was on our panel that. today here, but he, he had to duck out. He had to go. Too, so. so Nick Marota, yes, sir. are you ready for your 15 minutes of fame? I am always ready for my 15 minutes okay, of fame. Okay, <laughs> so um, we are going to start off, as always, with a uh, Samuel Gimes Coco Thoughts. I don't believe this one is... Yeah, uh, much to Ron Delvaux's disappointment, it's neither a song parody nor is it tied into the game. So we're going to pull from the the deep catalog of, of best of Coco Thoughts before we uh, get into the results. So here you go. And now, Coco Thoughts by Samuel Gimes. Some truths are self-evident, such as buzzard bait is far superior to Lancer. Oh, you went there. <laughs> High score challenge. All right, and welcome to another week of results. This week we played Polaris with 17 scores submitted. Gary M, 2,133. Exile in Paradise, 2,355. Me, 2,820. Just Mike, 3,434. Jim Rye, 5,366. Pedro Pena, 5,376. Tasman, 7,036. S. Orchard, 7,262. Paul Shoemaker, 7,365. David Craker, 7,375. Mr. Dave, 7,438. Canadian Retro Thing, 7,730. Kieran, 7,919. Rick U, 8,481. Rich N, 10,641. Buck Owens, 12,846. And the number one score this week belongs to our very own L. Curtis Boyle, 31,575. Way to go. Pretty good considering you weren't sure you'd have time to play this week. Anyway, great score, and thank you to all this week's submissions. Uh, Curtis Boyle, just squeezing in with five minutes well, before supper there. L literally, that was true. I, <laughs> I, I started playing one hour before the cutoff, and I had one game. What a but I, obviously, my old skills came back, because I actually did quite well, surprised myself. I love Polaris. I, I did not have my, my whole house has been torn apart for weeks now. And this, this past week in particular, I had my PC crashed on me one day and I had my entire office for three days was filled with stuff because I'm getting new floors put in. And then the, for another day, I couldn't use it because they were putting in the floor. So it's just been a thing, but I'm getting back to being able to cocoa now. So in the coming weeks, expect more cocoa uh, commitment from yours truly. And it looks like Nick's trying to share. What what baud rate are you connected at today, Nick? <laughs> oh, is it not sure? My computer is acting really off today. Is it have, really bad? Do you have the direct modem pack? Yeah, I think so. Is it really bad? <laughs> uh, I don't see black anything. Screen. It's a blank screen. Huh. Have you turned it off and turned it back on again? I tried switching it on and off again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. Don't see anything yet. Still says Nick Morota has started screen sharing. Maybe stop. Maybe stop sharing and try to reshare again. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Got a blur. Does anybody, the audio. does anybody know anything about computers around here? Not me. No. <laughs> I think Pedro knows how to make a motherboard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, share. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Hit that share button. I don't know how to turn it on. Don't forget to like and share. Uh, and it says you're sharing, Nick, but it's it just says black. you're sharing. We're just not seeing anything. Weird. All right, let's well, just talk about that's it. That's okay. We may just have to go without visual. Just, just stop sharing and just talk about it. All right. Oh, here we go. It just oh, came wait. up. It, just oh, it just came up. Oh. I stopped it. Okay, hold on. Let me bring Curse it Curse you. Direct it works pack. when you turn it off. Yeah. 
Keep F1 press when you turn on. All right. Give it a sec to come up. Hey. <laughs> there it is. Oh, good. Yay. There we go. Hey. Forget Thank about you, it. Cana Thank you, Canadian Retro Things, for your video play again this week. Check out his channel for retro content, Coco, and other platforms. So thanks, thanks, Canadian, uh, Canadian Retro Things. So yeah, this is a uh, really good conversion of uh, of uh, Missile Command. And the arcade so, version, not the 2600 version like most 8-bit micros did at the time. Right. We played Defense uh, quite a while ago, which was a really good conversion of the Atari Missile Command. Yep. But this is true to the arcade. Yeah, and, multiple uh, shooters. You can shoot from different locations. Which right. definitely changes your strategy. So it's a hybrid joystick keyboard game. Some people weren't crazy about that, but uh, I mean, if you want to do the three three uh, missile silos, you have no real uh, choice. Uh, but I, I thought it was... Uh, I never had a problem with that. I, I don't know why people had a problem with that. Yeah. I, I guess as long as your joystick's too. steady on the table type thing, but... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, love it's how they kept around. mixing up the colors in this game. I, I had a problem with it. I guess if I had a better joystick, it would have been better. But I have one of these... No. Is it a Black Beauty? Yeah. See, that's no. what I used. Well, that's it, it that's the awesome. right stick to use, but depending <laughs> on its age, if it's if it's you know if it's the, the parts are kind of sticky and you're not getting the full 360 degree range of motion, that would be a a, a deal breaker for you. I actually played it. My my TV's having issues that my Coco's connected to, so I actually played it in VCC with a mouse, and uh, ah. I thought that was pretty good. Okay. Yeah, my, uh, my techniques would not work with a mouse. Not that my score was anything to talk about, but uh, <laughs> I thought the mouse was okay. Yeah, and see how but, it just changed the palettes <clears throat> and the mixing up the colors. It did a really good job of taking the two sets of four colors that we had and just mixing them up to the full potential. And, and Stuart Orchard's game does this too. Return of the Beast has, does a good job of taking those four colors and cycling through them to give the game a feeling of yeah, you know. and actually, I want to do a big kudos too uh, to Stuart and and Karen because I mean, since Dragon Talk, they've actually been taking part in the game on you know high score challenge type thing. That uh, even when it's not a Dragon specific game like Polaris, for example, mm -hmm. they both submitted scores, and I hope that keeps up. And I invite everybody else who's on Dragon Talk, feel free to. I mean, we got emulators now like X Word plays both Dragon and Coco stuff just fine. So please join us on on the high score challenges. And I'm going to put out a I'm going to put out a plea to the community. I'm uh, if you have a game that we haven't done yet and you can see the list of games we've done i, I keep a list current in the uh game on uh, discord channel but if there's a game we haven't done yet please uh message me and I, i'd love to get some suggestions yeah. because yeah. so far all these games we've played have been ones i played as a kid uh for the most part and i'm starting to run out of ones i played as a kid that are suitable for a game on anyway so uh i definitely and by that i just you mean, mean strip poker is not a good choice <laughs> <laughs> as long as we don't have the live camera feed i'm okay with it. if there's a, if there's a, if there's a score it's okay <laughs> well that's the that's the goal is to score with her right so that's right <laughs> oh god uh there uh, there yeah. is a there is a suggestion from scott cooper to play the joust trans code i would second that nomination. oh that'll be yeah that's that's coming we're gonna probably wait yeah. until uh, glenn comes yeah, we'll do it the week before Glenn's Paul on. Paul Shoemaker so says Poker in. Squares. That's a good nod. That's a good one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So message me in yeah. Discord with any, any suggestions you may have. Poker? I hardly know her. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, Curtis, what was your secret to getting such a great score? Oh, multiple things, I guess. Uh, especially from watching other people play. Um, one thing, on the earlier levels, I actually, because you, you don't get too many... Of the lines coming down so to save missiles because you get a few extra bonus points just to jack my score up a little bit i would actually wait until a couple of the lines converge and then shoot so that it takes care of like three or four of them at once and only use one shot um yeah so that's the first thing two when it starts getting faster and harder there's two basic strategies that i used uh, one is if you've already lost some islands or a sub's already empty if one of the smart bombs or one of the lines is going towards that don't waste your ammo shooting it just let it go. It doesn't harm you if it hits an empty spot. So save your ammo. Because sometimes those smart bombs get they, they get smarter as you go. They start really dodging your explosion. So sometimes you have to like fire a, flaw, a volley of shots around them so they can't escape and they get destroyed. But then you're using two to three bullets for one smart bomb type thing. 
Um, yeah. Another one is, is that when a line or a smart bomb hits, it explodes itself. So sometimes you can time it. So you can like shoot the first line, it gets hit, it starts exploding, and then an ex explosion will take care of the next line coming down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's another part where that convergence happens. So you can take one shot. And sometimes you can get a cascade of like three or four that get blown up from one shot. So you save your ammo when you really need it. Um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the two main strategies for the later levels for me though, is I do a spray. So I'll pick like, you know, let's say I've got surviving islands on the left, and I definitely try to do the sides uh, to keep the islands going. The middle ones I'll let go first if, I, if it's just getting too hard. But I'll just take like the opposite. So let's say I'm, I'm like, I've got islands on the left side and my right side, I've already lost islands. So I'll take the right sub and I'll do a spray about a second or two into the level when it starts because there's a bit of a pause before they start coming down. And I'll just move the joystick all the way to the left and then I'll just gradually move it to the right while ham not hammering, but tapping the key every one second or so and I'll get a, a, a volley of four or five shots. And the first wave of lines will invariably hit some of those. So I can take care of some of them right off the bat even before they have a chance to come down. I'm not picking and choosing specific aims. So you just do a couple of those and then later levels you have, might have to do that a couple of times because you get several volleys of them coming down. Yeah. And that that's probably the biggest one that, that lets me get you know further on as well as you know don't waste your shots on where you don't have an ally that don't don't just go for the points type thing. Yeah, like they're coming down pretty fast now. Yeah, like in this case here, if you have that smart bomb going to the right, ignore it. It's it's totally useless to you except for points. And if, if you worry about survival, then you know, yeah, just don't worry about it important. at all. Yeah. So uh, that's the second one. Uh, choose your shots, especially in later levels, from the sub that's closest because it takes less time to get there. So you don't have to like try to guess, you know, a long shot. And I mean, obviously, when you have no choice, you've lost a sub or something. You have, you have to, but. Um, Trying to think of any other strategies, but basically the main the main one is that volley thing. Like once I get to level five times, six times, I'll start doing that where I'll just fire four shots across you know one side and favor one side. Like don't try to spread out and keep them all going. And you get free islands, I think every two thousand, but it actually stores them. So if you had all six of your islands going and then you get six thousand points, and then all of a sudden you had a really bad round and you lost three islands, all three of them will be restored if you have them in storage. It doesn't just do one free one every two thousand and you'll lose it if you didn't need it. It actually stores them. That's so cool. you can actually regain a lot of them back. Um, Missile Command must have done that, because I think Defense did that as well. Yeah. But basically, favor aside, do the spray thing on the later levels, because it'll take care of a whole bunch of lines you don't have to pick and choose. Because if you're picking and choosing, they have that much more time to travel down. And then when they're going high speed like this, that, that gets difficult. Yeah. Uh, earlier levels, you can, you can pick and choose. So I don't usually start doing the volley spray until you know, five times or six times. And then I think I ended up like in my game, I wrapped the colors, I think three or four times. And I used to be way better. I used to normally get around 60, 70,000 pretty well every game I played, but you just kind of get used to it. Um, and that's why the free floating, like the black beauty was perfect. Cause you would just, I would have one hand, my right hand, cause I'm right-handed would be controlling the stick. And then my left hand would be doing the fire buttons. And to do that spray, you just gradually just drag your joystick left to right, half the screen and fire four or five shots. Yeah, I found this game got really fast, really, really fast, really early. Yeah, yeah real I, mean, fast, I remember yeah. back in the old days, until I figured that Bali spray thing, I, I would die just right around the same time you guys were doing it. But once you do that spray thing, it takes care of a bunch of them without you even having to aim anything. And you can protect that island and then you can go for quite a while. Well, obviously, I did. Yeah. Oh, well, my strategy was just button mashing at the end. I just, right. I couldn't even yeah. figure out. Yeah, this game was such a tease. When it first starts, you can imagine all these strategies, the converging lines and all of that. And after a couple of levels, you're just floating <laughs> explosions over your last city trying to keep it from getting... Yeah, yeah. That, that's where the spray technique comes in. That's the critical one on the later levels because that takes a lot of that, you know, trying to react and aim it, you know, that far ahead when they're moving that fast for every individual line. You just do the spray on the one side and then you can just pick and choose the few that are actually heading towards the islands you're trying to protect and ignore the rest. Like keep half the screen that you're trying to preserve and ignore the other half, except occasionally your, your sub. And if it looks like you've missed and that sub's about to empty, then send another flurry off to protect your islands right before that sub gets killed off. And you, you can sometimes save yourself that way too. In the infantry, they call it mad minute where you just unload everything. It's mm. like, 
This is do or die. Just make uh, it happen. As far as the controls and the buttons, um, one of the things I did uh, on an earlier video for the Coco Pie was showing you how to configure MAME and how to do custom joystick configurations. And one of the things I did specifically for Polaris was to mount those three keys. I think it was Z, X, and Charlie and mount those to the A, B, and C buttons on a, on a game controller. So you had a thumbstick to move, and then you had three buttons on your controller. So you could literally use your gamepad type thing and play this game and fire off all three buttons without having to use like a you know, joystick keyboard combination. So in an emulator, you can get creative with how you want to how you want to assign um, those three um, silos to shoot from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank In my case, I guess I got so used to playing it the old way. And you, if you're left-handed, right-handed, they actually gave you two sets of three keys you can use. You can use the uh, ZXC or you can use, what is it, mm. comma, period, slash. So ah. if you're left-handed, right-handed, you can use either side. But I, I got so used to doing it with the free-floating joystick with my hand, like with that on the desk, off to the side so that I'm not cramping my hand trying to do everything in one small area like a controller, modern controller does. So I don't know. I'd probably find it harder to do the remap buttons thing myself. Yeah, cool. Great uh, game, though. It's 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 actually one of the best arcade clones. I think the Coco One and Two. Had. And it was an early entry. It was in a 4K cartridge from yep. the first year of the Coco. So for this to be a, an out of the gate title, compared to their crappy Space Invaders and their crappy Galaxian, this game really played like a proper arcade game. Well, it, I'm trying to remember. Was it Spinal Tap? This one showed up. There's yes. Yeah, along with you know Zach's on a few others that have made on TV and movies. Yeah, shows, like there's this a little is one space of the invaders that they game. I just remember the cheesy sounds like the, uh, 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 the sound effects, <laughs> little farting so, noises, so, yeah. alien farting noises. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> for being one of the year one early titles, this one stands out as just yes. really being a quality arcade. Uh, this is one I took to school. Like I've mentioned this before in the show, where we used to take our cocos on Fridays and we'd stay yeah. till like ten o'clock at night. You know. And everybody would bring their own machines. We have a TI-99 and the Atari 800 and uh, all the Apple IIs the school already had. And the Coco. And this is one of the games that everybody liked, along with like Donkey King or something like that. It was just a really, really well done one. And we suspect, I'm not positive, but I'm 99% sure this was written by Robert Arnstein, um, who also did like, um, well, he did the Bedlam, Pyramid 2000, Racket 2 games, uh, both for the Model 1 and 3 and the Coco. And he did a, a numerous Coco games, some of which he's officially, you know, mentioned in the manual or whatever. And there's others that I think I'm pretty sure is him, like Poltergeist, I think is one of his too. He had one unique thing that he did that most others didn't. He he had very, very simple title screen. Yeah. Just be text. But he yeah. always chose the red and red background text characters. So that's why I suspect like this one, Poltergeist. Um, there's some other ones that did that. But yeah. basically, his games always had that signature. Roger that. Uh, have we have we beat this one to death? Have we talked about Polaris enough? I think so. Are we ready for the review ready? of next week's game? And by the way, there was one more suggestion, too, uh, which was uh, Tut's Tomb. So, oh, yes. Uh, so, but make sure you, uh, that the touch tune was suggested by David Craker and uh, Scott Cooper recommended Giles Transcode. Make sure you post those in the Game On Challenge on Discord because we won't necessarily remember those yeah. based on, on the comment. But great Joust suggestions. Joust is definitely coming for sure. And touch tune is a good suggestion. Yeah. All, All right. right. The suspense is killing us, Nick Moroni. Oh, is what, it? What, what are we playing next week? All right. Next week. I think, you guys will I think you guys will recognize this. Popcorn. Popcorn. Hey. It's written by Steve Bjork. It's a variant of Kaboom. So uh, not shown on here, but you've got uh, stacked frying pans or pans. You have to collect the popcorn kernels as they drop and keep going as long as you can. It's a very simple game, but uh, based on Kaboom, and, and which was uh, a very popular Atari title. I, I will actually give you a correction on that, Nick, because Steve Bjork himself corrected me in this because I did that on my website originally too. It's actually based on a game that predates Kaboom from the arcade called Avalanche. Avalanche. It was a black and white game from 1978. Oh, it's Snowballs. Was it Snowballs? Avalanche it was called Avalanche. boulders. Avalanche was kind of like boulders falling. Oh, okay. And, and it looks so similar to this. You can definitely see where Steve got it from. But I did the same mistake because Kaboom was the first game I knew of this genre and Avalanche predates it like by three or four years. Oh, okay. Well, there we go. 
And it was one of those ones that it was like you had to have the clear film to get color, like the original yep. Space Invaders. You know, so it, it was, was a pure black, and white. black and white raster graphics with the like, uh, color film on top of the CRT to get to give like how you have the different rows of color in the popcorn there. It was like different color clear tape on the glass to get those colors. So, um, and one row, a rows will clear out one at a time. So like all the whites will fall. And then all the oranges, and then all the oranges. In, in a way, this is almost like the polar opposite of clowns and balloons. Clowns and balloons, the yeah. things stay up there, and you have to take them down. These ones, the balloons are falling down on you. So, um, another great game by Steve Bjork. And uh, was it uh, was it Dave, Mr. Dave, who has a uh, spinner control for his Coco? Or a no, controller? Mr. Dave's got so he, one of everything. He should be able to break that. <laughs> yeah. If he plays this week, he should be able to break with the paddle controller. And, right. Uh, Sure yeah, that would work nice. well in this game. I did try back in the day. I did try the trackball on it, and it, you just don't have enough fine control no. or it's enough speed to get back and forth from the sides. There, it, it, it's it, it works okay, but it's not the greatest. And this is one of those ones where the position of the joystick is the position on the screen. This is one where you move right. left, move right. right it's right. like if I'm two thirds of the way over, that's where I am on the screen. It's, so yes, analog required for sure. Yep. All right. So uh, thanks, uh, CRT, for the video. Thank you, uh, everybody who took part this week. I'm, I'm trying to, oh, there we go. Thank you, everybody who took part this week. And uh, thank you, Stevie. And we'll see you next week. And I'm just going to do a quick screen share, too, because I just wanted to show Nick the uh, the original Avalanche, 1978 by Atari. I kind of forgot it was okay. by Atari. Just so that people can kind of see what that looks like. Oh, they ripped off their own game. Figure out where the heck did we screen here. Oh, there. And then was that Doug? You asking what's our Discord channel? Because that's um. Well, here we go. Here's Avalanche. Oh yeah, very okay. I, that's very much because yeah. It has, it has trying multiple, to find it. Yeah, it has the multiple paddles that you uh, move yeah. around. It, the here's easy, the arcade cabinet itself. Yeah, you can see the colored from, film, yeah, the colored kind of film on it. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, I, I did the exact same thing. Like when my website went up with this game first, and it was Steve Bjork himself that contacted me and said, no, actually, it's based on the game of, of Avalanche, which is what Kaboom was based on as well. Right. Of course, he knew some of the designers back then. Now, they did add some extra things like the little guy running across and yeah, whatever. Yeah. Not as many platforms. I think there's only three in Kaboom, isn't there? Three buckets. Yeah. Um, Discord.cocotalk.live is the easy to remember name for that, and that'll get you to the server, Doug. Say it again. Discord dot coco talk dot live and there's a you type that in into discord or uh, a... no you just type that into a browser and that'll take you to the server there is an actual server address which i don't remember but i created a i created a uh an alias so if you just type in discord dot coco talk dot live that'll take you to our server and then from there it'll prompt you to create a discord account and install a client if uh, if you don't already have one don't forget to introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, looking for it. Cool. So Popcorn is next week's game of the week, and it is a game for all ages. So hopefully those of you with the kids at home that also play the Coco games, they'll get a kick out of that. Did that support multiplayer or was it solo? I believe it's solo. solo. Okay, yeah. So oh, what a... level are we playing it on? I guess that's the other question. So there's oh, 10 this... or 9 levels or something? Like Start from the beginning. So level 1 or 0, whatever Whatever the lowest Start on okay. st start at the bottom and work your way to the top, huh? Yeah. And we'll mention that a couple of uh, quick comments on popcorn. So uh, some of the emulators used to do this really buzzing, crappy sound in the background on popcorn because it used a, a different way of doing the sound. I think that's been fixed in some of the latest emulators, but uh, it definitely did not have a problem with the Coco. And if you have the actual cartridge version, this will actually run on a 4K Coco, just like Polaris did. So you can play it on the bare minimum Coco if you have one. That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, all right, so we're going to keep it rolling. Do we want to just roll right into Game On News and then sure. uh, Newsy News? Sure. All right, I'll do a quick intro for Game On News while you get ready. To go, just go ahead and share when ready, Curtis. And then, uh... oops. All right, everybody, get ready for Game On News with your former correspondent, L. Curtis Boyle. Hello, everyone. I assume my screen with Glenn's weblog is showing up. Your screen is up, and that is a lovely carpet or something up there. I'm not sure what that <laughs> picture is, but it's lovely. So it's almost like a fractal design. Yes. <laughs> so this this is Glenn's original weblog announcement of Joust being available. Um, and then he did a 1.1 release. Um, plus, he's also got the link to your video now, too, which I'll get to in a second here. 
But uh, basically, the one-point run release just fixes, and we were just talking about Doug Maston, one of the original authors of Contras. That, that's who actually pointed this out to Glenn. Um, the current version, if you're running the SDC, you don't have this problem, obviously, because it's an SD card. But if you have it running on real floppies on a real Coco, it, uh, if you run the boot thing, it actually will load in the different chunks and decompress it, et cetera. And then it actually executes the game immediately. Your drive will keep spinning with the light on forever because mm. he didn't shut the drive motor off once he executes the game. So we just added that little patch. So now if you're running on a real Coco, the drive will shut off. So that, that's the only thing updated. I, I don't think there's been any bug reports. I haven't seen any bugs playing it myself, except for the very rare instance where if the sprites partly off, the would, would be partly off the screen, it actually disappears because he just wanted to keep the speed up without having to worry about trimming them. And usually you're flying around so much that you don't even notice during regular gameplay unless you try to straddle the screen on the edge without moving that's the only time and, really and see i'm it. just going to say for, from you know i played it briefly and because of my situation not having access to the, my computers because my house was torn apart i played it in mame and it wasn't the latest version of mame and i was using an xbox controller but something that i did notice to me and it might have just been me or mame but number one because i haven't played the real joust in a long time the birds felt a hell of a lot heavier like they fell really fast because i'm used to playing like buzzard bait and uh, lancer so they they felt heavy and they didn't seem like they flapped the, the the flap responsiveness wasn't quite as fast from what i remember on the clones you know and that's probably just how it is because this is the real joust but my 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 muscle memory of playing the game was playing the clones so the two takeaways i had was man these things freaking fall fast and man it's so hard to keep in the air you know because that's one thing i loved about lancer was it was so graceful the way you could glide and keep your momentum and trajectory across an arc and everything you know and this one didn't quite feel that smooth but that's probably just how the arcade game is because this is the arcade game you know picked up okay. some weight over the years yeah and i don't know what's going on with youtube here but all of a sudden my i had your Joust transcode video up here and it disappeared now it won't reload Mm. just stalling that's fine you know no, nobody needs to see my crap um but yeah no it was it was fun playing it and um and i uh and and i was thinking about this when uh glenn dahlgren was talking about how he was thinking about his book for 20 years before he wrote it where i had promised glenn i would do it like on a thursday night and i'm like because we, we did a pre-interview we, we recorded the thing i'm like yeah i'll get this video out for you tomorrow and then that's the day my computer crashed and that was the one day I had to do it before my whole house was torn apart for three days. So I couldn't get it to it for three days. But during that time, I started thinking of a lot of things. And so I, I just I added a little bit of, of little splices of other things I had done in the past um, as I was telling the story. And, and, and that would not have happened if I had recorded the video on the day that I wanted to. So having those few extra days got, gave me time to think about stuff. And, and add in a little bit of uh, splicing of little tidbits here and there, which I'm, I'm glad in the end that I, I, I had those days to think about it. And it looks like the, the video finally loaded. I don't know how it's going to, like I tried to pre-play yeah. these. So I yeah. didn't get stupid commercials and stuff here. Nah, so nah, I see it. It's up. No, I did find a funny comment from uh, Kieran 60 in our chat. They're saying, yeah, real arcade controls are awful. Hooray for buzzard bait. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he's got to keep pushing that inferior yeah, game. But my, my, my favorite for the feel is always going to be Lancer. Lancer yeah, has the too. most graceful gliding trajectory. To be honest, Lancer stuff. to me, because I've, I've been playing a lot of the Transcoded Joust lately, and of course, remembering the arcade game, it still feels better to me than even the arcade version, yeah, to be yeah, honest. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. so yeah, the arcade felt like I was fighting gravity a little harder than I remember doing in Lancer anyway. So. Yeah. Now, if you want to go for graphics and sound, buzzer bait is, is better. I, I, graph, graphics is kind of a toss up because I mean, it's it's proportionally better on Lancer, but I think the shapes do look better on buzzer bait. Yeah. Sound is way better in buzzer bait. Um, and then of course we have Pegasus as well here, but now that we've got the official arcade game, if you want to get the closest one, well, obviously you can't beat the actual arcade Man. game transcoded. So. And this is where you can kind of see, if you look at that color marquee going around there, this is where the, 8-bit RGB versus 6-bit RGB, you can see we're not getting all the gradients here. We're in the arcade. What I loved about the Williams games is that whole kind of flashing, you know, palette bursty effect, the kind of breathing effect of the colors you got. We don't have that many gradients in our shades, so you can kind of see some hard differences in the colors and not some kind of yeah. crossfading going on there. Um, but um, but other than than having a little bit of less fidelity, the the colors are spot on and the game is spot on. The sounds are perfect and everything, you know. So, um, 
Great job, Glenn Hewlett. I'm glad he's back in the fray. And uh, we'll look forward to our interview with him on now on the 25th, where he'll talk all about this. And you guys can ask him about it live. Pick his brain on transcoding and whatnot. So, Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that interview. And he's, of course, I have another story coming up here, too, which I'll show in a second. Well, assuming YouTube isn't totally crapped out here, because it's really having problems there for some reason. But yeah, Stevie's uh, gameplay. Um, I think I, I, this is, was mentioned in the comments from people that watch the video as well too. That uh, the funniest moment was when you finally made it to the egg wave, which you've been trying for. And you can see a few cut and paste parts there. <laughs> yeah. You went through multiple <laughs> games, and then you went, "Yeah, I made it!" And then you immediately fell into the lava. Like you yeah. didn't even get hit by anything. You know, yeah. dangerous. You yeah, that's, car <laughs> that's great. It was hilarious. That's my life, man. <laughs> <laughs> is is the term transcode though not right for this game because it doesn't really translate? Ah, yes, it does. It translates a sprite chip and it translates a sound chip. So it's still transcoding that effect. And the that fact a that translate we have to translate or an emulation. Well, I, I guess you know what you want to call uh -huh, it. I, that. To make I mean, you're, you're transcoding like the graphics chip too, because I mean that the original gels at a two hundred fifty six color palette, well, slightly different res, and, and well, um, but the code's not being translated. So I don't know if this is a transcode rather than an emulation. Um, well, emulation means it's running on different hardware that's pretending to be this, which... What, which is what this is doing. Yeah, but that's every transcode. Yeah, yeah well, but that's... the transcode goes a step further by translating... Right, like taking Z80 to yeah, 6809. Translating yeah. one code to the other. Well, this one wasn't translated. This was just emulating the uh, hardware. Anyway. Well, from what from what um, Glenn mentioned, he did have to do some code changes specifically for the way the the block mapping and stuff does too. So he's emulating some more hardware in there, or transcoding at least. You know, the six hundred nine is talking to some of this block hardware, and it's different between Joseph right. And the like there's no blitter chip. There's no other thing. So something still probably had to be rewritten to work. Yeah, like for memory the banking 3. and stuff was yeah. it had to be rewritten because our MMU is eight k blocks and ghost i think was 32k blocks you know kind of like the old sam vdg was or something like that we'll let glenn explain it when he's on but well, yeah that's kind of a minutia yeah that's that's you know, typical potato nick, nick potato picking, I think, uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's right yeah, yeah. um <laughs> also I, I like the uh the, the loader screen you notice the uh, low res uh, yeah yeah the semi graphics version. logo he did a pretty of... good job of uh doing a low res version of that title page yes absolutely i, I, yeah. thought, I thought that was good yeah, it's a really well done game. I wish I could get the stupid video to play. Don't worry and about I, it. Nobody I hope that it. doesn't happen on some of these other ones. You're gonna, I got to turn on YouTube videos here that if this is YouTube having problems, this is going to be a short segment. Mm. Oh, what a shame. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. listen to All it, my Curtis. YouTube. This is why I tune in every week. <laughs> yeah. Watch the disaster unfold. So, yeah, YouTube has blanked out every single tab I've got with YouTube. Great. Far sure A, man. Welcome to the program, John. YouTube goes to sleep too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it just starts loading and installed. Well, I'll read you what was the part here. So this blank white screen is not representative of the actual game. So uh, Jim Gary's ported an old Atari 8-bit card game from 1984, originally by a name, man named L.M. Schreiber, called Old Maid to the MC-10, uh, which you cannot see right now. But uh, trust me, it, it, it's supposed to be there. And uh, the next one I'm hoping will work. <clears throat> He's also start, posted a screenshot of a work in progress game called, you know, for free sell, which is of course came bundled with Windows. Ooh. Oh yeah, that came up. So Facebook is not giving you any crap. Yeah, it's just just YouTube is. Okay. I don't know what the hell YouTube's doing. Okay. Now that looks cool. So that's a work in progress. That one's not released. You can't get it yet. There's no video. Wait a second. It. Is this Tetris? <laughs> when you're looking <laughs> at blocks like this, how the hell can you tell, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, tell me which one's the diamond uh, and which one's the spade. Yeah, here. right. Like, sure. Right. No, that's cool. That's cool. Pre so. And okay. then speaking of Glenn Hewlett, and we'll be going into this during his interview. In fact, we're really lucky this might even be done by then. So of course he tried doing Defender before he went on to Joust. We saw a demo of an earlier version of it at Coco Fest a couple of years ago, which actually did most of the attract screens with full sound and everything else. But he was having problems where it would randomly crash, and he got so frustrated trying to figure out what was going on, he actually dropped the project for a couple of years really and went on to joust now because joust and defender are both done on the same hardware from williams 689 board he discovered some of the techniques in joust they actually had copy protection built in there to make sure you hadn't pirated the roms 
So it would actually do self-modifying when it shouldn't be doing self-modifying, you know, try to do a, and a few other little tricks like that to make sure it was running on, on proper official ROMs. So once he figured out those techniques, he decided to go back to Defender and he was wondering, because one of the side effects of the way they did it was that it wouldn't just crash as soon as you tried to run the game. It would crash once you're into it a bit. And I know some PC games did this too, where they would let you pirate it and think that you got it all fixed. And then you get to level two and all of a sudden now it dies. So you have to go back and redo the whole assembly thing again. So he went back to Defender and he's already made more progress with this new version, learning the techniques of the copy protection that Joust used on Defender itself. So he's actually got it going further than he did when he dropped Defender a while ago. And he thinks if he has caught all the copy protection here that he has a pretty good chance of maybe having this ready by the time we do the interview with him on the 25th of September. But here he goes through some of the things, talking about the specific disassembly code and some of the specific, like here's the main code that will kill Defender randomly, which is what he was exactly experiencing when he was trying to show us the trans code back at CocoFest two years ago. And he does a technical explanation of how that'll work. So if you want a bit of a, a history of copy protection in the arcade industry, as well as you know bits of how Defender works, and I will mention, we mentioned on the show a couple of weeks ago, the Defender source code has actually been released, which Glenn's been using as a reference um, for the arcade game itself. So this trans code was looking pretty good to be on the Coco soon. So um, and this is one I'm really looking forward to. It's one of the hardest arcade games to play. I'm really curious how he's going to emulate all the bazillion controls the original Defender arcade has. Because, of course, it only had an up-down joystick, and then you had a reverse button, a thrust button, a fire button, a smart bomb button, a ring the butler button, a windshield wiper button, and all that other stuff. So I'm really curious how he's going to do that. Is he going to switch it all to be like four-way controller on the joystick? Yeah, I got an idea. We should start a Discord channel and, and, and discuss don't. what we think about the buttons and how we should map the buttons. And we'll Please get everybody don't. to uh, form a committee and uh, feature creep that in. Because <laughs> this Discord's looking a little lonely right now. I think we could use a new channel. No, <laughs> uh, and you know once the, once the threads enter the picture, it won't get any more confusing at all. <laughs> yeah, I think we need Rob Eamon to come back in and clean up the Discord like he did last time. That's what needs to be done. <laughs> Next well, up is a project. Oh, what? Go ahead. I was just about to say, hopefully, uh, when, when, after he's done Defender, he'll then think about tackling Robotron. He does mention that. He has mentioned that. Um, ah. That one's going to be the most difficult, though, because that has so many sprites moving at once. That's one he's really worried about the CPU speed being able to keep up, especially since you're emulating a sprite chip. Because, uh, I mean, um, Robotron in the later levels has got like dozens and dozens of sprites going simultaneously. Joust, you know, has what? Yeah. 10, 15, maybe. Defender might get a little bit more than that. But uh, Robotron's going to be a real challenge. Might need to do 639 Ada uh, version of that one. So this next one here is actually a project that I've been involved with. So this is my webpage showing Star Trek 3. Now, this is the only officially licensed by Paramount Star Trek that Coco ever had. It was done by Lance Miklas, who's rather famous in the Tier C Model 1-3 community. And he also did the same game for the Model 1-3. Uh, Adventure International published it. They also made versions for the Atari 400-800. They made versions for the Apple II Plus, I believe. And this one here... And it's, it's been my favorite of the first, you know, the original generation Star Trek games were all these strategy games. These started back on PDPs and stuff in the early 70s. So, you know, not long after the show came out. And basically the, the original ones were all about, you know, kill Klingons and fly between sectors and all that kind of stuff. This one actually expanded it a little bit. Uh, one, it wasn't just totally text-based. You can see some low-res graphics on the right here. But it also had stuff like you had to find five Class M planets and go into orbit around them to, so, to have your mission. So you had to kill a certain amount of Klingons in a certain amount of time, like every other Star Trek game of its own. But they actually tried to add in a bit of the exploration part from the TV show, which was you know the more favorite medium, find some weird alien planet. So your mission is to find five Class M planets and go into orbit around them. And it draws a nice big round, round circle of a planet, puts the Enterprise around to make it look like it's kind of orbiting. And this one was a hybrid game of some machine language combined with some ba or mostly basic to give a couple of effects. There's some good sound effects way beyond what the play command would do. There's some graphical effects that are too fast for basic, et cetera. And this is one that was designed for cassette back in 1981. So it's another very early one. And uh, it never got patched for disc. So it's never ran properly in disc. It runs, but you know the warp thing doesn't work. Uh, when you get shot by a Klingon, that doesn't work. So this is a bit of a side break project here earlier this week. I finally got into it and figured out all the little embedded ML routines that got scattered throughout it, fixed them up and got it working. 
So I've submitted to the archive. I haven't had a chance to check today to see if it's up there yet. It should be up over the weekend. So if you want to play it on disc the way it's meant to be played with all the special effects, you can go get it. I passed it on to Kieran and said, could you do any patches needed to do this for the dragon? And he said, sure. And uh, he's completed that. He's uploaded it to the World of Dragon archive. He's actually got it online on x Online. You can actually oh, wow. play it right from there as well. And, and I, there's a few things about the Dragon I did not know. Like their graphics screen, when you have a disc controller plugged in, it's not in the same spot as it is in the Coco. So my patches actually did not fully work for him. He had to do some further adjustments to it. And the basic thing that I had to fix to get this running is that on a cassette-based system, your high-res screen start at 600 hex, right after the text screen. On the disk system, it starts at E00 because it reserves disk buffers and a whole bunch of other crap. Now, the Dragon does something similar, but their DOS is very different than ours. And it actually, their graphics screens start at uh, C00, so they start 200 bytes earlier. So we had to go repatch everything I'd patched to get that to run, and he actually got that, that working. So I will briefly so show you. So just out of curiosity, would you then put the links to these on your site once they're available, like on the archive and everything else? I, so I'm planning would... on doing that, yes. Yes. And Kieran's actually the... made a, a fat disk image, a hybrid disk image. Okay, it's schizoid. Okay. Yeah. Which actually has both the Dragon and the uh, Cocoa versions. Plus, he had to make something different between the Dragon 32 and the 64. The diff versions have to be a little bit different between those two. Yeah, and I'll and, have to let and, him explain exactly. And just to exactly be politically correct, we'll just say that it's a pleasantly plump image. <laughs> so um yeah there's just more of it to love that's all your, your attempts at uh, humor amuse me always Steve. Um, so anyway uh, here's here's the one here now i did find the original adventure international catalogs when they announced the coco version in late 81 they actually mentioned there's two versions of it there's a 16k version which is strictly text-based and there's a 32k version with the enhanced graphics sound and all that and i have seen on World of Dragon, I think before there was the original 16K text version has been available. I don't think they've had the graphic one available there first. So this will be new to the most Dragon users too, I think. Um, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do a little... Karen is saying that the bug is between the Dragon 32's implementation of the user function. Right, yeah. yeah. Thanks for jogging my memory there. Yeah, thus making user functions greater than zero incompatible between the two. Yeah, because the way he set this up, like he didn't do pokes to put his ml routines and he actually embeds them in strings so a string equals and it looks like a bunch of token words from basic yeah so it's an embedded routine but he's got i can't remember how many there is exact six five something like that he's got sound routines he's got graphic routines a whole bunch of things that he just says you know usr one i want to play an explosion usr five i want to do a warp drive or whatever else so yeah and i i didn't know about that bug in the dragon so i wouldn't have known to fix that anyway so basically there's now versions for everybody so if you're on the World of Dragon archive form, you can actually get it now. I'm hoping it'll be submitted to the actual, you know, the download part of the site, not just the form site, so it'll be on there too as well. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd do it just a quick little demo, assuming this works. We'll see if this is... Ooh, look at that. And Lance Meklis was one of the keynote speakers at the first Tandy assembly, which I yes. got to meet him in person. Very interesting Very early guy. developer on the Model 1 and 3. Very interesting guy. Now this is running without the speed up poke. I would highly recommend you do run the speed up poke. If you have a Coco one or two, use the six five four nine five one, and if you have a Coco three, use the six five four nine seven one. It does speed it up quite a bit. So what's happening here is the Enterprise is engaged in an international game of ring toss. Is that what's going on down there? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the donut stop on the way. Um, now this this is your home base. Now the mission okay. is you have to go kill so many Klingons, you have to find so many class and planets, and then you have to return to your main base. Now there's other star bases where you can refuel and get your photons recharged and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this one here, if you come back to it, the game's over. You've completed your mission when you come back here. So if you come back here too early, you will get ranked, and they'll sometimes say like, "We recommend you be decommissioned and sent off to Never Neverland because you're an idiot and you didn't do anything you're supposed to." So I will just do. Uh, a random, I don't even know where the, I'm not going to check the map here. And I don't know if this sound will share here or not, but hopefully it does. Warp factor nine, Mr. Sulu. Look at that. Did you hear any sound? No. Not oh, darn. No, no such uh, musical type stuff but basically okay. it's uh noise noise pulsar noise noise it does this little druid at the beginning and then it shoots across like you saw there and then okay. it does this kind of explosion white noise sound to go into 
warp. And there's also some other sound effects, which I, I won't bother doing here so you can't see it. Here's another thing too, like you have a pulse or if you have a black hole, you start getting noise. You don't actually know what's in those sectors. So you have to explore them by hand. And if you at randomly warp, you can land right in a pulsar and black hole instantly die. So there's lots of ways to die in this game. Um, this is another ML routine he's got too. The yeah, blue borders are drawn with ML yeah. and the invert screen is done with ML. So it's a it's a pretty good hybrid little thing, a couple yeah. of routines in it. But if you're into Star Trek, like the classic Star Trek, not the modern 3D stuff and all that kind of thing, this this is probably the best one on the Coco or the Dragon, I would imagine. Though I haven't seen all the Dragon ones, so I guess I can't quite say that there. But Anyway, it's available online if you want to play it. And uh, you can also be able to download it off the Color Computer Archive shortly, hopefully this weekend, and from the Word of the Dragon Archive right now. Very cool. Thank you for doing that, Curtis and Karen. Yeah, it's one I've been meaning to get to. I even mentioned my site. I've been planning to do this for years, and I finally just decided to get there up my house and do it. So, and oh, this is going to be such YouTube a problem. YouTube is not behaving. Yeah, what? And what is the deal with this YouTube? I don't know. Anyway, I will just mention these. I guess just speak them out. So, old school games and stories. We featured him last week when he was playing. I think uh, Mega Bug. Um. And basically, he did Demolition Derby, which is another Tandy game, uh, kind of loosely based on bump and jump without the jumping, but basically you just ram cars off to the side and get bounced around. Pretty good yeah. game, though. Bump Pretty and good. bump. Here, this was a demo. Uh, the, the there's two cores for the Mister for handling the Coco right now. Roger Taylor is a commercial one. You you pay a few bucks to get in on, and, and John, I think that's one you guys are running. And there's also a, uh, a public domain free one for the Coco 1 and 2 that's constantly being worked on. And Dave Shadoff, who's in our Discord, is one of the developers of it. So they have a new release here, and they were actually testing uh, Farfall with you know background sound, higher semi-graphics and stuff. And, and basically, it's mostly running. There's a bit of a problem with some of the syncing. You can see at the top of the screen, the score is going over top the flames. And it keeps flickering back and forth between them, which it should be kind of hidden and, and more smooth. So unfortunately, I can't show you that either. This is going to suck today. Maybe try closing your browser and relaunching your browser. Or like close the browser, stop sharing, relaunch your browser, share again, something like that. You know? yeah. yeah, I'll try that for the regular news because this is the last story already. Okay. For the, yeah. the game and you could always switch to Chrome too if you've got it. I Actually, I had worse problems on Chrome because they would, just when I was loading the tabs, all of a sudden a whole bunch of them went blank and then all the controls disappeared. And I don't know if I have too many tabs open or what happened there, but Chrome was actually running worse. Hmm. Ball dozer. So, uh, obviously, Stuart Orchard, who was on our show uh, as our main interview last week, uh, his very first commercial game he ever did was Bulldozer. Now, he'd mentioned during the interview that the version that's been on the archives basically just plays Bulldozer. The original version loading off tape actually had a tape loader screen, but it actually had scrolling text explaining the story while it was loading off the cassette. Mm. So you'd get to read the story while you're waiting your couple of minutes. So he actually found that official working tape version of it. He's put it up on the World of Dragon Archive, and it should be on the regular Dragon Archive software too, not just the forms a bit later too, with that intact. So the people have not seen that. The original splash, splash screen we showed last week too is also on there. Here's your chance to come grab it. And then he also found, like he was mentioning last week, just like uh, Rick Adams, that you know, we were developing back then on cassette, and you had to assemble these big programs. Like I said, you'd have to swap it between tapes and your source code scattered, you know, takes you 20 minutes to even load, never mind assemble. He actually found one snippet of uh, partial source code for Bulldozer itself intact on a tape. So he's actually put that source code up. Oh, wow. It's not the complete game, but if you want to see what, you know, where he was at at the time in 1988, uh, programming Bulldozer, that actually he's up there. Hopefully you can find the rest of it. It'd be really That's cool to cool. get some of those because we don't have too much of the original source code for the games back in the 80s. There's a few, but not, not a ton by the original authors. Okay, and, so and that concludes game on news yeah um d d do you want me to run a quick commercial break and then yeah let me because I'm, I'm gonna have to reload all these tabs and there's a ton on the regular news so this is not gonna be fun yeah okay so while curtis reloads his tabs um we'll run a commercial break and then it gives everybody a chance to go potty smoke them if you got them and um and then we'll be back with, with news news. And so when it comes to commercial breaks, since Nick Morentes is still here, hopefully he's still awake, we'll play 
one of his uh, most uh, favorite commercials where we talk about his favorite operating system, Nitrous 9. <laughs> All right, so we'll be back after these words, boys and girls. And now, this message. Hi, it's Curtis Boyle, part of the uh, Coco Jack crew of people. Hey, everybody, this is Bill Noble co-author of Nitrous 9, you are listening to Coco Talk Live, the leading live Coco Talk show. Good day, mates. This is Nick Marionettes, author of such color computer titles as Donut Disaster, Rupert Rhymes, and Rockstar Pilot. And I am here today to tell you about the world's most fabulous operating system, OS9. OS9. OS 9 and its current incarnation Nitrous 9 is the most advanced operating system ever created. And what makes it so good? Ease of use. I find OS 9 so incredibly intuitive that I haven't once cracked open the user manual. And yet I've been able to create such incredible games faster than the time it takes to sing Walsing Matilda. Using OS 9, I expect my next game, Funstar, will be done this weekend and distributed exclusively on ROM cartridge. OS 9 forever. Any resemblance to actual events to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Hi, this is Max Jackson, live from Coco Fest. And you listen to The Real Gamer, Steve Shrow. We're traveling through a dimension both of sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and devise a solar radio, a wireless transmitter, measure time and light. 65 electronic projects brought to reality with this science fair kit. Astonishing, perhaps, but you can find it for Christmas for $17.95 in a place that's known as Radio Shack. Radios, stereos, recorders, everything in sound. today at lcurtisboyle.com. Hi, this is Sean Wheatley, and you're listening to Coco Talk with the original gamer, Stevie Stroke. We'll return after these messages. Here's a hi-fi bargain from your nearby Radio Shack store. Save $100 on our exclusive realistic 77 AM FM stereo receiver. Only $159.95 during the sale. With audio component features like FM muting, push-button tape monitor, main remote speaker switching, in a genuine walnut veneer case. The ideal control center for your new music system. The sale-priced realistic 77 receiver. Only at Radio Shack, a Tandy company. Hey, this is Eric, and you're listening to Coco Talk. Hey guys, Stevie Stroh, and if you're watching this, chances are you're a fan of the Coco, and hopefully Coco Talk. Before there was Coco Talk, there were my gameplay videos on YouTube, and I've got a couple of DVDs with some pretty cool collections. My first DVD was an assortment of videos that were on my YouTube channel with a special introduction, and this was released for my first Coco Fest I attended as kind of a, a pickup item you could grab at the show. However, 
there is more. I released another exclusive content for Coco Fest 26, and this has 13 videos and over two hours of gameplay goodness of things that are not on my YouTube channel. So these are exclusive Coco gameplay videos and reviews and a special introduction and an and outro from yours truly. And if you're a fan of Coco Talk, we have the best of Coco Talk volume one and volume two featuring some um some videos that were produced by brian joyce who created our two best of um episodes for us at the end of 2017 but there's also an exclusive never seen episode of coco talk that we recorded for this video with a bunch of us getting together talking about how excited we were for the upcoming coco fest that year and some bonus content as well so if you're looking for some really cool exclusive coco goodies that you can watch at home at any time you might want to check out a whole bunch of these dvds where you can also get uh, t-shirts and coffee mugs at the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com so swing on by today and grab yourself some cool coco gear from the makers of the switcheroo Wallaby Cable, Color Computer 3 Dual RGB Cable. Get yours today at cocoman.biz. Very good scared you, didn't I? <laughs> Hello there, it's me, Hudson Mo. Um, all the way from Melbourne to you, my darling. And um, congratulations on your talk show, Coco Talk. Oh my God, that's so exciting. I don't think I'd ever be good at a talk show. I just don't have anything ever to say, ever. I just can never think of things to say. It's just stuff with no words ever come out of my mouth. It's just very embarrassing. I just, it's just silence all the time. <laughs> my darling, I hope you're having a fabulous day. From me to you, bye. <laughs> Extended Color Basic, combined with a disc controller, brings you Disc Extended Color Basic. Direct access to your floppies. Direct access to all of your hardware resources. Deck B on your color computer. Deck B washes away the competition. Hello, this is Grant Leedy with Coco Talk. Got your Coco 3 yet? All right. Well, we've been stalling for time for Curtis Boyle, but. Um, uh, this is a public service announcement. Do not buy a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, we're here. There's just too much awesome Coco goodness, and it just overflowed my computer. I don't think it would have mattered which system was and um what are we doing here now we are so what are we gonna do we're gonna do updates and acquisitions is that the deal That's yeah do that deal. first and then i That's i'll that will give me time to finish opening all the tabs back up right 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 so on that note do we have updates and acquisitions do, does anybody have a project update and acquisition uh, story to share uh I, I think uh pedro you were raising your hand yeah, so I, I finally ordered uh, the Coco 3 board that I was putting together, and I got it in. Oh, wow. That's a beauty. And I assembled it, and it didn't work. And But I did a, I was able to figure out why it wasn't working, and then just one bodge wire uh, later, I got it to boot. And I have it over here. Mm. In there. And it actually fits in the Coco case. It fits in the Coco case. I did have to make some modifications. Uh, the connectors on the back were about a millimeter off. Uh, and that was pretty much it. That was basically it uh, so far. I'm still testing a bunch of stuff. Uh, I, For example, I haven't tested you know, cassette loading and cassette saving and a couple other things. I want to run, you know, I guess I need to find some more intense programs that are more intense to see, you know, how it runs and if it crashes or anything like that. And so I, I did 
Apache startup, uh, Nitrous 9 on there, he's a fuse. And I was playing around with it and using it and it, it was working. So I, I've made some progress on this and okay. I'm happy uh, yeah. with A good benchmark is going to be any of Sock Master's demos because he's pushing the hardware, right? So he's got the bouncing ball demo. He's got, uh, if you do something like the um, Donkey, Donkey King, Kong, Donkey Kong for the Coco 3, those things are pushing the hardware. So that would, that would be a good test. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll definitely load those on there. And another, so basically, I mean, the schematic, you know, is just, it was made and I just copied it and then implemented it in the board. And so, of course, the gimme, it's the gimme chip and all that. Uh, I guess what I'm really testing is whether or not, you know, um, I connected everything correctly. And, uh, you know, the, the routing does need work. You know, I routed it real, real quick just to get a prototype out, you know, something to test with. So, I mean, it works so far, but I mean, problems could come up with how, you know, it's routed in the future, depending on speed and that sort of stuff. And I'm also testing the PIA replacement. So I don't have the original 6821 or the, I forget what the, what the number is for what it, what they call it on the, um, on the Coco three, but it's compatible with the 6821. So I'm using the two WC, WDC uh, modern replacements on there and they seem to be working fine as well. I'm, I'm quite happy with how it's, uh, how it's working. And, uh, you know, so far, uh, the joysticks work as well. It works. It works okay. so far. Just need a gimme. You know, without a gimme, it's it's a husk. Right, but that's pretty cool. Uh, there was a question in the chat: Will it fit in a Coco Two case? And I I don't know the answer to that because the Coco Three technically has different uh, portals in the back that are. Cut it is out. a different form factor. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, now that we have a working circuit. And we have a form factor form factor for at least one of the Coco twos, the one that I one that I already had made before. It it can be done. Okay. I mean, they're, they're you know I just have to you know change uh you know the uh, the edge cut, uh, you know in the PC in PCB in the PCB software, and you know move the components around. But yeah, Man. can be done. I don't see why not. Yeah, we, we, we were doing a test call last night and then we started getting into the topic of, because this topic keeps coming up, is like, you know, what would a, you know, what would a Coco 4 be like? Or if, if, you'd, if, you, if somebody was to make a new Coco from scratch, um, what, what would make it sell, you know? And we all kind of chimed in on our opinions. And I think we've talked about this before, but I'm, I speak for myself, and which I think is most of the casual consumers. I don't think anybody wants to buy a new Coco-like product that's not fully compatible. So if anybody was to make a, we won't put a number after the name, but let's just call it a new Coco. If somebody was to make a new Coco that had new features, that's great. But for me specifically, I wouldn't buy it unless it was 100% hardware compatible with cartridges and joysticks and this and that and the other. If you want to add more things like gimme X's and extra processors and extra sound chips and you want to add more, 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 there there's never going to be enough. But if, if it's 1% not compatible, you know, I don't know that that would be the product I would want to buy. But I'm, I'm speaking for myself, not for the universe. But I think the things that you're doing and Ed Snyder is doing, I think these worlds are going to converge at some point in time. And we will be able to make a whole complete Coco replacement with real hardware. And uh, the question is, is do we now stray from the DNA and create a new breed of Coco, which I think would be an interesting project. But I don't think it would be as adopted as well, because if there's not existing things to support it, it's going to be like any of the sound cards. Nobody's developing for the current sound cards right now. Who's going to develop for a whole new platform? You know, um, yeah. so that was kind of my two cents on that. But I, I think we are we are on the cusp of being able to build from scratch a brand new Coco compatible system with real hardware or hybrids of real hardware and FPGA type stuff. And I think that's an exciting time. Yeah. Well, if you look this, at, oh, yeah. But you know, because in this case, you can actually make it fully compatible with what you've been testing. And actually, I've got three of your videos up on the queue here for that. Um, but you're, you're maintaining that hundred percent backwards compatibility as it stands now that Stevie's talking about. And now you can expand on that and add new features without breaking the backwards compatibility. Right. And I, and I was going to say, I agree with you, uh, Stevie there that I, I, you know, I do want the backwards compatibility, but I think we are on a cusp where you can have sort of a transitional to something else where you can have, uh, you know, something with new, I don't know, something with 
more memory, uh, better graphics capabilities, better sound that you were saying, but still maintain the original, you know, compatibility, but have room, you know, to do new things uh, with, right, you know, right. and, and still be a Coco I, 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 that that's what I want to see at least, yeah. but we are, but we can make them from scratch now. Right. You know, with the gimme X, um, uh, and basically every chip is available. You can still buy them except so the 6309, I mean, the 6309 is still being made. It's a little pricey, but it's still being made. Um, the gimme X now, you know, to replace the gimme, uh, salt chip, um, that's been replaced. And I guess the only chip on there left that really, you can't really get uh, brand new is the, uh, the DAC chip, the, uh, SC, you know, so this five, two, six chip, uh, which, uh, you know, as, uh, Karen was, uh, pointing out, uh, the dragon didn't have one and it does the same thing. So in theory, that circuit from the dragon just can be re-implemented, you know, in a future Coco design. And, uh, you know, with a Coco, a Coco three can be made from scratch already. We have the technology. Uh, we can build we it. Have <laughs> <laughs> and we can make it faster and stronger. Let me let me run by the screen in slow motion now. <laughs> that would be awesome. So Yeah, I mean to me there's two phases of the project. One is to get to the point where we can replace an existing Coco 3 motherboard because that's one thing that has not been really fixable before. We've got some replacement chips that's been going on for a while now. Obviously, there's a few others we still have to tweak to, to get fully going, like the, the DAC and possibly the ADC, too. But we, we had no way to replace a broken motherboard. And, and now you've kind of solved that problem. And now we can take the stuff that's being newly done, like the Game X, et cetera, and combine the two. We can actually come up with a real Cocoa 4. Because the problem with the Cocoa 4s back in the early 90s, the Tomcats, the MM1s, and everything else, is that they weren't backwards compatible. So they had you, know, you had to run OS nine, and then you could run an OS nine simulator to simulate, you know, the Coco three's OS nine. But then you couldn't play any DOS stuff at all. So like Twilight Terminal and games and stuff, nothing worked. So that wasn't really a Coco four. That was kind of like you know skipping ahead to something similar on a you know based similarly, but not compatible. And you lost the back right. catalog horribly. You lost the back catalog on a lot of the hardware, not all, but they did make the joysticks and the RGB monitor work. Uh, and then you lost a big chunk of the backward software catalog, basically everything just basic. Yeah. So I mean, your original investment gone. Right. Yeah. And the yeah. MM1 and stuff did try. I mean, they did make it so that you could use this, you know, the standard analog joysticks. You could use the standard analog RGB monitor. That was something different than jumping to a PC or jumping a Mac where you lost absolutely everything. You could at least keep some of your hardware investment, but and you could keep your OS9 through emulation. You can keep some of your OS9 software investment. But most people, let's be honest, even back then, were running Disk Basic for a lot of things, and all that was gone. So this this kind of solves the problem we had back in the 90s. Well, you know, also, I've been thinking that, you know, we can... I was thinking of starting, like, a page, a project called... Uh, I wanted to call it, like, uh, Coco++ or something like that. You know, like if you know how to program, you know, that's the increment. Yeah, C++ or whatever, right? So, yeah. Coco++, you know, sort of a project to bring a Coco to life, you know, add to the world, you know, because, you know, you before, you know, they're just dying or people are taking parts out of them, but they're dying. So it's been like Coco minus minus for a while. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, it can you have something called the Coco++ where we can just make one and bring one back from you know not but without having to destroy another one right right it's, not you know, having to else. sacrifice uh cannibalize you know or, do organ now. donors right. and stuff so yeah yeah um that would be cool hopefully that'll get the prices of coco threes and ebay down a bit too so. right <laughs> we can actually, or in your case i mean you can actually build a coco three from scratch now and not have to go you know, right and if you're building it from you scratch well, it's still kind of pricey yeah yeah yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. you're buying a new one yeah yeah, yeah but, but you're getting a brand new one you're getting a brand new enough to worry about yeah, the did get one with bad solder joints or a crack motherboard or who knows what you know <laughs> everything can be socketed so you don't have to worry about desoldering things and all that and everything is socketed on this one yeah, uh, yeah. it was it's very nice it was very helpful during the troubleshooting yeah, and that'll help for people like Nick Moroder or myself who have no soldering skills whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> that we don't, if you want to upgrade to a CPU, especially if some of like these newer CPU, FPGA based CPUs, like the Turbo 09 and stuff, that comes out and you want to run your Cocoa at, you know, a gigahertz or something like that. 
you know, right. for people that can't do the desoldering, if you have a Cobra 3, you're just kind of stuck unless you can find somebody. Right. And, and and just, you know, I know we're getting off on a tangent here, but if you were to design that new Coco Plus Plus, I think a, ni- a nice thing to have would be an onboard bus, kind of like a built-in multi-pack. Because, um, yeah. like, Jim Brain is working on a card that lets you have multiple CPUs. He's got a DMA controller. He's got all these different things and um and sound cards and all kinds of stuff so if you had something like a multi-pack built into the back plane that still worked on the same addressing stream scheme and you know control cs lines and stuff and and so now we have a bus so now you've got a kind of like an apple II style implementation where you've got your base computer but you can add expansion cards and those would all be compatible as well the you know there, there's the sky's the limit with so, compatibility, you know? So what I was thinking, so I, you know, I've never used an MPI. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't really know how it works all that well. I mean, I understand the concept and, you know, I tried to buy one, but the, those are pricey as well. I did find uh, designs for one online. So I guess I could build one if I want, right? Um, yeah, plus Ed sells, uh, you know, the mini and the mega mini as well. You're right, those two, yeah, you know, which I, I might buy one. But, you know, so what I was thinking was uh, I could make a Coco 3 board that um, sort of with an ATX form factor. So you can buy an off the shelf ATX uh, case, right. throw it in there. Right. But then where would the MPI go? So you could have the MPI. I was thinking at least maybe you have like a like a large case and, um, you know, the drive base could be. Uh, the MPI that on the or, case. I don't know if this if the if the width would be right, but like the expansion slots in the back of a PC case. If you had a riser board where you could put the things in horizontally instead of vertically, you could like snap in these cartridges in the back of the case where your little slot yeah, well, covers. That, right. that too. That might be an option. And if you could implement the MPI on your motherboard, that raises the base price of your motherboard by the cost of an MPI. I would pay, you know, twice as much for a motherboard that had the mpi built in because now i don't have to go get one right yeah. right yeah with its own separate power supply yeah, but but that so. again keeps the level of backwards compatibility where you've got some expandability where somebody can design something we haven't even thought of yet as long as it would work in an mpi and it'll work in a cocoa cartridge boom we've got some future proofness in our backplane you know yeah i mean yeah. like you said sky's the limit uh, yeah. you know and if you are doing that, do do the implementation that Ed did. Because one thing, there, there's two conflicting types of, of cartridges, basically. There's the game cartridges with the auto start. But the way it's set up right now is that you can't get IRQs off of hardware devices on the MPI without selecting the slot first. Now, if you oh. have multiple pieces of hardware that are trying to generate interrupts, that means you have to manually switch it over to check them all. Otherwise, they never get through the cocoa, which yes. absolutely sucks for OS9. Unless and a lot you modify of us, your MPI. Yeah, so a lot of us modified the MPI to strap the RQ lines together by hand, but then the auto start cartridges for games don't work. Now, Ed implemented it. You have this little poke you can do with basically just to switch on off on, at will. So if you're booting OS 9, you can tell it, I want the RQs to come through. Don't worry about trying to start Polaris on a cartridge. And if, okay. if somebody's just playing games, they can, you can default to power on to be you know the backwards compatible, but you can actually set it up both ways without having to do a hardware modification. And that'd be a good thing to implement on, on your version if you implemented built into the actual motherboard itself because then you have the best of both worlds if you want to be a yeah. hardcore sign user with a ton of hardware go for it if you're just gonna be a game player with three game cards and an stc that's fine too or a sound card whatever yeah yeah i mean yeah good tip i, I would have never thought of that because i've never used one but uh yeah it's, it doesn't sound that hard to do i guess you just uh ord the lines together or something yeah yeah because basically you have you have one cart interrupt coming from the cartridge port of the coco itself yeah. the mpi Norton by default only has one slot you can select to let that through to the Coco. And if okay. you have an RSTO32 pack in slot one and you have a hard drive controller that both use interrupts and say slot three and you have it selected slot three, you will never see anything from the RSTO32 ever. And now that we've got you know programmable timers on some of these new sound cards and stuff, that's an opportunity to be able to have the sound card trigger like I'm ready for the next batch of notes or an explosion sound or whatever. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. Of course, if you really want to be a Coco God, you will give us separate interrupts for each cart line and a real IRQ controller on your new Coco board. Wow. <laughs> oh, so we don't have to poll everything. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to make any promises there, but yeah, it sounds like we've got the, the, the committee chief is already just self appointed himself there. Right. So yeah, <laughs> it sounds doable. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's cool. It, it is uh, nice programming a PC with that IRQ controller, I have to say. It's yeah, nice. but the fact that, just getting back to what your your original project was, you know, to have a replacement motherboard is going to be a great thing for people that, you know, you've got you've got your wounded Cocos out there. Now we have a way to heal them. So that's awesome. Yeah, oh, I so. mean, with everything Ed's done, that's something he has not covered is a replacement motherboard for somebody that got a Coco 3 out of the attic and it, it doesn't work because, you know, something cracked or broke or whatever. So this is really good. Yeah, I, and and there are broken motherboards out there. I've, I mean, I've heard a lot from you guys, and I and I just bought one not too long ago, and I was like, well, let me try to repair it first. And I mean, there were lines on there, there were traces that were not that are broken. I I can't they don't buzz out, and I can't see where they're broken. So I, I know that's out there. So I think in this case, uh, at least for the Coco Three, um, it makes some sense cool well, i guess when people were, huh i was just going to say the fact that you're running os9 already is a very good sign because that's double speed all the time you're banging the mmu left right and down the center yep it's plus you were running the 6 through 9 version of, of nitrous 9 so you're running things faster than normal already the, the yes so the, the 6 through 9 yes yeah uh, i was uh, worried i was going to crash i thought for sure because that uh, you know i looked at the dodgy routing on them and <laughs> I was like, well, there's going to be all sorts of noise and everything's just going to go to hell real fast. But no, it didn't crash on me. I um, uh, Maybe I won't fix the routing. Maybe I don't fix the routing. <laughs> don't, don't fix what ain't broken. It works. Yeah. Yeah, you, the Joust transcode worked too on your case, and that's also pushing the machine a bit as well. It did work. It did work. It did work. Although I would, you know, a bit into it, it did crash, but I think I'm there. there's more than one version out there, right, of Joust or the transcode? Yeah, 1.1, 1 .1, it was supposed, as far as I know, it just patched the, the floppy controller not being to shut the drive motor off, as, as far as I know, the only patch. Oh, okay, okay. Well, no, it did, it did crash on me once, but I, I don't know why. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it was something funky. What I did have some trouble was, I what I wasn't too sure about was actually, uh, so when I was trying to figure out, you know, I couldn't find anywhere um, where the, um, you know, the memory, you know, the port, where the port goes on the Coco 3 for the upgrades, the memory upgrade. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't find that anywhere, you know, documented anywhere. So I had to like buzz it out. So I was kind of worried that wasn't going to work uh, at first. And I thought maybe I still have something wrong with that. But no, it, uh, it, it that that seems to work. So I don't think that's related to the crash I saw. Got some comments from the chat too. So we've got uh, welcome to our regular new Coco Talk feature. Hit the guest with feature creep. Which is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> All and sorts then, of stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Karen asks, uh, how do you root? Free rooting? Well, so I start off, you know, like, uh, I start off by hand, you know, like, you know, well, the, the traces that I know uh, I want a certain thickness, like, you know, power and that sort of stuff. And then, you know, once I can't take it anymore, yes, I use free routing. It's, Is that uh, like software driven where it figures out the path to take or something? Oh, it's really cool to look at too, you know. So it does like a, I think it does push and shove routing. And then it actually brings it up for you. Um, and you can see, you know, all the lines being routed, all the vias being created and destroyed. And it's it's really nice. And it's a great piece of software and saved me a bunch of times. It's, uh, you know, uh, the auto routing stuff is, um, it comes with all these expensive, uh, you know, uh, EDA packages, you know. And I don't, I don't know if there's a lot of free stuff out there uh, when it comes to auto routing. But this free routing um, program um, that was created, I think, by a German uh, gentleman way back when. If I remember correctly, it was on a, a website. He had the route in his website, but then he open sourced it and just gave it away. And then a lot of people are using it now. It's it's really good. It's really, really good. It's really, it's really good. Is that piece of fritzing? Is that the fritzing? No, um, not fritzing. Um, I can't remember his name. Okay, actually, I can look that up real fast. But that's all right. That's all right. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, while you're thinking about that, let's see who else might have a project update or acquisition on the panel here. And then, Curtis, are you almost done getting your news stack back up? Or are you still? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready tabs? to go. Um, Rondell Vo, uh, I see you playing on a Coco there. Are you, did you get the new Coco Pie image, Rondell Vo? You're on mute. Yes, I yes I did. Is that what you're playing with now? Or are you playing yeah. on a real Coco? I'm playing on. The pie okay it looks like a real cocoa but <laughs> yeah it does he's got a cocoa pie in a cocoa case with a cocoa yeah. keyboard so uh yeah. 
Yeah. It's, uh, I'm playing uh, Flight Simulator. I just crashed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so hopefully that'll make it to the news that the new Cocoa Pie image is out there. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, who else? Anybody, anybody else have an update? Uh, Brian, you had to drop off. Uh, so I'm sorry, Ron, were you going to say something else? Yeah. Brian Weasler. Hello? Yeah. Uh, Brian, you yep. missed it. We played your promo quick clip and you said that some people might think I have a problem and I just wanted to clarify <laughs> everybody knows you have a problem Brian so just... <laughs> <laughs> Steve well, along you that... weren't going to mention that <laughs> <laughs> along that lines let me reinforce that theory then so <laughs> <laughs> I do have a couple things here I can I can show you guys that uh, I recently uh, did get um, uh, computes made this little thing called the Y box and it plugged in and basically just gave you like a, it's like a little two port okay. MPI of sorts then. So you could plug two cartridges in into the, into the side of your cocoa like that. So it was called the, uh, you know, the Y box. Um, also, uh, one thing I've been kind of, uh, out there looking for and, uh, was the, uh, Kenton made their, uh, um, it's, they're RS-232, and what's different about this one is that it has an edge card connector on it, and it didn't have the cable, so I'm, I'm having to make one. I'm waiting for some other cables, but I did buy some uh, 5010 edge card, and there's two ribbon cables, and it's, it ends up being a dual uh, RS-232s on there. And uh, I guess there's a couple cool things you can do. One thing you could have, like an OS-9, from what I understand, you could have one go into a modem or something like that, and then the other could go to a, a serial mouse through uh, through OS 9. Does that sound correct, Curtis? I remember, yes. Uh, Stevie, can you move the, the couple of windows over top the Zoom here? Because we can't even see them. <laughs> Join us the well, his... No, your chat window, participant window. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're not looking at that. Sorry. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure what you were looking at there. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yep. So here's that uh, the RS-232 again. So it's the it was the dual one by Kenton, and so I did have one of these laying around here. It's a I actually did have a candy serial mouse, so I might uh, might get a chance to do some more OS9 playing, which is one of my things that I want to do. I want to try to get this serial mouse working through the uh, 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 through that Kenton uh, uh, dual RS-232 that they have. Yeah, and somebody else recently on Discord actually got that running. So apparently the driver is still working. I know Bill Noble said he just got his R32 he got from Tim Linder working again, too. So he's going to be working on that as well. In fact, he might try to merge the drivers together so we can actually run, you know, both the regular mouse joysticks as well as the serial mouse. Oh, at the same time. Time. Okay. Because yeah, I guess what it, uh, one of the advantages is that you don't need, you get uh, the advantages of high res without having to use a high res interface. There's a couple advantages. I mean, that's that's one big one. It's also a lot smoother because it's all digital, and it it, mm -hmm. it send it doesn't send an absolute position. It sends I've moved left thirty pixels or whatever. Oh, okay. And it's also interrupt driven, which means like the high res one takes a fair bit of CPU time to sample, sub sample and stuff to get the readings at high res. Whereas a serial mouse, if you don't move it, it takes no CPU time at all because it doesn't generate an interrupt. Okay. So you don't slow the system down running a bunch of windows with high res mice running. That you, yeah, that you don't need them. Okay. Well, something more to play with there. Um, also, too, um, I can't pronounce the guy's name here. Uh, P I O R T, and his last name was B U G A J. Um, he's on the on the Dragon forums, and he was making a uh, reproduction of the Dragon uh, floppy disk controller. So mm. this is obviously good, and, and then you can put your uh, ribbon cable here. So he was selling those on. Uh, Oh, what was the website? Um, I guess it doesn't matter. But he had posted out there on the um, out there on the Dragon site there that he was selling these that, that were available. So I picked up one of those to try getting a Dragon going on the uh, or get a floppy drive going on the Dragon. Excuse me. So that came in here recently. Uh, what else? And you guys might have seen this on Facebook there. Uh, Ed does have some of these out there. I think he still has three keyboards. They usually go pretty quick. So I did get uh, one of Ed's keyboards. Um, it, he has that gray speckled look going. That's nice. Which I, which that, I that's really one like. of the stories I was going to bring up. And actually, since you're, you're here to show it, uh, 
when did he start selling those? Because I've got a couple of his keyboards with a standard black background. I didn't even know he had an alternate because the speckle. Well, yeah. So he had started. Uh, I, I also have here one of his MPIs. Oops, let me take the SD. So he has one of his four port MPIs, and he did that in the speckle. And he's had, I had this since about the first of the year. So I think he's been doing it for most of this year. Um, and then he's also started doing the SD cases in that gray speckled as well. And uh, I just happened to pop out to his site because I've been wanting to buy another keyboard and just kind of been watching. And uh, that's what he was printing them in. So I don't know if he if he likes the color, if he happened to buy a big spool of gray and he needs to use it up. <laughs> I don't he know. must have got a heck of a deal on it. Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of the <laughs> 90s when I would flex stone everything. I would have flex stoning my speakers to get that speckle look and everything. Yeah, yeah so. I, I really kind of like it. I mean, yeah, maybe the color doesn't quite go with the cocoa, but I, uh, overall, I, I really yeah, like it. I think it looks really cool. I think it does work. It looks better because it's still, got kind of dark and light picture. gray, right? Yeah. yeah. So... Um, and I, I, had, I had a little fun on Facebook there, kind of making a reference, you know, to the this Coco is now the ultimate power in the universe. Because this is my uh, my Gimme X uh, Coco that I put that in there, which also has the 8 meg uh, upgrade in it. And so people had a lot of fun with the, the Star Wars uh, theme that uh, I kind of went with it. So right. it ended up being a, kind of fun. Um, and then lastly here, I'll share with you, um, well, I guess uh, one little book here. Osborne makes uh, this series of uh, books here that kind of go that are Commodore, Vic Twenty, and Coco or Color Computer specific. Right. And uh, this is another one. There's, there's like four or five of them. This one here is the Computer Spy game. So it just has a couple little quick entry uh, games that you can do in there. And then the other thing that's not necessarily Coco, but this, this little screen was uh, out there really cheap, and it takes both VGA and HDMI. And I thought it might be kind of fun just to kind of have mounted off to the side. Oops, get, get the right angle here. But it actually does display uh, rather nicely. Is that new or is that used? No, it's used. Okay. So, Look at that. You get oh, your Coco nice. too. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Maybe okay. a little bit of a glare there. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, yep. So this is coming in through. Uh, this is plugged into my Gimme. And uh, it's the, the VGA out that's uh, that you're seeing right now. So oh, That is an actual Coco 3 right there. Hey, yep. you got your Coco 3 yet? All right, so yeah, cool. <laughs> so, had a comment from Mitsuyama, who's uh, one of the Amigos regular viewers there, and he says, "Wow, I had that book as a kid, referring to the Spy Games." Oh, okay. Yeah, I I didn't grab the rest of the series though, but this is the I think this is the only one that I was missing out of the uh, the ones that were available. So great cover art on that kind of stuff. And of course, it's going to be a type in game that's all text, probably. But yeah, the cover art was pretty awesome. <laughs> Forgive me. I did have one other thing here. It was down here on, on the floor. I forgot. I oh, that's not a surprise for, at all, Brian. <laughs> I have been holding out for one of these for a couple of years now. They never seem to pop up, and that is the uh, the MMS twenty. Ah, oh, the multimedia station. Look, you got your little yep. equalizer in there, and you can right, put your the, monitor on top of it. Right now, the, the there's the MMS ten. And it doesn't have the equalizer on okay. it. It's, ju it's just the just the box, and it's also a little bit smaller, okay. and uh, not as wide. And uh, this is definitely physically bigger, and it has the equalizer. So now, I've been wanting to get one of these. Do you also have the power command switch thing of all the little toggle switches that you get to put all, plug all your stuff into and switch those on and off? Because that's the holy grail, uh, right? To have I that, lost you here. Sorry. Power you know the power switch commander that's got all your little illuminated toggle switches? So you've got your you master, audio. your monitor, your auxiliary, your printer. We can hear you, Brian, but I don't think you can hear oh, us at the moment. There we go. Oh, now there you're go. back. I'm sorry. Do the, I have the command? You said command what? The the power command switch thingy. It's got all your toggle switches. For, it's like a power strip with the oh yes, yes, the I little do have, illuminated uh, toggles. So yeah, I do have two. I do have two of those, so I can sit there and just push. Yeah. So if one you on, have yeah. like you have your <laughs> multimedia thing, and then you got your little power switchy thing, and you got your monitor on top of that. That's just the rack of awesomeness right there. You know that goes. On <laughs> yeah, top I do have. I, I don't have them up right now, but yes, that would be kind of cool. You'd have all all you're missing is the uh, the cigarette lighter that fits that fits in a three and a half inch drive bay. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would be complete. Well, yeah, because you could have the power strip, and then you could I could have this on top of it. And then I could have the uh, the CM8 on top of its stand. So, on top of the stand, you know, there you go. Yeah, of course you'd have to look up by the time you get that all stacked up. On <laughs> yeah, your whiplash. Right? It's like being in the front row at the movie theater, right? That'd so, be your exactly. standing desk where you're actually physically <laughs> standing. Up. So, there we go. And that's a Tandy product, so it's all in the family right there. All in the family. There you go. Yeah. 
And folks, this is just a regular haul for Brian. Wait till you see the special we're having in September. <laughs> cool, 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 cool. Thank you, Brian Weasler. Last call for updates and acquisitions before we go back to L. Curtis Boyle in the newsy news. Yeah, if this works, here's my surprise of the week. So I was making my own keyboard replacement, and you know, here's the little thing with the switches, and I'll click it next to my mic. They're absolutely silent. Okay. Not a sound to be heard, okay? So I put it in a Coco keyboard. Okay. You can still hear a little bit of clickiness. But not oh, it's lot. not coming through my mic. This is the loudest clicky keyboard I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can, now the, we can hear it. We can hear the clickiness. It's, it's the same switches, but it sounds like a herd of... Um, <laughs> sounds like an IBM Type M. <laughs> yes, is it, it as loud as Ed Snyder's keyboard, I guess, because he's got the mechanical... It, it probably too. is. It's louder than the cherry reds in this desktop keyboard. So, and, Rick, is that to is that to replace the metal plate and membrane? Yeah. It, okay. It sits Does on it the back. Work? No. Yes, it actually works, and the I have a little Coco two three switch, so you can make the alt control the up and down arrows. So. Oh, awesome! Uh, Coco that would game. solve a lot of game playing button. from the old days. Yeah. And my intention was to make it not detectable so you couldn't tell that this wasn't a stock coco but then this click thing came along <laughs> my silent switches are really loud so i don't is know the, if is the is the click coming from the switch or is it coming from the uh the key itself hitting the top of the switch well no they the the way the coco works and i don't i should have a visual thing there's a little plastic finger that comes out and sits on top of the switch so yep. when you push the key down the finger eventually pushes down on the switch but it just barely pushes it i had to look high and low for switches that were light enough touch for this to work um but it man does it get loud when it's bolted into a i, I guess it's the board resonating maybe i could stick some of that um sound deadening crap on the back of it or something <laughs> hey i have something what's that marco when Rick goes, when Rick's done, I have something. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so, that's all. So, I have. Rick, I just want to let you know, um, you do have competition for the most uh, bodacious beard in the Coco community oh, because no. we had we had Paul Fiscarelli on last night, and he's <laughs> giving you a run for his money now with his beard. I think yours is still fuller, but his lengthwise, he might not have the girth, but he's definitely getting the length on his beard. I've got to so. get to growing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even recognize him when he was on the call. Exactly. I was going to say that when I joined on last night, it was kind of late though. It's like, who's the character in the middle? I didn't even know who it was <laughs> until I read the name. <laughs> also a comment from Mikey. Uh, he says, I want the loudest Coco keyboard in town. Gimme, gimme. So maybe don't put any dampeners in there. Yeah, uh, so yeah. Both ways. Yeah. Uh, how long does it take you to make one? Uh, the board comes from JCPCB, but they won't solder the switches on yet. So it takes me, I would say, 15 minutes once I'm in the mode to solder all the switches on. That's moving. It's not bad. It's not bad. So when uh, are you going to start selling them? Uh, Tommy Gunn said you could put O-rings under the keycaps. Um, <laughs> no, you would have to see how the Coco keyboard works. The The key is... is clicked indirectly so uh, the path the force path from keycap through a spring to the backing plate doesn't have anything to do with the force that's put on the switch it's really a very nicely designed keyboard for hmm. what it for what it was in fact i think i've got a picture here let me give me just one second um projects coco keys pictures because i was doing a little thing okay um i will stop sharing my screen and okay, i will give you you can probably give a lifetime uh, see if I you have the calm mr sula dump into this so here's how it works there would be a spring right here in the middle that holds it up okay so it doesn't matter how hard you how hard or lightly you bang on the key the force that's put on the switch is controlled by this plastic lever here Okay. And it's very so flexible, I, looks like. Like a little seesaw. It's very flexible. In fact, I had to go down to 60, whatever the unit of measurement is, switches, which is the lightest thing you can buy to uh, get this to work. So the amount of click that comes out of that tiny little bit of movement 
is absolutely amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, I guess that's that. So what are those switches rated for how many presses? Oh, millions. I don't remember how yeah. many millions. But I mean, so you could do a lifetime warranty on that baby, right? Hopefully so. I'm. I, this one exists to well, be my... Uh, right. At our age, the lifetime warranty wouldn't be that long anyway. So, well, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm the Next kind week, of guy that will, that will kind of... Why isn't this working? So, so I'm stress testing it pretty good. Uh-huh. Well, a good stress test would be to send it to Stevie and then give him a whole bunch of keyboard-based games to play. When he gets rage quitting there, that'll give it a real test. Uh, That's true. Oh wow, David Ladd! Hey, David Ladd! Oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, it's none other than David Ladd. David Ladd, for your viewing and listening pleasure. Uh, ask your doctor if David Wright is David Ladd is right for you. If, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. If you experience David Ladd for more than four hours, please consult a physician. Uh, please get a shot. <laughs> Uh, uh, more updates and acquisitions going once, going twice. Me, we'll get me. some news. Oh, that's right. Marco. Marco. Yeah, I forgot. I actually got something here. Um, right. Check this out. This is a silicon block for soldering. It has these little things uh, on the side to put stick wires in so you can bring two of them together and solder them. It's got plugs and it's called the, uh, <laughs> the hot holder. And guess what? It comes from Radio Shack. Ooh. So here's a dumb question because I have a I have a silicon mat on my workbench that they say you could solder on. Is silicon somewhat heat resistant? It's very uh, very very. <laughs> okay, so if I was to put a hot solder tip, uh, the hot solder iron tip where tip was to make contact with the um, with the silicon, it wouldn't automatically. Would it still make a burn mark? Maybe some discoloration? No. No. I've got, oven mitts. I've got oven mitts made out of that stuff. Oh wow. Yeah, I think it's be really, really hot. So Okay. But... Well that's a good thing. So that's basically anyway. a part holder. So it holds it in place for mm-hmm. you so you don't burn your fingers with your left hand while you're exactly. soldering with your right hand. Okay. Yeah, and the problem with like these things is that when they heat up during plastic, they'll the pins will start to move out of position. Uh, right. A lot of times right. I'll stick them these are XLR connected for like mics. So I'll actually put a pair of them together. With these, you just stick it in there and then it then will doesn't move at all. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, so anyway, and obviously has a much higher melting point than my hair, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, they're asking forty dollars for these, thirty nine dollars. Are there are there still new old stock, or is this just a random find on these eBay? Are, these are brand new. Uh, they're on okay. RadioShack.com. Yeah. Oh, on the so this is not an old item. This is a new item. No, it's a new item. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, so the way I got this one is a friend was looking at these, and I had seen them, and they had a deal where if you bought uh, something for fifty dollars or more, it had free shipping. Okay. And if you got $70 or more, there's a $30 uh, discount uh, coupon. So we got two of them for 25 each. Wow, nice. So, With free shipping. And free shipping. Yep. Right. So anyway, yeah, $40 was too much for this. And it's like, it is a nice chunk of silicon. But, yeah. Nice. Anyway. So I have to say that, that, deal, that that's heartening that Radio Shack's selling useful electronic gear again instead of you know, <laughs> resell phones. Yeah. That is pretty cool. Thank you, Mr. Um, Overholzer. I have a possible project update for oh, you. Oh, crikey. Well, oh, good God. <laughs> just a quick one, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, does Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, that, and I'll make sure the sound is on as well. So, yeah, I've added another level to my game. So, Ooh. is that working? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, oops. Uh, hang on. I, can you still see it? We can see it, yes. Okay. All right, yeah, so I uh, completed another level. So I'm going through the game l- level by level, adding in whatever the um, machinery or whatever it is on that this. level to work. So I finished that one just yesterday, and this level is going to be called Romper Stomper. <laughs> so it's just a whole lot of uh, stomping things. And uh, you've got to navigate underneath them in order to get to the individual switches that you have to act deactivate. But yeah, so that, that is was super cool. Latest. That is really cool. Yeah, yeah, that is. I'm, yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't die or anything as yet. So I'm leaving that feature to last. <laughs> yeah, but you can ride on the uh, elevators. 
What about the stomping? Can you get stomped right now, or will it not? Yeah, um, no, no, you can't. You can walk right under it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but yeah, the idea is that you have to uh, sort of sneak under right. and get get through to um, get to the other side in order to get to switches. Oh, there's the, the, that just went from red to green. I see that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So it's not too hard, but ah, uh, oh well, it's fun. <laughs> that is awesome. There's a really robot good. to contend to as well on yeah. uh, the second level there. But, so, but anyway, I'll Nick, just... are you gonna are you gonna make it bloody if one of those things? <laughs> no, <laughs> I could, but Little I mean, hanging off the side type of thing. <laughs> shrapnel well, and meat. <laughs> yeah, but I've got the feature of uh, when he falls, he says those famous words. Crocky. Crocky. <laughs> uh, crocky. So, so he, does, he does that. That'll be great. That is and awesome. The, and, and that's is better than any blood splatter. <laughs> well, that's what I figured. And there is one more sound effect to go in there. So uh, he, he also says, really? Really? Yeah, the David Ladd, <laughs> really. But I'm going to set that up. I'm going to set that up so there's certain areas of of a screen say whereby when you walk up to say a machine whatever and you're about to try and negotiate how to get past it it will sense that it will pause take control away from the player for a second so you lose control you know, the, the player doesn't want to move and the player says Really? <laughs> In other words, do you really want me to go through this? And then, it, and then it continues, just to give it a bit of personality. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's uh huh. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah, we can get a we get a voice actor for you here. They give you an authentic. Uh... Well, it, it is. It's it's taken from the authentic sound. Really? <laughs> is it, is it too right? late to redesign the sprite to make him look like David Ladd? <laughs> That's what I want. Well, it would it wouldn't take no, much. I'd just no. cut the hair off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need you would need two megs of RAM to handle the extra capacity of that sprite. So yeah. Well, if the robot gets squished, does their parts and pieces come off, maybe? Well, no. At the moment, I don't have the robots going under anything like that. So uh, that that's the easy way out, having to not worry about it. At the moment, it wouldn't hurt him, hurt the robot either. But I figured some people will say, why, why doesn't he get squished and I do? That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured just, just don't let just the avoid robots the problem. go under it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, that's uh, it. All uh, right. Thank you, Nick Morentes. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing. Are you ready for news, L. Curtis Boyle? I think so. Hopefully, that doesn't uh, hopefully start we'll back share. So I'll go ahead and play the news intro, then we'll get to L. Curtis Boyle. From around the world, what you need to know. Get caught up on news with L. Curtis Boyle. A new Muppet News Flash. All right, take it away, L. Curtis Boyle, and let's hope that the tabs are with us. <laughs> the tab gods. Yes, the tab gods will hopefully be smiling upon us. Okay, I see that. Well, that's a GitHub page, though. But um... Yeah, this this will work. Okay. So Tim watching? Linder, actually, he popped onto the Cocoa Talk after dark last night, or test stream, whatever you want to call it, and actually talked about this project a little bit. So what he's doing is he's redoing the Cocoa ROMs and shifting them up in memory starting with color basic and it works his way down you know to extended to disk so that you can free up more room for basic here he is showing how much memory you have free if you only have color basic installed using this patch on a 64k coco so you can see you've got right. 55,000 bytes available for a basic program right. and of course you know, drop by 8k for each one you go down a little bit more on disk but basically you should be able to, even with a disk system to get 40k uh, free for a basic program now i do remember there's some commercial stuff that did that back in the day but uh you know, it's kind of hard to find. I don't think it did this where if you had less basic, it would give you even more RAM. So if you want to write a text adventure game, you want to make it huge and loadable in one shot or run off cassette, you know, type thing. This is perfect. Now he's looking for people to help test this. And I know he sent a copy to Ron, Ron Delvo. I don't know if you had a chance to try it there yet, Ron, but uh, I did. Any, any, any issues that you saw or did it seem to run things? No, they both worked. I worked on my TDP 100 and uh, a uh, T1 Coco 2. And I want to mention the other thing he's doing, besides shifting it up so you have all this free memories, he's actually going through and removing like routines that aren't needed. Like there's some of the Microsoft, you know, 
hidden code to make sure it's a legitimate ROM and all that stuff. He takes that out. There's some stuff for checking RAM. This has to run on 64K machine, so it, he took that out. So he's freeing up some room in BASIC, and then he can start doing some optimizations or maybe some additional stuff and maybe some 6 through 9 support. So he's got some long-term plans oh, wow. to actually enhance BASIC in the future as well Ooh. as give you more RAM. So Ooh. BASIC programmers that have been kind of limited a little bit, you might have some options pretty soon here to actually write you know, even better stuff that's faster, more powerful, just in, in BASIC that you're already familiar with. Oh. But you can you can grab a copy of it there. He's looking for active testers to just make sure he hasn't got any bugs with some of the routines he's changed already as it currently stands. So is this, in contact with him on our Discord. So just a so, dumb question. He's showing it in main, but is this best tested on real hardware or would we be able to test this in Cocoa? Well, he wants you to enough? test on real hardware because he's been testing it in main and okay. already. Gotcha. So that's so. kind of what he's shooting for. Well, so, so I'm looking it up now. Is this is this a, a reverse engineer base or is it a modified color basic that he's just been tweaking? Um, I mean, either way, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we have the Unraveled books, which, I mean, had some mistakes there, but I, I don't know if he based it on that, and he's kind of been doing it. He's got the source code. You can actually take a look for the color basic there already as it is, including some of the mods he's already made. Um, oh, okay. But the programs that use ROM calls, it's not going to work on this, is it? That That is one issue. This is meant for pure basic programs more so, or, you know, wow. they call their own self-contained assembly routines. But if you're trying to run, like, a polecat routine or something, yeah, that won't work. And would, would this be just a software program patch? I don't know how. It can be both. You can load it in as a patch, and it'll patch basic to run this way and free up all the memory for you, plus you know, fix bugs and you know, optimize stuff. Or you could, you know, once this project is complete, you could actually burn a ROM with this on it. But then you have the backwards compatibility of you know some of the routines that call indirect ROM calls and stuff. Hmm. So I, I'm imagining most people would probably use this software, but if you write a little program, uh, if you write a basic game like Adventure Game, like I was mentioning before, a huge one, you could actually run this little preloader that modifies basic to do this, and then you could run the game and have all this extra RAM or optimize 609 basic calls so that your graphics run faster or whatever it, it happens to be. Of That's course, cool. this is only for Coco 1 and 2, isn't it? Uh, no, he's playing and doing Coco 3 as well. All right. Which is a bit more complicated, of course, because the way the ROMs work. But um, there's definitely some optimization and bug fixes. The biggest one that bugs me on that one is if you do a list and hits an unknown token, it just hangs. And for example, I'll give you the example. We, we showed Star Trek 3 earlier, which has all those embedded machine language routines as strings. Well, some of those tokens are illegal. So I tried listing it on a Coco 3, and it gets to a certain point, and then just freezes dead. So that's a bug fix he'll be doing. There's also the P clear zero is fixing that bug. That's I think already fixed actually in the in the current version. So there's there's bug fixes in there as well. So, but yeah, he is planning on, on doing some Google free stuff as well. Anyway, grab a copy if you guys are interested, especially basic programmers. Uh, give Tim some feedback. He's what Timbo Tech I think in your Discord. So Timbo that's tech. the person to talk to. Sir, put yes, put sir. the uh, comments in the basic channel. It's one of the five bazillion channels that we've just got added to this week. So. And did we I'm just finding. rename that to programming from software dev to just programming? Did you just recently rename that, Marco? I haven't. I, I okay. haven't heard any discussion not to, so I probably okay. will. Okay, moving along. And here, these are the three videos that, that Pedro did that he was referring to earlier. So this first one here was running gels. Now, this is before you got to your RGB HDMI thing. So this is on composite, but it's a full 512K game. All right, so Glenn Hewlett just finished transcoding Jones. That's that semi-graphic screen that Nick Marentes was talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. So well designed, that. Yeah. He spelled Calor properly, too. Yeah, that's right. That's why it works. <laughs> I mean, that was my problem with YouTube. I had too many American spellings. <laughs> but anyhow, um, this is well. a mini regular Coco 3. This is the Coco 3 board that I recreated. Man, that's amazing. Schematics. That is amazing. I've been pulling my hair blue board. Days. Blue board. And it turns out that I just... Ah, no RF modulator. Connect. That's a sign uh, of a good hardware. <laughs> from the Little game. board blue. The CPU. He needed the money. The oh. And it's such a nice looking board too. I mean, honestly, it is. it's better it's than gorgeous. the one. Now, honest. there's still quite a bit of work to do. I think the blue is a nice touch. I like the, the blue color. Absolutely. I haven't tried a yellow board. Yet. There's an option for a yellow board. I don't know how that would look. Nah, the hard board is better. It seems like it's going to be hard on the ice. I'm going to call this a yeah. success. I'm really excited. I'm really happy. That this Composite works. out though, but yeah, that's yeah. cool. I have that to the test first everything. One, first test you did, which so basically it's a 512K 609 base game. Yeah. Yeah. 
Second one well, you this... did, of course, dear to my heart, is Nitrous Nine. Oh crap! What a waste. <laughs> well, this I'm going to play this through twice. Uh, now, play actually, play if we just go back to that board, to yeah. play it in <laughs> slow motion, Curtis. <laughs> one one suggestion for the Coco Three board. Um, now that you've raised it, the eight megabyte memory expansion. You get rid of it and make eight megabytes on the main board, like. In a in a final version, yeah, absolutely. So that that should lower costs because then you don't have a second board and all these extra sure. connectors to put on the board. Just put eight megabytes of RAM straight on the motherboard. Yeah, and then oh. just get a gimme X, you know, from Ed to put in to populate. Then you still it. need yeah, the yeah. DAT. You still need the DAT connector for anything over two. Uh, no, because the gimme X no. has that built in. Yeah. Well, but uh, so this is a dumb question because I don't have the current 8 meg board, but don't you still have to run that jumper wire from the 8 meg module to the DAT for, for the Coco to get the DAT? Or is you, that run, all you run it to the Gimme X port because the Gimme X contains right, right. the okay, DAT so, built in. Yeah. But so you yeah, still need right. the DAT wire to connect to the CPU. I or, believe so. Uh, I don't have an 8 meg board oh. here, so I, I don't know. Brian Weezer, do you know? Since you actually have an 8 meg? Is he still here? It doesn't matter. Uh, for you now, don't but... need. No, I don't think you need the DAT board. No, it's it's oh, on no, the Gimme the DAT X. wire. That, the, the, that, but that. the DAT wire, yeah, it goes from the Gimme X to the, the RAM expansion, yeah. Okay. So you would still need that DAT jumper from the... Well, you'd have to have some sort of a jumper from the main board up to the Gimme X, yeah. That, that's easily a user, yeah. user yeah, that, part. That's you know, if you can plug done, in a yeah. wall plug, you can handle to plug in the wire. Yep. That's, that's right. really difficult. Yeah. Well, I, where I was going with that questioning was, is if the, if you were going to put 8 megabytes on the motherboard as a standard feature, I almost thinks like the DAT that that jumper to have to run that wire in there almost seems moot and almost seems like unnecessary and visually unpleasing. Why not make a trace path for the DAT to go straight to the gimme socket to begin with? So it's literally well, that, there. That's, a, that's assuming that someone who buys that board is going to also buy a gimme X. What if you just have a standard gimme in there? So it would only address 512 K right. then anyway. Right. Yeah. Right, 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 but right. if you True. buy a gimme X, you plug that in, and you put the jumper wire into the two pins or whatever on the on the board then, and then it accesses eight meg. No, it yeah. could be designed. I, I like Steve, Steve's going for the aesthetics here, I think. He yeah. figured you could somehow hardwire it so it's ready to go. Oh, well, yeah, that would be X, better. So. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, unless you're planning on making the board with a Gimme X as well, mm. but you're, you're not, are you? You're trying to set up as a Coco 3, but you can plug in a gimme x later if you if you right. want to add so you that. could you yeah. could add the leads on the motherboard for somebody who wanted to yeah do yeah, a yeah. do a you know add it later or you can have an a, maybe a trace underneath the motherboard that you wouldn't see right. that would go straight yeah, to the gimme yeah. socket for, yeah that's right uh, designed to take both you know yeah as well, yeah, you know? yeah, handle, yeah handle that's both. right and, and it's cool. going to be but it is probably going to be used more at least how it is now i think uh with the gimme since you know if people upgrade to the gimme x you're just going to have yeah. gimmies laying around that's right yeah but as my old uh, boss would say, this is all implementation. <laughs> all right. So what are we looking at? We're, here? we're so, just trying to add feature creep to you. So now we're doing 6809 on his new motherboard. Now we're doing nitrous. No, we're not. Now we're doing 6309. 6309 oh, nitrous. Nine. Let's see it. Take a look at it. You're distorting things. You're distorting the hobby. <laughs> okay. And here you've got some of the connectors CC soldered loaded. up. <clears throat> yeah. And I want to start nitrous nine ease of use for the 6309. Ease process of right now. use. And I just wanted to, you know, show off how it does actually work. It board is not freezing up on me. And I guess it wants to time. And this is where you discovered why we want real time clocks. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely necessary. Uh, yeah. Oops. Why is this backwards? Actually, I was going to ask you about that before I continue on here. <laughs> um most most people in the states do it year month day europe it's 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 you know they switch the day in the year yeah. um you is it because you're you do military stuff that, that you're used to it the other way well so I, military time i use all the time with work uh so i'm I'm, at, I'm actually used to working in utc actually uh and using military time now i am used to this format you know but uh what happened was, uh, you know, I was just thinking, I just filled out some forms earlier to renew my passport. So <laughs> I was already programmed the other way, okay. but I am used to this. I am used to this. I do use it a lot. Okay. Uh, Those I, are I like 60 said, it's not backwards, but she's right. You know, he's right. I was, <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, with that RF modulator removed, your area on the motherboard to fit in a real-time clock. All right. That's the perfect spot for it. Just enough it space is. for an RTC. And more, yep. actually. It's a big space. I already tried yeah. this once, yeah. and it you know, went through. It booted and seemed okay. And as I mentioned before, I mean, the 6 through 9 is already running in native mode, so it's running 10 to 15% faster. So if you're testing the speed capabilities of your board, like you were talking about, you're already running faster than stock everywhere. Yeah. Had. And I, I read that afterwards. In some sort of shell. So you shell. GUI synth and G shell. Okay. It's like the video hurt you. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, video, it's G shell. <laughs> It's like, it's like very talking cool. to uh, Siri. It boots, and it yeah. boots, the graphical shell. Now, was this your it's first test to make sure the joystick and, you know, stuff worked? Or did you test yeah. it up before? This is, so I, I, had, I had just booted it to the other screen before. But I just wanted before. to boot it and just start it, just to prove myself that. Yeah, but I had cool. seen uh, CRT's yeah, video. Oh, his uh, little intro thing. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, I won't play the whole thing. I, I, I kind of promised I would twice, but... Uh, yeah, just play it in slow motion so we can really enjoy it. Yeah, I'm still looking at the trash can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you tried Pack OS 9, yeah. <clears throat> which is a good test of the joysticks, too. Now, it's a little bit quirky on taking corners. That's one thing. I, I might source that. goes there. Somebody wants to fix that, they can. <laughs> the source is included, so... But yeah, I mean, that's, okay. that's a good test of it. I mean, you're running 512K where it's using most of it. You, you're running a 6 or 9 in native modes. So you're running faster. I mean, that pretty well proves that. I don't know if you have to do any bodging around. A, I still want to test it some more. I, I still haven't tested uh, cassette save and load. I think it's going to work. It, I mean, that part of the circuit is not too complicated. But you never know. I still need to test it. And yeah, and, really and as it was mentioned it. before by Stevie, some of Sock Master's demos, if you want to push the 6 or 9 side and push the hardware, because he's doing hardware tricks and timing the gimme. Yeah, that OS nine, and, uh, nine will not be does doing. that too. Gunstar does some good scan line changing of stuff too. Like you get the different shades. Yeah, or Popstar, which actually I mean, changes Popstar, 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 Popstar. Yeah, Popstar. Oh, does Popstar. That, so. okay. But but you're 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 still running a real gimme in that, aren't you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it should all still work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, the gimme the gimme hasn't changed. The gimme hasn't changed, but what I really want to test is, uh, you know, I was saying earlier, the routing. You know, routing can be an issue. You know, if things oh, yeah. are routed right, you know. Uh, um, Little, yeah, because the timing can be very subtly different, just enough to cause problems. And interference. And interference, yeah. Yeah. But so far, I mean, it's working, so maybe I won't touch it, you know. Yeah, interference just keep testing like it if it seems to be penalty. working. I don't know if you have to do anything different, so. It just doesn't look pretty, you know. You look at the routing, you're like, ah, yeah, it works, but, you know, come on, this is, you know. <laughs> I want it to I would look. be so distracted by the blue OCD? motherboard, I wouldn't even notice, you know. It covers it up. <laughs> Man, you're going to need to have some neon lights in there that are programmable RGB LED type stuff so we can have some glowing stuff going on in the motherboard. <laughs> yeah. You can have a pulsing heartbeat. And yeah. Gonna... Talk to Mr. Dave there. He, uh, yeah, he's right? good with that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you can even you can even tie it in with dagger up and actually have a, like a pulsing heartbeat to match your dagger. Oh, so yeah. Right, so this is here. the final RGB. video you put up and the most recent one. And this is where you did the RGB to HDMI adapter. Is this one based on Aaron Newcomb's? Yeah. Yeah, this is a, uh, so Hoglet 67, the RGB. To, well, I hadn't seen Aaron's, I didn't see his, his uh, Coco 3 video. He put up a Coco 3 video doing the RGB to HDMI. I'm um, trying to remember, did he Coco 3? He did Coco 1 and 2 for sure, because he's showing like the artifact yeah. and stuff too, but. I well, I didn't see the Coco 3 one if he did. Yes, he, he did do it. It's, a, it's in the middle. On this new it's Coco in the middle. Board. Yep. Um, but I don't have an RGB monitor. So what I did was I, I wired in the RGB t to HDMI solution. Uh, and, I'm and that looks really Pac good. Or then he looks back man, right? Or is that that's Nick Rankin's back now? Because I didn't wire in the audio. No, no, it's a Glenn. Glenn Hewlett. Glenn. Glenn. Okay. You know, it seems to work. RGB seems to work. You can tell by the Glenn Hewlett and lower the inverters. Well, the camera was still moving. I was still getting dizzy from it. Now the colors weren't right, I, and, and it might, and I still don't know if that's the board. I need to try it with um, well, original Coco Three, um, which I'll do later on. They aren't right on a Coco Three. It seems 3. to be okay. I just saw this. It seems to be working. Oh, they weren't. No, okay. it's just like this. Well, no, I meant more uh, the colors coming out of the RGB to HDMI converter. Ah. Uh, so I, I do, I, I do want to test that out some more, and maybe you know, uh, contact uh, Ian. And let him know because so maybe sparklies. maybe he hasn't worked on that part of it. You know that can be fixed with settings or maybe cutting some capacitors. 
but I do think that the colors are off. That looks good, though. The Coco there. SDC looks good. Uh, there it does. Play. Yeah. And, and the difference between the composite you showed earlier, oh, and this, this is, is a just night game here. Oh, yeah. Night and day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, this is a good game to put in that fancy trash can. We saw <laughs> <laughs> Pal artifacting, standard artifacting. Right. Oh, this is the old version. Yeah. Crikey, look at that. Actually, that's a good question. Does that HDMI converter handle PAL as well or no? I think it does, yeah. It yeah, actually it does. But I think that color it does. blue. Oh, it's not bad. It's... Okay, so this is the, oh, the yellow three palettes, yeah. So does that look a little off to you, Nick, from what you're used to in the Yeah, RPG? the yellow is uh well, it shouldn't be so yellow. Should be yeah. much paler. Okay, so here's RGB. Loading Megabug. It's black and white. But it does simulate artifacting. I'm using RGB. We getcha. Yeah, no, you're screwed now, dude. Like, you are <laughs> totally screwed, brother. And <laughs> Have we done that on go. the game on challenge? Or the high score challenge? That's another I game. I don't know if we've had Megabug on yet. Now, see, those colors look pretty good. The artifact simulation looks good. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. that's spot on. That's like. a sky blue and a orangey orange. So, yeah, that looks yep. good. Yeah. Joystick works. Yeah, I was happy with this. This looked really good. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, the RGB looks good, except, like you said, the color's a little off, but it's nice, crisp, and clear. You're not getting oh, any yeah. waves or anything. Yeah. So. Oh, we yeah. have not we have not done Megabug yet, but that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Thanks, Kurt. Orange and blue, just like the original yeah. Apple II version. Oh, this new well, I mean, Apple II also did artifact so colors. That's one thing yeah. we definitely had yeah. in common. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it was uh, blue and orange like this. Yeah. Anyway, was great work from Pedro there. Thank so you, Pedro. Just, Thank and, you. And, and the Thank fact you. we have a replacement motherboard soon to be available for people that have cracked motherboards but good chips. This, this is going to create a lot of, uh, I think, make new Kogo 3s in existence type thing. And uh, right. for people that you know don't mind running it off of raw boards, they can actually use the old gimmies if they get a Gimme X and maybe make some more on top of that. So we might actually expand the Coco hardware market. Yeah, that would be cool. But, I mean, so didn't you say uh, someone was already printing cases? So I know keyboards are being made. A couple of people are making uh, keyboards. No one's doing cases yet. No. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, what's the you guys who have three D printers? I mean, for I I know there's printers big enough to do a full Coco three case that are quite expensive, but at, at what price level do we get printers that can actually handle a Coco three size case? Like, is that oh, wow, affordable for that. an average human being, or is that mm. tens of thousands? No, uh, no, I think that's, that's a that's, big that's, one. Yeah, I, I know John yeah. Strong had talked about he had printed the bottom of a Coco two case before, and I think Erico was saying uh, in the live chat earlier that he could design the case because you remember Erico has designed the 3D model of the Coco two and a Coco three case where you could actually go inside it like virtual reality and like pan through the whole system in 3D. Mm -hmm. So I think Erico could definitely design the case for us virtually, right. and then the question becomes how do you produce it? And, well, I'm, you know, yeah, home so, printers. Yeah. I would guess two halves. Yeah, was the best and, you could get. and it would take a long time. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and it would be hours yeah. and hours. I almost but that's the computer's time at that point. You could just you know before you go to bed send it a print. Hope yeah, it doesn't. I mean, you know, if if we start to get to the up. point where we're producing a new Coco, I don't even know if it having it fit in the case. Uh, although it would be nice to have a case that looked like the original Coco case, I would be happy just to have the board that worked in some generic container. My Maybe we need to look at injection molding. You yeah, can yeah. Mold, injection molding yeah, cases come up for with Commodore sixty uh, fours and Amigas and all that. And so maybe how expensive are one. those? Because I remember just making cartridge cases. Well, injection molding is hugely expensive. I think the initial cost making the die. Though. Yeah, the initial one will be expensive, but then after that, yeah, it's not too bad. You yeah. can make a trash can shape, you know, for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> That would be something to where if you were going to do that, you should probably crowdsource that because mm. I'm sure there yeah. are people who want. So at that point, it's almost like, OK, we need to come up with now a new standard because the Coco 2 case and the Coco 3 case, they're all slightly different in where everything screw holes and lines up and all. So you got to come up with a case standard and yeah. then, um, you know, moving forward, all new designs will fit in this case. And, standard form factor. And, and my Somebody... little, and make it based it on the Coco 3. Because it's got everything, right? So, what's that? No, Ed Snyder's talking about him and Gary Becker are actually because of the Game X project is basically done now. 
uh, that they're talking about doing their Coco Four implementation because they want to replace the whole thing too. So I don't right. know if you guys want to talk to each other and maybe see right, the commonalities right, right. there, or or keep them separate in the yeah. project. I mean, my vote would be just to keep it simple. To like, I think the case is overkill. As much as it would be nice to have, I'd be more interested in the guts than the plastic wrapper on it. You so know? Uh, a Coco Three screwed into two by fours. That would be fine. Would be enough for you. That would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be that like works. the old prototype Coco ones that the image yeah. producers had. A translucent case. Since you've got a nice blue board there, right? Yeah. Why, why cover at... it up in a case? Right. Couple Just of LEDs to light it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I was actually looking around for. Uh, I know they make some uh, translucent, uh, you know, retro console cases. Yeah. Like, right. Like SNES. That's yeah. That looks cool. And I was I looking around. I will say, to I see... do not. I do not like Dave uh, Veery's suggestion of putting it in Tupperware. I think, <laughs> I think that'll look cheap. Now, mind you, you could keep sandwiches in there, I guess. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> it would keep it fresh. It would keep that fresh cocoa smell. All put your cocoa it, in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you did it in Tupperware and then you put it like a standard stock Tandy 512 gap grade, which was really hot, you could probably make a grilled cheese sandwich in it. Though. <laughs> so well, a, a translucent case and LEDs on the board. Oh, that would, that would be gangster. really good. That would be total yeah. gangster. Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking of something along the lines of having, uh, you know, sort of, I don't know if you've seen these tabletop arcade uh, cases where, you know, uh, you basically you print out, the, you know, each face of the arcade cabinet and they sort of stick together like puzzle pieces. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so that's an inexpensive way of doing. So maybe, you know, a case that kind of looks like that, that you can just assemble. Uh, and, oh, so uh, you have the sides oh, and those. the top and the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's yeah. Not, not completely molded. Yeah. It's, it's part molded. Yeah. Yeah. It's boxy, but it's good. Boxy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, opinion I want to hear, both John Acar, or both John Acar, John Bodekar Schaller, you guys have been dealing a lot with these, you know, mini C64s. The mini Amiga just came out. What's your view on the whole case thing? You know, trying to make it close to the original or miniaturizing or whatever. Do you I have think a, by and large, if you're looking at a, an audience as relatively small as the Coco audience, you can't really get away with manufacturing a mini case like the first mini 64, the, the mini Amiga that's coming out. I think that the people that uh, you're going to find far fewer quote unquote casual users of the Coco and far more hobbyists. So if you're going to attempt a, uh, you know, a, a, a mini version or a new new version of the case, you're going to want it with a functioning keyboard like the uh, the C64 Maxi that came out afterwards. I don't think yeah. that anybody would be into having a mini console like the the mini C64. Nah. Right, and as James as James Different Effort is pointing out, they actually found the original mold, so they didn't have to rebuild the mold. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. the C sixty four and the Amiga. Yeah. Oh, really? Did they? Uh. And he does say the mold is really expensive. I mean, we heard that when they were yeah. doing the game Master mm -hmm. Cartridge, you know, plastic mold cases. I, I'm trying to remember what their startup cost. That was like thousands, wasn't it? Yeah. Anytime you're doing injection molding, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, even something as simple as keycaps. Um, you know, for a couple of years ago, they released new keycaps for the Amiga 1200. And that project was stymied every step of the way just because of the initial cost to do those injection moldings. So that's definitely the main, the main obstacle in getting something like this done and making yeah. it look, look good. Well, I, I guess another way, I mean, instead of injection molding and using an additive printer, um, maybe subtract it, right? So if you have like, you know, a design where you can cut it out from a piece of stock um whether you know wood plastic whatever would be a lot cheaper and probably more doable so yeah you can it's see definitely it. more doable it will just never give you the fit and finish yeah. of something that's neat. so you're you're trading price and convenience for quality which is yeah. it happens all the time and everything <laughs> so yeah. here's a suggestion from tommy gunn just make it fit in the c64 case because that, that basically already <laughs> exists right so <laughs> well that that's what that's what the the company did that made these things with the vic 20 model <laughs> You know, and yeah, of course, right. that's really what the C64 was, which is, you know, sort of another some leftover Vic uh, models that they uh, so it's it's possible you could you could redo it. And uh, I just don't it would be great to have access to that original C64 mold. You can make it work. John Laurie <laughs> saying in the chat there, it takes about thirty thousand dollars to get the injection mold done. Wow. Uh, yeah, we need a few sales. 
<laughs> so if everybody here buy about a hundred of them, we can get a good head start. Yeah. So. I don't know. Uh, Eric Helland is saying use a checkmate case. I don't know what that is, but that's, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 a checkmate case cases. is a um, it's a newly created case that looks sort of like an Amiga three thousand, um, and uh, and but it's built to house. Uh, any number of solutions so it can house a raspberry pi it oh, can okay. house uh you know mr and fpga and i mean that might be a solution where you you build sort of a coco inspired case you know something that, yeah. that looks sort of coco-ish but is maybe not the exact mold of the original thing and then you put in all kinds of uh you have, um, risers and things so you can easily slot whatever kind of hardware you want inside of it and then boom, you have this thing that gives you all kinds of functionality, but still retains that nostalgic appeal of the original machine. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, because then you could put in like one of what Pedro's new actual Coco 3 duplicate motherboards, or you could put in the Mister, or you could put in, you know, various hardware. Right. Yeah. Well, let's keep let's keep it moving because looks like you got a lot of tabs here still going, Curtis. So <laughs> I want to I want to get done before supper. All right. So <laughs> screw you. Um, okay, so next one up is from Alan Huffman, and he posted a blog entry here uh, revisiting his Print Racer basic program, which is a C64 program that kind of prints, looks like random maidens, that thing. And he's working on optimizing the in-key routine he was using uh, based on a, a suggestion by a user named MyM, who I'm not familiar with. But he kind of goes through, you know, how to basically do a couple of ways of reading the keyboard and which way runs the most efficiently, which is something Alan's been covering a lot. If you want to learn how to optimize this basic, extended basic Microsoft basic programs, his blogs that he's been doing in this has been going through like finding out that doing hex is faster than doing decimal and all these little tips and tricks that people would never think of. And if you combine all of these, you can actually speed up your basic programs, even if they are fairly optimized to begin with, probably 10 to 30%, depending on what you're doing. So definitely a good series to go through if you're a basic programmer. And this one specifically goes into tips and tricks on doing in-key reading. So definitely worthwhile checking out if you're into basic. Cool beans. Next up, I'll let Stevie talk about this because it's kind of his and Ron Klein's baby here. So take it away, Steve. Well, uh, the Cocoa Pie project, the latest image is now available to the public. Uh, we were uh, we had a limited release on this work in progress image through the Discord channel. Uh, and it's to the point now where we just want to put it out there in the wild and let everybody have it. So this is a uh, universal image. It's called the community image, and it's one image that will run on a Pi 3, a Pi 4, and a Pi 400. There are some one-time setups you have to run. You have to run a few scripts to do a Git update and do a uh, an OS fix, so to load the right drivers based on what platform you have. But once you do an initial update, the image is the same for all machines. And the idea behind this is historically, every time the Cocoa Pi has been updated, you had to download a new image and then burn it to an SD card and start from scratch. So this image, once it's up and running, all future updates are all through the internet. So it's just, you go to the utilities menu, you run a Git update, it'll pull down all the new scripts, all the new menus, it'll pull down all the latest versions of all your emulators. Um, and then you can then just go in and then get the new emulators as they become available. And you should never have to re-image this again. Um, that's the moral of the story. The other thing too is that it's now running in a GUI mode. It's running with the X Windows client natively. So you could actually emulate more than one machine side by side. You can still go to full screen mode if you do Alt Enter to make MAME full screen or F11 to make XROR full screen. And there's, um, there's a couple things that would have to be tweaked if you wanted them to always stay full screen because like Ron Klein was running his uh, slideshow. There's there's a lot of attract modes where you can just have it'll just keep randomizingly booting up different uh, games in an attract mode. And if you had gone full screen one time, the next time it would default back to windowed. So there's something that might need to be tweaked there. But um, the 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 problems that people had in the past where they tried to run the Pi 4 image on the Pi 400, those those things have been gone for a long time. Um, this will run on on anything and everything. And I love the idea that when you need to update it you just go to utilities you do github update and then you boom you just go emulator update boom you're done so uh, very user friendly very updatable um so uh download your copy today it's absolutely free and i will be recording a series of videos on all the various steps if you could scroll up for a second curtis um and go to where it says news 
and then click on the first post that says setup instructions and this is a text file but so it's, it's broken down into section one two three four five etc i'm going to take each one of those sections and record that as a mini video so and rather there being like a one hour how to do everything on your cocoa pie tutorial video there'll be several short videos that will just hone in on specific things and then I'll do some bonus videos on how do you change user interface emulations and key mappings and joystick mappings within MAME for those who want to change the pause key. I don't want the pause key to be P, I want it to be something else. And I want my joystick to be able to do this. And so I'll have a separate video just on MAME user interface configurations and stuff. So, um, I, but this is all happening in real time and my ability to record those hasn't happened, but I hope to get started on those videos um, possibly tomorrow um, and, and get things started. So uh, what is Ron Klein saying? The only time there may need to be a new image is if there's a substantial or significant update to the base operating system that goes beyond normal updates. Oh yeah, like an OS update. That would make sense. But online updating is the primary meth method for as long as we can. This is from Ron Klein, the source. Of this so yeah so this is something i'm just excited about because it's it's been a been a work in progress for a while i've been testing it and i just got to the point where i noticed too especially on the facebook group there's so many people asking questions and a lot of the questions and a lot of the concerns people have is just because they have the old image and so any quote unquote issues that that were in the past those issues are gone we're, we're probably going to have new issues now because it's a whole new platform. It's a whole new operating system. It's it's GUI based versus text based. Um, there's a lot of more potential to it, but um, I, I'm sure things will get discovered along the way that will be fixed in an update. So, but I would encourage everybody to run out and download it and burn it and start using it, uh, and 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 post your questions in our Coco Pie channel on Discord. That's where you're going to get your best to near real time feedback from from people who yeah. are like Ron Klein. And I will mention stuff. the menuing system actually lets you update, you know, Cocoa specific packages too, like Nitrous 9, you know, you being one where you can actually get the latest version there automatically as well. So it's it's very automatic update oriented, right, which is right. much easier user-friendly. You friendly. can download the latest, yeah. And whenever um, whenever ease of use is updated and you just go to the menu and hit get latest version, it will always point to the latest version of ease of use. Yeah. I'll do a separate video just on that. Um, because, and, and this is something that not everybody will fully appreciate or understand, but MAME is a, is a constantly moving target. And, and the primary emulator here is in MAME. And the reason is, is that MAME is being developed by a consortium of people around the world, and they will change one thing to fix one system, and that one change might end up breaking something on the Coco. But we're very lucky to have somebody like Tim Lindner in our community who is constantly, he's one of the main devs, he's got their ear, he's got access to push things. So when things need to be fixed that somebody else broke, we have somebody who can do that right away. And Tim is also the kind of the champion to add in emulation to a lot of things that didn't exist before. Like Tim was able to get, um, well, he didn't implement the thing for the, the emulation of the Dragon, but that MSX2 board that we showed off, that was Niall, uh, Nigel did that, but um, Tim was able to get that fixed up where Ron could put it into the Cocoa Pie right away. So we'll be able to emulate the MSX2 board on the Dragon, all kinds of stuff. So we have people who are able to rapidly respond to the changing landscape of what happens in MAME, not only in adding new features, but fixing some of the un unforeseen Foreseen, problems. Yeah. Um, so for that reason, MAME is going to need to be constantly updated and the ability to update that's built into the menu. So you don't have to know how to compile MAME. You don't have to know how, how to extract it or where to extract it or how to put ROMs in there. You just pull up the menu. You run a git update. It'll look for new MAME updates. And once they're there, then you go to emulation menu. You say download latest version of MAME and it'll do it. So. <laughs> and Tim says, I've also fixed things that I broke myself. So <laughs> that's And I will enough. mention a big thank you to both Tim and Nigel Barnes, because they both have been doing rapid fire updates in MAME. They're both yeah. active in the MAME community for the Dragon and the Co. So Yeah. So um so yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna wanna even though there's a one time update just to get like the latest update and get your drivers, you're gonna wanna do frequent updates. I would say maybe monthly just to do, pull a new git update in case there's a new version of MAME. 
And now the nice thing is, is unlike Windows, this will never automatically download. This will never automatically install. You have to choose when to do it. And then even then from the menu, you can choose if you want to regress what version of MAME. It'll give you a list. So as you keep adding newer versions, if there is a problem, you could roll back to a different version and it's all menu based. So imagine we'll, giving the user choice. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so am I. So um, and and as we were talking last night on the show and I kept saying, you know what, I just don't want to buy that Pi 400 way, 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 all the reasons why I, I don't want to buy it. And then Ron Klein very gently nudged me over the edge this morning. He's like, well, you know, you could still use a wireless keyboard on that Pi 400, you know, and, and it's like, and then I'm looking at my setup here. I'm like, you know what, my Pi 400 is never going to be more than a foot away from my screen anyway. So all me complaining about the tethering of the USB cable and the HDMI cable, those are moot. So anyways, I pulled the trigger and I bought a Pi 400 today on, on Amazon, which I'll have on Tuesday. So I'm going to end up owning a Pi 3, 4 and 400. So I'll be able to do videos showing you how to set uh, all of those things up too. And, 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 uh, I know, I know it's compatible. I know people are concerned about the Pi 400 compatibility, but it's there. Ron has one. Ron's tested it. And I'll have one shortly, too. So, I, I got something to add. Yes, Ron Klein. Uh, I mean, Ron, Ron Delbo. Have, sorry. Ron Delbo. Yeah, if you have a SDC and um, you have uh, your SD card, um, you can take that and stick it in the um, Pi and um, suck all your programs off onto that. And uh, you'll have your own stuff there ready to use just the same as if you were using um, it with like a usb sd reader because the main sd cards yeah. for you okay okay so like if you have one of these uh little usb sd readers like i have you're basically saying yeah. take the same sd card you put in your coco sdc yep and then you can pull those files into your coco pi that I is do. absolutely true you can also do that through the network because there's a network share yep. so through your home network you can copy content to it uh, and uh, Pi Drive Wire is on there, Michael Furman's thing, and that's and that also runs the MC server. We recently added the ability to uh, download, uh, as we mentioned, you can download Nitrous 9. You can download the Jim Gary collection for the MC 10, and that will be continuous. And at the rate that Jim Gary produces, yeah, you content, need to do that update every two days. That, you're gonna have to run that update screen about every 24 seconds, right? So. Um, but that'll update and then that'll run through the MC server, which runs on Pi DriveWire. So you can just do a dir on your MC10 and, and get into content. There's um, all kinds of cool stuff on there. And uh, videos will come and as as things are updated, because I've set this up kind of like a blog. So when you click on news, if we have if there's a new update, we'll just post that as a blog post on the site. And obviously Discord is another. Discord is the single best place to go to, to get somebody to respond to in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I see a lot of people posting questions on Facebook, but I don't check Facebook that often. Um, so just just know that Discord's the place to be for, for for quick response to your questions about this. Wow, it sounds like it's easy to maintain and set up. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't you call yeah. it Coco Pie ease of use? <laughs> it's always been ease of use. That's the great thing because you can. I, be a, I expect royalties for right? that. It can be, you know, the, I mean, honestly, it's not everybody's tech savvy. Where we take it for granted to setting up an emulator on our computer, but not everybody is that savvy or that motivated to get step outside of their comfort box. So if we can make this plug and play, where you can just launch an emulated Cocoa from a menu. Uh, and you don't have to know what emulator is being. It's transparent, really. You don't have to know what emulator is being used. It's, it's, it doesn't matter. You just click Coco 2 and poof, you've got a green screen with an OK prompt. Yeah. And you got MC10, you got Dragon 364, yeah. you've got so Dragon 200. You it's know, always been ease of use, in my opinion. So, yeah. So this menu nice. system makes it a lot easier. Yeah. All right. Next, we got a lot of tabs to get through. Next. <laughs> next up, uh, Henry Strickland attended uh, VCF Southeast. Yeah, Atlanta. I recognize a few faces there. Yeah, and Boise and, and, and Mike. Mike Rowan. And the guy in the left's face looks familiar, but I can't. The guy in the dark shirt on the left, I recognize his face. I don't remember his name, but he looks very familiar too. Yeah, I got his chat handle. I think it's, I can't remember what it's called, but okay. I'll take a look in a second here. And as that but the basically, they were people? at the show. This was last weekend. So, of course, we were you know having our Stuart Orchard interview stuff, so we wasn't yeah. able to do it you know during the show. Is that the real Devo band or is that a Devo? Uh, That's a Devo cover band. Devo <laughs> VC, are we not men? We are Devo. I, you know? I, I keep saying I want to go to one of these because I, you know, I can be to Atlanta in twelve hours. I can drive there in a day, unlike driving to Chicago, which is like an eighteen to twenty-one hour drive or something. So, um, yeah, Strickland, okay, uh, Varms, Varmsky, and Boise and Mike Rohn. Okay, so which one is Strickland? The one with the long hair or the short hair? Long hair. Okay, there I you think. go. I think, pretty sure. 
Far left. Far left. Is far left. Okay. And I think we saw him at VCF Midwest. Yeah. So he uh, reported we saw that West two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. He reported that there was quite a few Coco people in attendance, but they only had the two displays, which is he was running the Coco one that you can see there. Okay. Um, and that was running the Moo board, the 512 cap rate for the Coco one. So that's what uh. he was running. And then Varmevsky, I'm not sure what his real name is, was actually running Ease of Use, which was kind of nice. I didn't even know he was doing that. So thank you very much. Cool. Um, and then it almost looks like a dragon behind that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does look like a dragon two, two doors down With there. With a deluxe yeah. joystick even, maybe. Yeah. Okay. With the monitor on it. Yeah, it's probably Henry's. Or no. Okay, there's the Devo cover band. Yeah. Atlanta Historical Computer Society. Now, I want to mention one thing for the people that have been in the Coco community for many, many years here. Um, a lot of the old timers will know that the Atlanta Color Computer Club was probably the second biggest, second longest running after Glenside. And that's why we had Atlanta Cocoa Fest for many years. Um, so there's a strong Cocoa contingent there even before, you know, VCF. Oh, Palm Pilots. Yeah, all well, generations of them there. The I think that's all the Palm Pilots ever made right there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Visual C. Ooh, C++ plus plus even. Yes, I got all kinds of computers, old radio equipment. Cool. Frogger for what platform I don't know. All kinds of joysticks here. Mercedes. Mercedes. Oh, is yeah, that TR Oh yeah, I see there's there's a sticker. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But which TR I'm guessing probably the model one and three. That was more common in the Coco version. Yeah. And then all these colored hot stuff yeah. joysticks. Those are interesting. Tron. Tommy. Oh wow, look at that. That's cool. Yeah, they, I haven't actually played that version of Tron myself, but it reminds me just from looking at it of 3D Breakthrough. Uh, okay, yeah, tennis no, that looks kind of cool. So it looks like they've got the uh, Tron on the um, on the uh, television, and this other Tomy system here, Tomy Tutor Tournament. So people are doing high score challenge. That's pretty cool. Yep. And that's the uh, that's the oh. neon the neon light from the actual arcade there too in the center of that table that was the thing that was up in up inside the inside cabinet, the cabinet. That gave it all yeah. its kind of glow the marquee the marquee yeah there you go there's the word so we always count on uh looks uh, uv count UV on range. our australian guy to give us all the french words uh so, <laughs> <laughs> oh you want french words i'll give you french words <laughs> wait till after dark old though, windows a microsoft windows 1.0 huh? version one version one <laughs> yep no overlapping windows, no real primitive multitasking. It's, uh, it's actually yeah. more primitive than those Yeah, standards. it was basically the kind bugs, of like G-shell. The bugs. Except only single yeah. tasking. Yeah. You could task switch, I guess, but not. not and that's a uh, IBM XT so, clone case there. You see where it says Columbia? That's, you know, but those cases, that form factor was very popular back in the day with clones. So why was it called Windows if you couldn't do Windows and well, you did have windows. It's just that they they couldn't overlap. They'd have to be ah, uh, like side yeah. by side, and you, you yeah, yeah, side yeah. And side. Sort of they like have... multitasking on a modern iPad. They Except really... it's not really multitasking. It was yeah, cooperative. No multitasking. So. It was more like a DOS menu program. It was more like uh, GS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, you have to start somewhere from humble beginnings. And, and then deskmate, deskmate, which was Tandy's alternative. That's the graphical deskmate too, which was actually halfway decent. And that's not a Tandy computer. That's a generic. No, I was just wondering how yeah. they're running that. Yeah. Apple II C with its uh, what was the Apple's GUI? Uh, de um, desk they had one called Apple Apple Works. Shell. Apple no, Works. Apple Wor Apple Works was a um, word processor spreadsheet. Yeah. It was like yeah. VIP. Yeah. Yeah, they had a graphic shell that came on a couple. Of okay, times. which is what we're seeing on the left there. It's kind of yeah, Mac. it was based yeah, on the Macs when I remember. Mac very similar. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cool. I don't know what the hell that is, but it looks expensive and complicated. All right, Work so. in progress. Yeah, that, that, that reminds me of a PDP. It's not, but it yeah. reminds me of PDP eleven because that's about the size of the stuff you were dealing with in that sucker. Yeah, look at like my old microwave. Yeah, look at that thing. That's big an IBM something drive. or other. It's a big ass floppy drive. David Ladd should be excited. That's about the size of an AS four hundred. IBM fifty three sixty two system thirty six is what it says there in the oh, sub, okay. in the sub yeah. Okay. All right. All right, now I got all kinds of weird Macintosh networking Max. in games. So. Okay. D eight thousand. 
and TI-99 4A Texas Instruments. So that, look at that expansion chassis. Yeah, That's what that you need to make right there, Pedro. Just make a Coco expansion <laughs> chassis like that. What? Peripheral right. expansion oh. box. That He's small. lifted the bonnet on it, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's too tiny. It's too, yeah. <laughs> needs more. I mean, David Ladd would say it needs about two or three times as many slots at yeah. least. But. Need more Galileo. <laughs> right. I agree, at least. That's cool. Apple II. Oregon Trail Buff. on amber. Yeah, with an amber security monitor. Died of That's a busted shift key. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is the machine I grew up with in high school at Apple the very tail Plus. end of elementary school, too. This is what I used. This so this is the first model of the Apple II No, second. Plus. The Plus. No, the second. Plus. Or, yeah, the, the original Apple II was just the Apple II and then the Plus. Oh, okay. There was an Apple II, yeah. yeah. And then yes, they and then the 2E became the standard. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's right, yeah. And, of course, the original the, Apple one, which was just yeah, that Apple, was totally was a different. Yeah, separate board that you... So the Apple IIs and II Pluses are the same motherboards. Basically, they're all interchangeable. It's just did they come with the floating point Microsoft basic on the Plus, plus, or did they come right. with the original integer from the Plus? And you yeah. can, people would switch them too. Like you can find Apple IIs that they switched the ROMs on. So, yep. I've never heard or seen an Apple of any kind work. Or well, there's, there's Granny there. Smith. Oh, there's there's Macintosh. Well, we <laughs> there's uh... gold, gold delicious. <laughs> One thing I remember about the Apple II Plus, and I, I think the Apple II Plane had the same thing, is that the reset key had a extra strong spring, so it was harder to yeah, press it down yeah, to get that's contact. Right. That was the early ones. They actually rigged them later, so you had to hold down the control key before the reset would work. But the early yeah, ones, because that was a way to, to prevent you from accidentally hitting it and breaking out of a program when you really things. want to. Yeah. Yeah, they were a nice keyboard, case design. Nice case, oh, a nice keyboard, yeah. Well, well, when you think that came out, and when did it come out? 1977. 77. 77. 77. 77. Oh, yeah. So it was very modern compared to everything else at the time, which was what, you know, wooden, a wooden box or whatever. Yeah. It was very yeah. stylish, very modern, very practical. This is one of the triumvirate of the very first self-contained home computers that weren't just kits. This right. was yeah. Apple. To and uh, their, the TRS-80 their, model their, one. Their and big the thing was because because TRS-80 was I think maybe hit the market first, but they're like, okay, there's a bunch of yeah. monochrome stuff out there. A lot of it's kits, but we want to be the first one that's pre-built, pre-assembled that that has you could buy color actually and sound. in the store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, well, this one, the, the Apple II was apparently announced earlier, uh, but it wasn't available in stores. The TRS-80 was. Yeah, is what I. And the Tuesday was a lot cheaper to get started because the Apple started at fifteen hundred bucks or something like that, I think, at the time. Okay, well let's let's right. let's, let's yeah, let's, it was let's a lot. Speed, let's speed run through these slides at this point. We got a lot of tabs left. Okay, we got Amiga two thousand. That looks nice. Now this one's labeled iconic rivalries in the history of computing, so I'm not sure what is this like an ST versus Amiga. We got like three different freaking floppies in there. It's like how many floppies do you need? Okay, TRS eighty, the original ah, TRS eighty. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Nick, Nick's very first machine. Yeah. The RS80s yeah. didn't need to be uh, retro braided. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> they just needed to be resprayed. The hell is this? A giant calculator? Apollo guidance computer. Oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah, so that's part of the moonshots. A man module. I like to have a July 2019 version of the reference manual. Okay. Well, things got updated. That's what, how many years after the original Apollo shot in 69? So. Like 50? Yeah. No idea what the hell that is. Is that the, oh, the, the Enigma? Enigma. This is the decoding oh. machine for World War II oh, yeah. for breaking the Enigma. German codes. Oh, an Enigma. Wow. wow. A Commodore 64. It's an Enigma <laughs> wrapped in a riddle. Um, and there's a guy selling shirts. Okay. Yeah, Earl, cool. president of the Atlantic Historic Computer Society. Okay, cool. CPM, Z80, uh, C colon bumper stickers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they didn't put the six set in on that list because yeah, the you know, superior okay. processors are on a right. different, you know, set of stickers. Okay. But here's Tiny Python for the six and nine with OSN level two under active development and by Henry Strickland himself. Now I've talked to Henry about this. He's he's got it partially running already, and he's got some cleanup and stuff to do. And I said, well, once you have it cleaned up and ready to go, we're going to have him on to actually yeah. demo and talk about it. Yeah. I wonder what card that is. That's the Moo, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah, it looks like a Moo card. Moo. Yeah. All right. What does Moose stand for? I have no oh, idea. Utter, uh, it's yeah. Ask, ask Tormod. It's a cow says. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pinball machines. Okay. Next. Yeah. If if, if Boat was actually at his desk right now, he could come in because him and Aaron actually own pinball machines. Ah, so. neat. 
uh, terminals and all kind of old systems. Yeah, I recognize a few. Like, there's a, a Model 4P there Model and 4P. in the middle. There's an ADM 3A terminal right beside it to the left. A Mac. Yeah, isn't that like a Heathkit or a Zenith thing to the right of the uh, ADM terminal? Yeah, I think that is actually. I think it's like a Heathkit or something like that. And it mentions in the comments there's a PDP 11 way on the far right. That's a big tall thing. And then there's also the uh, mm -hmm. HP analyzer on the far left there. So, Macs and stuff stuck in the middle. The uh, okay. one with the two floppies below the Mac looks kind of like the uh, uh, Commodore Business Machine. It's uh, like That's a Zenith, a isn't it? Oh, it could be a Zenith. Yeah, yeah. I can see the logo faintly Zenith. here. That's it. Yeah, I can see there. the logo. Ah, there's a closer shot. That's the, uh, that's compact, the compact digital on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just helped somebody sell one of those in Port St. Lucie. He was listing it in one of the Port St. Lucie Facebook garage sale pages and i put them oh john's back i gotta backtrack just yeah. for that one picture for him here whoops yeah. there you go john that's lovely that's uh gorgeous yeah you know the one of the things that i love about all old uh either pinballs or arcade machines is the fact that they have stenciled art on the sides i just i think that's that's really really cool yeah thanks curtis yeah pile of boards from a burrows machine I remember reading about Burroughs. I never did see one in real life. I used one in high school when I learned COBOL. Uh, all yeah, right, keep going. You. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't know what the hell that is. That's PDP-11. Okay, PDP-11. Cool. Rick Adams knows about those. Oh, holy shit. Look at all those shows, huh? Okay, yep. lots board of stuff. Board games. Tons and tons of board games. Were those for sale? Uh, what you say? No, for playing. Ah, okay, cool. Why? And we got people playing yeah. games. Looks boring. Uh, <laughs> at least they're wearing masks. Okay. <laughs> Zap Blastem. Okay, these look like some newer games. So. Well, it says indie games, so these are like independently okay. published, not through big game manufacturers. So. Mm -hmm. Zap. And they even write directions in the front of you, like C jump, B to roll. That's a bit hard. Okay, it's kind of like a Street Fighter looking game there. Ooh, what the hell is that? That's a tic tac toe playing relay machine. 1961. Wow. Relay we've, machine. We've come a long way, baby. Relay. Rally. <laughs> Did you say relay or relay? <laughs> okay, that was the last picture anyways. Okay, now that's really cool. I, I can't imagine try I, I can't solder to save my, my butt and trying to do this amount of wiring. Like holy cow. Okay. You could technically make a tic tac toe machine out of rotary switches. I was very close to getting one done and I ran out of rotary switches. <laughs> you caused a worldwide shortage here. It's probably kind of like the ship shortage we have right now. I was a kid at the time. I got all the ones that my five science teacher would give me and there weren't enough. Anyway, that, that's a cool one. Okay, next up we have uh, Mike Rojas. Rojas? I'm not Rojas. sure how to pronounce his name. Rojas. Rojas? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so he posted, uh, he's been trying to get, you know, for RGB and he doesn't have any CM8 and they're expensive and hard to find. So he's actually created this adapter board to run it with an Apple color RGB analog monitor. And he's wondering how many people would be interested in this? Like how many people actually have the old Apple monitors, which are compatible with Cocoa with this little adapter. So you can get, you know, the uh, quality of an RGB display without having to try to hunt down a CM8 or a Magna yeah. box, which are rare. Okay. So okay. anybody who's interested in this and maybe has one of these or has access to them, the monitors themselves here. He's wondering what kind of interest would there be because he wants to do a small run of these boards. So if you're on Facebook, please contact him on this particular post. And I'll, I'll post the links in the Discord uh, news summary thing here after the show's over. But uh, let him know so that he knows how many of these to get uh, pre-ordered. Okay. Brian, Except this is uh, we, Brian. We now this, I want to zoom this. up here so we can okay, see Okay, let's better. look at that. But yeah, I know we got a lot of news still to get to. That, I do love the speckle on that. That is cool looking. Yeah, I, it looks it looks neat. It, like as Brian said, it doesn't exactly match the case, but it looks yeah, close it does, enough. It, that does, it, looks... it doesn't look out of place. Yeah. And I love that little bumper sticker thing there in the corner with the RAM badge. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the give me X badge. Yeah, the give me X badge thing. That's cool. And I like that the brake key's got nothing on it. It's just plain. It's that that's the red button, right? So it's yeah, the red a, button. Of, yeah. yeah. There's the there eight you can meg see the board, eight meg board the plus X. the give me X itself. Yeah. There's the ribbon cable that goes outside to the back for your output, for your uh, S-video, VGA, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. 
That is the Holy Grail, and there's got the Mega and there's Mini. There's the and FCC the SCC. and the Mega Mini, both in that speckle. All the whole speckle collection here. It's new for fall. Fall season patterns here. It's the speckle collection. Yeah. Uh, that is cool. That is, I like that, Brian. Totally like a jealous. Boss it's, thing or something. Totally like spray jealous. Paint. Yeah, spray paint. Spray yeah. paint. Yeah. I've got out some Flexstone. I, I still have a can of Flexstone somewhere. I'll just Flexstone yeah. my cocoa. So, yeah. Like the whole thing uh, speckled. <laughs> speckled cocoa. <laughs> and, of course, Raul Nevo has the Darth Vader black cocoa that he's done, yeah. too. So. Yep. What, what, which season was that from spring of like 2018 or something? That, that was all of 2020. That was the, the blackout year. All right. So, <laughs> uh, all right. What's next in the news? Ooh, ooh what the hell is this? So Lee Davy, uh, he dragged his old Coco 3 out for oh, 30 yeah, odd years. This. He's like, I, I don't even know what my mods are. Somebody tell me what I did, right? So, <laughs> well, there's two things to show here. One is he's actually got an actual Tandy 512 cap right now. Oh, almost nobody like I know did that because they were so expensive. Yeah. I have That's one. where you put the eggs. Yeah. It sits on the shelf. <laughs> yeah, if you want to. Scrambled or fried. <clears throat> that's a power one, too, by the looks of it. Looking at the power supply, that's what our power supplies look like. They didn't have the metal cage. Mm. Do you know that. Lee Davy then? Yeah, and the R RGB connector is a little different. There is a lot um, of bodge wires going across that thing. One's yeah, going and that's to... the part he doesn't have a clue what, what that's for because you don't need any of those for the 512 cap rates. Obviously, it has nothing to do Actually, with that. look at the orientation of the 6809. Aren't it they is. meant to be vertical on a NTSC one? I yes, they are. There you yep. go. So that's it a says PAL. it's a Coco 3. Where the hell is the gimme? Oh, I see. It's down there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's right there. there. It's there. But that's well, a PAL Coco 3. Okay. Yeah, the layout is different from at least the one that I was working with. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a PAL one. Yeah. But yeah, if anybody who's familiar with the PAL circuit boards has any clue, maybe that's a Daniel O'Connor. And it or something looks like that's a, what, what these do. It looks like that's an EE problem he's got there because it's got the little tin foil over the well, window. Well, no, all our uh, extended basics, oh, well, our, our ROMs were socketed on all PAL. Yeah, but were they the reburnable chips like this? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were. Oh, okay. okay. Well, oh. They, they they just took the original ROMs and made custom ones for the. For the PAL ones, they had to reburn it so that they booted in 50 hertz and all that. Oh, right. Yeah, I guess mm. yeah, it probably wasn't worth masking and making and, their own separate. And, and the composite command had to be the same as the RGB, remember, because we don't have oh, NTSC yeah. composite. So, yeah, that was some changes they had to do to the ROM, and they just used standard ROMs and with the sticker on top. Cool. Well, like I said, anybody who's an expert on PAL motherboards here, he's kind of wondering if anybody has a clue what all these extra wires he put in 30 years ago would do. So. Uh, yeah. One goes under the case. And yeah. the, uh, all right. Board. Well, let's let's keep the news moving while you guys are thinking about that. <laughs> all right. What else we got here? Sock. Oh, what, Sock what Masters Artifact Colors. Oh, yeah. I was watching this. This looks yeah. really cool. So I'll, I'll zoom up the first one here. So you did these... Four. He's doing this in the 640 mode. This only works in composite. So he's got these four colors chosen as the real colors, sort of a purplish, a bluish, a greenish, and an orange. And then he, by mixing them and doing you know stuff based on phasing and stuff, he actually gets black, dark, light, gray, and and white out of color. Not the, this is the opposite way he did the last time, but we showed on the show last time where he actually did nothing but gray scale and he came out with all the colors. And then of course he mixes them all together and gets all these extra colors type thing. And if you guys want to try testing this, then you will need to do this on composite output or an RF output, but you can't do this on RGB. That's the entire program for the demo. Wow. And you can see, you know, he does the initial reading of this grayscale palettes here. So give it a shot, see what you what happens on your end. But that's just amazing. Like you can absolutely like he's talking about pixel clocks and four pixels before the color burst change. And I don't even understand half this stuff, but uh, Amazing stuff as usual from Soft. Well, maybe in the Coco 5, we can have a pixel clock after we get a real time clock. So, uh, uh, <laughs> next up, this is a discussion we actually talked about on the After Dark last yeah, night. Yeah, let's and, not beat this horse. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go into full discussion, but I want people yeah. to be aware of it because I mean, yeah. comments are still coming in hot and heavy. There was 101 <laughs> when I checked it yesterday, it's 121 now. So, 20 more in the last 24 hours. If the Cocoa continued, what would it be more like today? More Apple or PC? This is a little bit different than the standard Cocoa 4 discussion. That's what would true. you put in it now? Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is like, if it had kept going, what do you think it would have turned out as? Yeah. A lot yeah. of interesting discussion on there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is. We talked about that last night ad, ad nauseum. So. Uh, well, that was your fault, Stevie. So. Yeah. Uh, this was cool, too. 
Yeah, this is really cool because this Robert Hamilton took some pictures he took from the 1983 Chicago Coke or Rainbow Fest. That's the very first Rainbow Fest ever held. So these are timely. These these are ones I've not seen before. I've not seen anything but you know black and white photos in Rainbow itself. So this is Nelson Software Systems, which later became Softlaw Corp. You know the guys who did the VIP library, etc. Uh, Kevin Herbolt, the uh, long-haired, red-haired guy yeah. there on the left, yeah. is the author of a lot of their games, and they actually did a sub-games division called Color Quest, which did like the Simeon Moon series and a bunch of others. So he's one of the authors of those. So I've never seen him before. I didn't even know what he looked like. It's all hand-lettered too. Yeah. Here's Tom Mix. That's Tom Mix himself there, dead center. Whom I have met at, at the fest, you know, and he's Donkey he's King, away. Utilities, wow. Trap Fox, awesome. Space Shuttle, Caterpillar. Yeah. Like I always grabber, assumed new. That, uh, I always assumed that Tom Mix was like R.L. Stein, that like he was just an amalgamation of individual. I, I had no idea that he yeah, was a person that, was that actually his real walked name. this earth. That was his real name. And yeah. here's there, here's a dated reference: Visa and Master Charge. Remember when he used to be called Master Charge <laughs> yeah. before his Master Card? Yeah, that's and funny. Visa yeah. was back I'm in Bank America Card and uh, was it Bank America Card and what was yeah, the and Master Charge. Master, Master Charge. Yeah, there was no yeah. Discover, and there was Amex still. American Express had been around. Well, American Express was the very first credit card. Yeah. yeah, they were definitely there. But they charge more, so most a lot of people didn't support them. Yeah. Well, but I like the fact this this is definitely dated because you see like the new label over Grabber over top Tom Mix's head. So Grabber new. was brand new. Yeah. But one thing that amazes me is that at this time in 1983, he already had a BBS going to help support Tom Mix software, and that that was a bit rare in 83. I mean, that BBS, wasn't unheard of. So that isn't. Yeah. Look at that. Hey, there's a female there. That's something. <laughs> that might be Mrs. Mix, for all we know. Could be. Uh, now, I can't read the name tag here. I'm I'm thinking this might be Tom Rosenbaum, the guy who founded Spectral Associates. Okay. And you can see the old logo with the old English style Spectral that they literally replaced oh, with yeah. that kind of 3D-ish. Uh-huh. Okay. On. And this is, uh, I'm assuming, the hotel room of uh, the right. Coco One. But he's actually got one of the Amdeck drives. Those three, oh, look at that. Three inch ones there that are quite rare now um and held 400 cage or whatever it was and it's a dual system so this is high-end stuff for the time people i'm assuming with all the females present in this picture this is probably the rainbow booth or one of the magazine booths because uh the general software and hardware publishers you didn't see very many females at them unless it's no, that's or right. but rainbow themselves before. had a lot of female staff at their manning their booth and I can't tell from the back, but that might be called Computer Magazine. If that is what that COL you can see in the background is. similar, yeah. That would be literally within a couple months when they started the magazine as a rival to Rainbow. And okay. Yeah, those are, and those are good quality pictures, too. It's not like it's a Polaroid or something that they scanned. Yeah, it's a lot better than the ones I took in the 86 one. Okay. I'll, I'll say that. So we got Mike back here now. That he's been reviving a dead Coco, and he's kind of been doing blog style entry posts on Facebook in the Coco group about all the things he's had to fix in this thing with Dead and Arrival. So that you know he's on part ten now, and uh, this is where he's trying to fix. Like something was spilled on the on the Coco, and it eroded and eaten away at you know traces and stuff. So he was going through, and then as Rick was you know saying, trying to find what broke it. I think Pedro, you mentioned it too, trying to figure out what trace is broken, how it's broken. So he's actually using wires to replace them. And um, kind of going through. Oh, he needs involved. Rick's keyboard. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah see yeah. the black trace on the edge. That's what inspired me, because that's no longer conductive. It's pulling away from the plastic, and so you can't just fix the little broken mylar traces coming out of the top, because they're yeah. all starting to just rot inside. Mm. And he's using one of those uh, famous rear window defogger repair kits you normally use for those little lines on your your back window on your car mm. or whatever the conductive paint basically so it actually does repair a lot of these things but anyway if you're in interested in coco repair uh follow all 10 bits of his blog and he's actually got it mostly working now last i checked so next up there's been a, an update to x for itself and this is fx so i think both the online version of, if karen's still in the chat was this to fix it. whatever tim lindner broke <laughs> no, that's me. That's separate. <laughs> so he released a 0.37, and then he very quickly afterwards released a 0.371. So I'm assuming he must have found a bug of some sort. So this features improved reading of the sampled audio tapes because uh, he was having some problems where some tapes, like real tapes, would not load. That's been fixed now. It also now allows emulation of a thing called the race, R A C E, 
uh, made by a company the same name for the Dragon in the UK. And this was a multi-pack style interface that the Dragon had, but it's implemented a bit differently than the MPI is. So they've actually got the uh, emulation of that. And I think Nigel Barnes has actually been doing the same thing in MAME. So both XWare and MAME will support this alternative uh, MPI style device that was made for the Dragon. Next up here, Nigel Barnes, speaking of. So we've got Tim doing most of the Coco stuff in MAME for us, and we've got Nigel doing most of the stuff for the Dragon, specifically in MAME. So this is uh, basically said nothing too new in release, release, but the board previously known as the Dragon MSX2+, Plus, we've got John Morgan on the Dragon talk special to talk about it, has been renamed the 6X09 Super Sprite FM Plus because it's sound and sprites and everything else. So he's changed the shorthand of how to call it for MAME to install that as one of your virtual devices. SSFM. Yeah. So that's just a little tip for you. We've got the latest MAME And that will be the updated Pie. in the Coco Pie. That's, yeah. That's what there I'm you go. So. But yeah, I mean, the, if you want to do development of this and you don't have the actual hardware, perfect way to do it and test stuff out. And, uh, and one of the things that Ron Klein is going to do is he's going to reach out to um, John Whitworth and Per Surratt, who have been working on the demos for this MSX2 and try to get those added to the Coco Pie distro as well, because we can already download the whole AGD library. Mm -hmm. uh, that's monochrome, but to be able to download the MSX2 library for the Coco and Dragon, um, it will be an ongoing feature. As those products become available and we have, have a, a repo to pull them from, we'll be able to add those to the Coco Pie. Yeah. When I say I will we, also mention, I mean uh, Ron Klein. So. <laughs> I will also mention that uh, Mikey, the author of Pi Drivewire, had reached out for Pear last week on the show to get some details on getting some other stuff implemented. They have gotten on contact with each other and they're actually going back and forth and getting that resolved. So excellent. Thank you, Nigel. Oh, this this was is cool. a cool one. This was yeah. super cool. Yeah. We were talking about this on the show last night. Yeah. So for the for sake of the audio people that won't be able to see this picture, it's a classroom with 12 year olds that are learning Python in modern times. Um, and Tom Eric Gunderson is actually teaching this class. And uh, what he did is he brought up the online version of XROAR. Uh, to show the students an easy way to tell the difference between uh, basic or using basic to show the difference between strings and integer data types. And they're using XR online. So they've got this big screen mounted on the wall in the background that is showing XR running Dragon Basic. And then all the students on their little laptops and stuff are all also running XR online to do all That's this cool. as a teaching tool. That is super cool. And as he, he mentions, and they actually snuck in a little time to play Donkey King too. So <laughs> that's the kind of class I wish I could go to when I was Priorities. young. Priorities. Yeah. What a waste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fact they had to use Python, I agree. Um, <laughs> and the final one here, or, or second last, no, first final one here for the Dragon this week is uh, David Gispert. Um, has designed a few Dragon stickers in color. And he's uh, going to be shipping them for three euros each. And international shipments are allowed. So if you want to bulk a few to distribute among friends or if you want to pull together to get them, it's a pretty cool looking one. He's got a euro on the a photo there. So you can kind of tell the size difference since he's using the old Dragon full color. Yeah, logo looks good. Dragon data. Looks good. And that's the end of the news this week. Very cool. Yeah, that was cool, Tom. Thanks for doing that. Um, that was very cool to see. Um, excellent, excellent. All right. Well, let's um, because we're already in overtime on the show length. We're just gonna we're gonna skip playing the outro and we'll just say our final uh, farewells and goodbye. So number one, I want to say thank you to Glenn Dahlgren, our special guest, for being here today and all he shared with us. And thank you for Curtis for you have been you know you're uh, between Dragon Talk and everything else, you are wrangling guests like it's nobody's business. And as you saw from our teaser things, we've got four weeks of great guests well brian weasler's one of them so we have at least three weeks of uh, great guests <laughs> i will also uh, mention the mc10 uh, special is starting to come together i just got another email while we're on the show of another person that's uh, saying yes they'd like to be on it so that's and that's going to be uh, it's going to be a nine hour telethon uh of mc10 and we're going to try to raise money too uh, we're going to try to yeah, get John, the... maybe we should link it up with your, uh, your Megathon <laughs> yeah. uh, contributions too. Absolutely. Because six, six hours, six and a half hours of Dragon Talk was not enough. So we need at least nine hours of MC10 talk. No, no, no. So, 10 hours for the MC10. 10 hours. There you go. MC10. 10, 10 hours of MC10. <laughs> that's right. So um, that's another special coming up in October, you say, L. Curtis? Uh, well, October will be the earliest. <clears throat> okay. it, it's, a, it's like the herding cats thing we did with Dragon Talk. It's, yeah. It's, 
I'm not giving a deadline on it because it takes a while to get everybody to get their schedule synced yeah. and everything else. But yeah, so I really enjoyed having um, Glenn on today. It was great hearing about that. And, and a reminder, next week is Bill Sias. So any of you old timers that remember Color Computer News, which was the technical Coco reference magazine and the very first Coco magazine made, he's our guest next week. Next week. And he's got a lot of interesting things that he's done during and after and probably some interesting stories too, as we did a little mini pre-interview with him about stuff. So that will be interesting. Uh, Mark Overholzer, thank you for all you do with putting all the links in the chat. And uh, everything. Uh, Mr. Schaller, thanks for being here. Always a pleasure to have you. Always a pleasure to be here. We enjoy your community, how we are able to cross pollinate and, uh, and share the love. And L. Curtis Boyle, thank so you dirty. for your news and everything else. And Rick Ewan, thank you for your beard. Big fan of the beard. Uh, Rondell Vo, uh, thank you for being here. Ron, Brian Weasler, uh, you had a short week this week. You only had like 19 things to show off in your show and tell. So you have definitely have to redeem You'll yourself. You'll be making up for that soon. You'll be making up for that. Luckily, I didn't lose internet once, but Mark Bosley was here as my backup, and Grant Leedy was here as a backup earlier too. Thank you, Mark B. Uh, Doug, thanks for being here. Nick Morenti, and of course, the lovely and talented David Ladd. Thank you for all you do. Let's really? say goodbye, everybody, before I press the button. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye,